thou who has brought us thus far on our way. Through natural and man-made catastrophes, floods, hurricanes, pandemic, economic depression, political malaise, and ethical erosion. Today we pray not to be eloquent in our words, but to be earnest in our living. And as we are cognizant, however, that your word reminds us life and death is in the power of the tongue. And so we pray that neither in this house nor our private dwellings, words would be used as sharp nail against each other, cause the occupiers of this honorable house to remain acutely aware of the high calling of the service to people. And for such a time as this, May they rise to the occasion and rightly answer the call that destiny demands, service without conditions. God of our four parents, we can't hardly escape, and so we own and acknowledge the deepening division among our population. And as such, we are compelled also to pray for unity, a unity that can only be ushered in with humility. God of our four parents, be merciful to us. In the name of our elder brother, Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. The ninth sitting of the third session of the Fort Huff of Assembly is now in session. I call upon the clerk. Item number two, confirmation of minutes. Honorable members, is it your wish that the minutes of the meeting of Thursday, 15th April, 2021, as circulated, be so confirmed? With no dissenting voice, the minutes of Thursday, 15th April, 2021, is hereby confirmed as circulated. I call upon the clerk. Item number three, announcements by the speaker. Let me again welcome all members to this honorable house and to those who are tuning in on their usual media platform. I want to remind all members again of your obligation and your first call on your time is to the House of Assembly as we continue to strive to start on time. Stand in order 10-2 mandates that we start at 10 a.m. Finally, I bring apologies on behalf of the Junior Minister of Tourism, Honorable De Castro, who could not be here with us today. I call upon the clerk. Item number four, statements by ministers. Is there any minister with statements? I recognize the Premier and Minister of Finance and member for the first district, the Honorable Andrew A. Foy. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to make a brief uh, statement to this Honorable House. Mr. Speaker, I'd just like to alert the Honorable House that I do have one statement to make, Mr. Speaker, um, today. And um, I will now move towards making sure that I do so. Um, Mr. Speaker, though, before I go any further, I know usually this is done under all of business, but given that he's a public officer, the death of, um, well, there, Mr. McGregor, one of the government electricians, 
you hear me? Yeah, I would like to express my deepest condolences to him and his family. On this given time, the public service has uh, lost a true stalwart and has lost a very good young man. And uh, I just briefly say my deepest sympathy to the family. On that note, Mr. Speaker, I know. I'm sorry. Uh, Leader of the Opposition, you have an intervention? Hmm? No, Mr. Mr. Um, Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to also join with the Honorable Premier in expressing condolences to Mr. McGregor and his family. He was someone that um, I ran track with in high school when I was there, when we both went to high school. Someone I know was a stellar civil servant as well and, con and contributed to the civil service in the community in the 5th District. So I want to join with the Premier in expressing deepest and sincerest condolences to Mr. McGregor and his family, an extended family, and his, his, his track family and different persons who, who call him friend. Thank you. Thank you. I also recognize the Minister for Transportation, Works and Utilities, a member for the 5th District, the Honorable Kai M. Reimer. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to also join with the Leader of the Opposition and the Premier in offering sincerest condolences to the family of Mr. Uh, McGregor Williams. I too, we have a long history of, of sports and even working together. And before he passed, I visited him and, you know, we had um, quite some interesting conversations. And I know how difficult it will be at, at times like this, but I offer my condolences to the family. Uh, like I spent some time with them before and I was there last night. Uh, we shared some good memories. and. Uh, on behalf of my family, on behalf of the people of the 5th uh, District, I too I would like to offer my sincere condolences. Thank you. Thank you to the member for the 5th District. I invite the Premier to read his statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this statement is an update of aspects of the COVID-19 stimulus. Mr. Speaker, let me first begin by thanking God for keeping his steady hand on this territory. You would recall that shortly after the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 as a global pandemic in March 2020, we in the BVI were presented with a grim projection based on the scientific data that unless decisive preventative steps were taken, the territory was looking at getting 3,700 coronavirus cases in our small population. As a people and as a community, we worked together to avert this forecast. Your government made the tough decisions to protect lives, to protect our healthcare system from collapse, and to protect our economy. Together, the government, on behalf of the people of the Virgin Islands, made sure that we invested in proactive measures and we reported to the people every step of the way, at one time almost daily. The private sector businesses also did their part to complement the work of the public sector by putting preventative measures in place as well, so that businesses could reopen under the new regular of living and working with COVID-19. Residents, belongers, and Virgin Islanders did their part as well, cooperating with and supporting the various measures that were asked of them, making the sacrifice and compromises when called upon. The Virgin Islands' survival of the COVID-19 global pandemic thus far has been a team effort. It has been a team effort with all of us living in these God-fearing islands, doing our part, working together to balance lives with livelihoods. By working together, the BVI's response to COVID-19 has been presented by the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, as a model for the Eastern Caribbean. But more valuable than any accolades is that together we have managed, with the exception of one unfortunate loss, to keep everyone alive. To this we say to God, be all the glory. And Mr. Speaker, as in any society that is dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, 
the support and cooperation has been to the fullest 100 percent. There have been a small number of persons who, for various reasons, some reasons and motives valid, reasonable and justified, and others not so noble, decide that they would not work with the rest of us to keep everyone safe and to protect the economy. These are persons who, in the height of the pandemic, when the death tolls in large and small economies were skyrocketing, when healthcare systems were crashing, and when those countries were rushing into lockdowns after it was too late, there were persons who were trying to spread chaos in our Virgin Islands community by demanding that we throw open the borders and open up for tourism now. Needless to say that in hindsight, this would have been irresponsible governance putting the lives of our people in jeopardy. Mr. Speaker, if you would just pause for a second and reflect on that. They wanted us to throw or open our borders so that persons could come in from countries where there were present and active COVID-19 explosions and roam freely among our population. These voices were strong advocates to try to bully this government to move in a direction that would have caused us to lose many lives here in the Virgin Islands, as well as destabilize our country. Mr. Speaker, most of these voices continue to be the loudest today. With the cooperation of everyone, we began the phased and managed reopening of our economy and our international borders. Those same individuals were out there trying to store up resentment against the government because of the protocols for entering the country. However, Mr. Speaker, it is a fact that these are the same protocols that have kept us all safe to date. But you see, Mr. Speaker, while your government has been deliberate not to make COVID-19 a subject for politics, there are those who are using COVID-19 to create a platform for themselves for the next general elections. But contrary to their selfish push for power, this government will remain laser focused on helping the people. Thankfully, our Virgin Islands people are people of BVI love. Mr. Speaker, there seems to be a strategy to try to destabilize the government of the Virgin Islands. First attempt was over the protocols, and now a political campaign has been ignited on the ground concerning stimulus grants. Mr. Speaker, individuals who fail to diversify the economy, individuals who fail to make an effort to revive the tourism industry and infrastructure after Orma, individuals who fail to prudently manage the territory's finances and who therefore left the taxpayers with limited resources to rebuild and face the pandemic, they were all over the place playing on the emotions of a wary and frustrated public with stimulus talk. At first, they were demanding the government pay the stimulus now, as if the Virgin Islands government prints money. Then, when we successfully sourced the grant from the BVI Social Security Board, their new problem was that the funds should not come from the Social Security Board. And on and on, at every turn, they have some new issue that they invent to play on the frustrations of the public. You see, lies, half-truths, and innuendos repeated often enough take on the authority of truth, especially when most persons are financially vulnerable. When the seeds from the weeds fall on fertile soil, they send down their roots and they sprout up. Mr. Speaker, during the ongoing pandemic, the people of the Virgin Islands has experienced significant hardship. That is a fact. But it is also a fact that the economic shocks of COVID-19 have hit every single economy in the world. The UK economy suffered a 9.9% slump in 2020 due to COVID-19. The UK is now once again trying to ease its lockdown protocols. The United States has already issued new instruments, what they call printing money, to the tune of approximately five trillion US dollars to fund COVID-19 stimulus. And this is a dangerous practice for maintaining the value of the US dollar. 
Your Virgin Islands government acknowledges that a number of businesses and individuals were and remain affected by COVID-19. And this especially includes businesses and persons who derive their income from the various sectors of the economy. Like governments everywhere, your government did and continues to help to reduce the financial strain being experienced by our businesses and people. And may I add that no government, no government can restore every dollar of lost potential revenue caused by the pandemic. What governments have sought to do is to provide some support to help reduce the burden, to help put a meal on the table, to help keep the lights on and the roof over the family while we are still trying to ride out this storm called COVID-19. It is a worldwide challenge of how to find a prudent system to adequately assess, assist all persons who experience financial challenges during this ongoing global pandemic. And although this is an impossible task for any government, one must never let the perfect become the enemy of the greater good. And without a doubt, any system implemented, whether it be by any government worldwide or the private institution that provide goods and services, should also be assessed by the citizenry. Mr. Speaker, this is an opportune time to update the Virgin Islands public on the breakdown of the COVID-19 stimulus by district. As a reminder, Mr. Speaker, businesses are important for driving economic activity. Businesses also provide jobs and which enable employees to meet their social and financial needs. We know that our businesses are facing unprecedented challenges. This is why your government moved to help our local businesses to keep their heads above water. Your government, therefore, secured $6.5 million from the Social Security Board to assist local businesses affected by COVID-19 in the form of a grant. Businesses that qualify for the grant war and are expected to put the funding to work and make a genuine effort to keep their staff employed. And may I say that your government has not been secretive about this aspect of the stimulus program. Public check distribution ceremonies were held and on 22nd September 2020, as Minister of Finance, I reported to this honorable house how these funds were distributed district by district to date. So for the COVID-19 business stimulus by districts, the figures provided to me by the technical team as follows. District 1, $501,057. District 2, $595,005. District 3, $618,000. $493. District 4, $2,184,297. District 5, $587,178. District 6, $833,791. District 7, $399,279. District 8, $598,920. District 9, $1,096,062. Please note that District 4 experienced the highest total among dis disbursed to businesses to date, followed by District 9, 6, 3, 8, and 2. This stands to reason as both at the districts where most businesses in the country operate. But, Mr. Speaker, I want to remind honorable members and the public that these figures still have to go through the full auditing process. So the House and the public will continue to be updated as this process is ongoing. I just want to remind honorable members and the public that the small business stimulus was structured and administered by a committee established by cabinet consisting of representatives from the Premier's office as chair, the Ministry of Finance and the Department of Trade, Investment Promotion and the Consumer affairs as well as through other measures given that the deadline for the initiatives war was extended. The truth will prevail in the end. Mr. Speaker, this is a government working for its people and in the midst of a pandemic, a government that cares. From the time we took office in February 2019, we made agriculture and fisheries an intrinsic part of our strategy to ensure food production and to boost our food security. This reality can be seen in the renaming of the Ministry of Education and Culture 
to the Ministry of Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries, and Agriculture. COVID-19 brought into a sharp focus the urgency to diversify the economy, to create new employment and business opportunities, and to develop industries that are very critical to our survival, but which also have not received the level of attention that they deserved for many years. No doubt, COVID-19 has thrown forward a number of problems such as unemployment, interruption of commerce, and threats to food security globally as supply chains became affected. I must say that your government understands that food production, especially in the areas of agriculture and fisheries, continue to present ideal solutions to this scenario. Mr. Speaker, can I tell you that a nation that cannot feed itself is a nation that is headed towards destruction? That is why your government secured $2 million from the Social Security Board in the first instance to assist our farmers and fisher folks to fulfill this role. Your government wants all citizens to be productively engaged and in a position to earn their income. Through the grant, farmers were assisted with cutting of access roads to their farms and fencing for their properties, among other things, that will boost their food production capabilities. Some people who have not been paying attention to what we have been saying over the past several months are persons who are up to mischief at all costs are spreading the talk that this was free money just put into hand, people's hands. But in most cases, based on the nature of what assistance was required, the money was put into infrastructure to support expanding agriculture. The same goes for the fishing grant as well. Fisher folk who needed engines, nets, and other equipment received the help they needed to spring forward from this initiative thereby also boosting their production. Please note that some of these needs exist, existed following the passage of the devastating 2017 Category 5 hurricanes that destroyed the most equipment necessary for food production. We need the food supply. We need to create the jobs. We need to boost fisheries, and we need to boost agriculture. This is our opportunity to finally make farming and fishing another one of our economic pillars, while giving us the ability to feed ourselves in case we ever cut, uh, of, ever cut off from the rest of the world. Mr. Speaker, do you remember when that was a real fear that was facing us in the early days of the pandemic last year, when cargo ships had to stop sailing? when goods got stuck at ports all over the place, when there was talk that the certain countries were going to freeze the export of meat, produce, and other food stuff so that they could keep it for their own people? Well, in terms of the COVID-19 family stimulus to date, if I may break it down by districts, District 1 for the famine, $675,000. District 2, $639,000. District 3, $184,500. District 4, $103,500. District 5, $328,500. District 6, $184,500. District 7, $450,000. District 8, $265,500. District 9, $618,000. Please note that District 1, 2, and 9 experienced the highest total amongst dispersed to farmers. This stands to reason as all are districts where farmers are most prevalent, not they are that they are not prevalent in other areas. As regards to the COVID-19 fishing stimulus to date, District 1, $784,000. District 2, $382,000. District 3, $81,000. District 4, $45,000. District 5, $72,000. District 6, $83,000. District 7, $117,000. District 8, $301,000. And District 9, $885,000. Please note that District 9, 1, 8, and 2 experienced the highest total among dispersed to fisher folks. This is due to the high number of fisher folks in each of these districts. Mr. Speaker, the total of the COVID-19 stimulus dispersed to our churches 
and religious organizations in the Virgin Islands to date, according to the figures provided by the technical team of officers, is $1,693,000. The total of the COVID-19 stimulus dispersed to our private schools and daycare centers in the Virgin Islands to date, as I'm advised, is $907,818. $907,818. The total of the COVID-19 stimulus dispersed to our tax transportation taxi operators in the Virgin Islands to date is $1,302,050.80. This includes transportation service for quarantine passengers from TB Letsam International Airport, Airport to quarantine sites. The figure also includes the amount for the park and ride initiative in Tortola, Virgin Gorda, Anigara, and Just Van Dyke. Mr. Speaker, your Virgin Islands government took a little and stretched it into a lot in terms of our resources with the COVID-19 stimulus to assist as many of our people as possible. This is a government working for its people in the midst of a pandemic, a government that cares. As a reminder, during the early stages of the pandemic, your government heard the feedback from the people on the ground. We have also listened to the concerns of the opposition, and where possible suggestions were taken on board and incorporated into plans. And may I add, and may I say, that the BVI's COVID-19 management was not about rejecting or accepting a suggestion based on politics or personality. It was not about who makes the most noise or the grandest threats gets their way. It was about doing what was best for the territory in the circumstances and at a time in a pandemic that has been constantly changing and shifting. It was about doing what was possible given the dynamics of the public health aspect, the economic aspect and the social aspect of the pandemic. Your government understood then, and we still understand now, that COVID-19 is a time for unity and, not, and for unity and to have all hands on deck, where we put politics in the back and the needs of the people and the country in the front. Mr. Speaker, there will be a time for campaigning, but not now, when we as a people are at our most challenging time in the history of the Virgin Islands and throughout the world. We can never win this war against COVID-19 until our people are focused and committed towards the same goal and working with common vision and a common understanding. Mr. Speaker, sir. Let me say here, your government saw that there were some urgent needs and there were persons who needed to get help ASAP. As a result, to make it quicker for these persons to get financial help, your government made an additional $3.9 million available from the Consolidated Fund for each district and a large elected member. These funds were accessed by contacting all nine district and or the four at-large representatives who were all assigned a special COVID-19 allocation of $300,000 per district per representative. This was in addition to each representative's regular assistance grants, commonly called the district fund, which is processed through the House of Assembly and Ministry of Finance. This special COVID-19 funding allowed each elected member to respond to needy cases directly and swiftly in their respective districts for their constituencies, regardless of political affi affiliation, because COVID-19 is no respecter of politics. This allocation was divided equally. No member was advantaged and none were disadvantaged. All were enabled to help the people, especially when it came to some of the simpler, less complicated issues in their respective districts. Members had been asking for resources to help constituents, and here your government made funds available in the midst of a global pandemic without favor, equal amongst all representatives from District 1 to 9. Never before had this happened even during the challenges and times of the aftermath of the two Category 5 hurricanes in 2017. Transparency and accountability still apply to these special funds. The funds continue to be audited monthly by the internal auditor. And just as these funds are allocated without favoritism, 
As Minister of Finance, I advise all members that favoritism and political allegiances must be put aside. Your government continues to believe that it matters not who you voted for. If persons have a need and can justify it during this COVID-19 era, they were to contact their district representative. Mr. Speaker, we recognize that the funds could only stretch thus far, but a little of something is better than plenty of nothing. Looking ahead for the medium to long term, your government's objective is to continue to take the Virgin Islands into overdrive so that we are financially and economically sustainable. This is important to make our people secure, physically, emotionally, and economically, and to develop all around resilience and competitiveness. This is where our national focus is. Mr. Speaker, the reality is this. The BVI has done exceptionally well so far, as the old people said, knock on wood. We are in, char in uncharted seas because it is not a disaster like the hurricanes we are familiar with, but a pandemic, and a pandemic that is ongoing and has posed unprecedented challenges for every country in the world. With a disaster like a hurricane, when that occurs, the duration of the event is short. The hurricane hits, and in a few hours or a day or two, the rain and strong winds are over. Immediately after the hurricane disaster event, you can assess the damages and have it fully quantified and determined, determine the time period over which you will allocate funding to repair, reconstruct, and rebuild. In a pandemic, however, the duration is prolonged and you do not know when it will end. How many countries have relaxed their vigilance only to experience second and third wave surges in the death total tolls and return to lockdown? With a pandemic like COVID-19, you never know when things will change and how it will change. Some of the damage cannot be seen with the naked eye and may only be felt down the road. But today, I thank God that we have all been able to stem the tide. Regrettably, we have lost one life to COVID-19 in the Virgin Islands. But I must say, with the many precautionary measures taken today, we all have life and breath to continue to work together to move our country forward. COVID-19 is far from over, and it is sucking the resources out of every government and economy in the world. No one knows the length or breadth of the duration of this pandemic. Those who do not learn from their own experiences and from the experiences of other repeat, others repeat mistakes with the highest price tag. And again, I repeat, those who do not learn from their own experiences and from the experiences of others repeat mistakes with the highest price tag, the price tag of death tolls. The world now has vaccine for COVID-19, coupled with the other health and safety protocols like the washing of hands, wearing a mask, and social distancing. We have an opportunity now to continue to keep each other and ourselves safe while keeping our economy moving. We have a good road ahead, and we thank God for what he has done for us and will continue to do for us. Mr. Speaker, we have challenges as a result of COVID-19. But we also have several success story, stories, and many of which are recognized internationally. The many stimulus administered under this government has significantly, and I repeat, significantly assisted the majority of our population. The fact is COVID-19 has put all into one status quo, where we all are facing challenges. But your government has helped and will continue to help the people of the Virgin Islands, whether it is through the grants for famine, fishing and small businesses, taxi operators, boat operators, BVI electricity customers, water and sewage customers, each district and at large representative covering all nine districts, construction industry, bank customers, supermarkets during lockdowns, stamp duty exemption for land and property purchases for belongers, 
repairs of homes and schools destroyed by Irma in 2017, legislative changes to facilitate our financial services stakeholders, assistance for general needs of our people in the Virgin Islands. Mr. Speaker, money spent by this government continues to hit its target in different but meaningful ways to and for the people of the Virgin Islands. So if this is going to be the way this government will be defined, let us be defined by what we said from day one. We put the people first with God at the helm. May God continue to watch over his Virgin Islands people and the Virgin Islands overall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Premier for his statement. Um, for what matter does the opposition leader wish to rise? Okay, point of information. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to rise on a point of information. Mr. Speaker, I, I want to thank the Premier for his comprehensive update to this Honorable House and to the people of the Virgin Islands in terms of the stimulus funding. Just one quick clarification, Mr. Speaker. The last sitting of the House, the, the answer, question was answer, asked and answered in terms of how much money was spent specifically on the farming and fishing grant. At the time, the answer was $4.9 million. Um, I just added up the numbers that the Premier called out in his statement, and it came up to 6.1. Uh, just for, in terms of accuracy and completion, I think we should probably provide that information to the House to ensure that there's no inconsistencies, Mr. Speaker, in terms of the answer that was given in the House versus the statement the Premier just made in this Honorable House. Thank you, Honorable Premier. Thank you, I most certainly will, Mr. Speaker. In the speech, of the, which I know that the Leader of the Opposition was listening to attentively, I stated that this is to date, which means, Mr. Speaker, as I told him then, I said no, Mr. Speaker, the, the, the grants, there are still some of them being processed. It has not been completed. So it's not inaccurate, Mr. Speaker. It is to date. And the original statement said that we allocated $2 million, Mr. Speaker, and I stated in the, in the statement that was in the first instance. But because, Mr. Speaker, of the high demand for that sector, we did not ask for any more money. What we did is we restructured in terms of the allocations in different areas to accommodate the higher demands in, in particularly the business sector and the fishing and the farming sector, Mr. Speaker. We had to make some other allocations in some other areas that did not require as much money and put it towards these. So we did not look for a dime more from Social Security, nor did we look for a dime more from anywhere else. So Mr. Speaker, I just want to make it clear that this is not inaccurate. It is to date. And when all the grants are finished, which I stated clearly in the statement, Mr. Speaker, we will be able to give the final tally, but this is ongoing and it is being audited as we go. When more is done, we will report more. This is as accurate as you could be to date since the last time the member asked a question, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Okay, Leader of Opposition, this is your final time on this matter. No, no, thank you, Mrs. Mr. Speaker, and I just wanted to, to thank the Premier for that clarification, but I think the, the House and the people still need to know that difference, the variance in between. So I guess if, if it's required that another question comes to this House, then that will happen. But if not, then we'll, we'll like to get that information. But Premier. Mr. Speaker, I do not want the Leader of the Opposition to make the people of the Virgin Islands think that we are hiding anything. I don't know how much clearer I could make it. It is an ongoing matter. This figure is to date, which means the last figure that was given to the leader of opposition when he asked the question, there were more grants given since then. So this is to date, and we are glad to answer any question, Mr. Speaker, that's allowed by this honorable house, by the member that, that comes forward. But I want to make it clear to the people of the Virgin Islands that there's nothing here to hide, there's nothing ambiguous about it. 
If you have your bank account and you give a balance on Friday, three weeks later, Mr. Speaker, you, um, um, which you're doing transactions all the time, cannot come back and report the same balance, whether more or less. In this case, you can't have less. It only could be more. So I hope that that example is as clear as I can be, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Okay. I thank both the Premier and Leader of the Opposition. That brings to the end of that specific matter. I recognize at this time the Deputy Premier and Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries and Agriculture and member for the 7th District, Dr. The Honorable Natalio De Wheatley for his statements. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to update this Honorable House on two matters or two areas of my uh, portfolio. One, Mr. Speaker, is uh, International Museum Day. Mr. Speaker, for some years now, the Department of Culture has celebrated International Museum Day, whilst placing a focus on our territory's museums. Mr. Speaker, if you recall last year, the celebrations for International Museum Day were completely virtual and were highlighted through the release of a virtual exhibition in a two-part series entitled From Perrine Georges to Noah Lloyd, Heroes and Freedom Fighters. This year, the theme for International Museum Day is the future of museums, recover and reimagine. Museums around the world are being asked to imagine and create new practices if you will allow me to quote from the International Council of Museums, otherwise known as ICOM, open quote, the year 2020 has been like no other. The COVID-19 crisis has swept the whole world abruptly, affecting every aspect of our lives. This crisis also served as a catalyst for crucial innovations that were already underway notably an increased focus on digitization and the creation of new forms of cultural experiences and dissemination. Uh, close quotes. ICOM further stated, some already pressing issues have been exacerbated, questioning the very structure of our societies. The call for equality is stronger than ever. Mr. Speaker, I'm very excited to announce that the Department of Culture will be celebrating International Museum Day on the 18th of May through a series of immersive, educational, virtual initiatives throughout the entire upcoming week. In addition, the program of International Museum Day activities uh, is, re is very reflective in different ways of the theme for International Museum Day 2021. Before I go any further, Mr. Speaker, I'm wondering how many of us are aware that we have eight museums in the territory. These museums are all very distinctive and cover various aspects of our beloved Virgin Islands heritage. We have two privately owned museums in the territory, Genesis Studios and the North Shore Shell Museum. Not only is Genesis Studios a heritage museum, it is also an arts museum and it is also a natural history museum with its very engaging and informative heritage garden. We shouldn't be so surprised at the versatility of Genesis Studios as our very own former speaker of this honorable house, Mr. Ruben Vanterpool and family own this museum. The other privately owned museum is the North Shore Shell Museum, a natural history museum with an astounding collection of shells. This one is owned by the very, the very cultural icon, Egbert Shellman Donovan. The other museums, Mr. Speaker, are government related and include the Lower Estates Sugar Works Museum, the Virgin Islands Maritime Museum, Her Majesty's Prison Museum, Old Government House Museum, and the Theodore Faulkner House Museum. The stories told at each of these museums are fascinating ones and are tantamount to our Virgin Islands story. Mr. Speaker, we also have a pop-up museum in Longlook that is managed by the Longlook Heritage 
society. The department is presenting a series of workshops for our museum's professionals in the territory as we seek to transform and standardize our museums and our practices. These workshops will be held at the atrium at the H. Laverty Stout Community College on Monday and Tuesday morning, the 17th and 18th of May, between 10 a.m. and 12 noon. The first two workshops that will be conducted are writing mission statements and developing a collection policy. On the Tuesday morning, the workshops conducted will be care of the artifacts and introducing a decolonizing paradigm into our museums. Let me make a few points about these very critical workshops. First of all, the public is also invited. Anyone who has an heirloom or a family collection might be interested in attending these workshops. Secondly, these activities will help to prepare the way for a museum's policy, which is being prepared by the Department of Culture along with the stakeholders, our territories, museums, with which the Department of Culture has been meeting regularly with for some time now. I also have a keen interest in the workshop entitled Introducing a Decolonizing Paradigm into Our Museums. The decolonization of museums has become a worldwide movement as mu museums are seen implementing certain inclusive methodologies and praxis in order to tell a more balanced, just, and inclusive story. Examples of initiating museums include the British Museum as well as the Hunterian in Glasgow. I have had an initial meeting along with the Director of Culture with His Excellency the Governor at the Old Government House Museum. Would be a museum to have a conversation about in regards to decolonization and telling the full story. However, these initiatives will include other museums in the territory. These technical workshops are being held and will lead up to the opening ceremony, which, be, which will be held on International Museum Day itself, the 18th of May at the atrium at the H. Laverty Stout Community College, beginning at 5.30 p.m. I invite the general public, our museum professionals in particular, as well as you, my colleagues in this honorable house, to attend. That's the 18th of May, which is a Tuesday, beginning at 5.30 p.m. As we are aware, the museums have not had many tourist visits. Because of this, the International Museum Day activities include a fun and fundraising activities. On a Wednesday, the 19th of May, there's an all-day trip to Anigara. This includes a visit to our wonderful Theodore Faulkner House Museum. There are a number of heritage stops along the way, which include the S. Vanessa Faulkner Botanical Garden, the Fisherman's Wharf, the Conch Shell Mounds Lookout, the Anigata Springs, and the Flamingo Lookout at South Heap Point. Can I just say that Anigata is a wonderful place to visit, and that in my opinion, the historical archaeology of Anigata, as well as its history of shipwrecks, rival any other such places in the world. I know the 9th District representative is happy to hear that, and he'll co-sign that. The Department of Culture will be taken along the 6th and 12th graders at the Claudia Crickey Educational Center along on this heritage trip. However, the general public is invited for a fee as a fundraising initiative, and I congratulate the Department of Culture for ensuring uh, that our sister islands are included. Our museums are not just cultural institutions. They're also educational institutions. For this reason, on Thursday, the 20th of May, the Department of Culture has scheduled virtual sessions with the sixth graders across the territory in order to introduce them to our museum world. The department has been busy developing virtual museums in the spirit of innovative practices for all the mu museums and will be leading the sixth graders through immersive and virtual sessions. On Friday, the 21st of May, a museum's expo will be held on the grounds of the Elmo Stout High School, the senior campus. There will be photographic and artifact displays 
of all our museums in the territory. Educational activities have also been organized, including a scavenger hunt, in order to excite our 12th graders across the territory. Sessions have also been organized for these activities. I've already met with both the Department of Culture and the Education Unit in my ministry to begin to address the absence in large part of Virgin Islands history and culture in the curriculum. In the meantime, this is an excellent opportunity for our 12th graders across the territory to be immersed uh, in our Virgin Islands heritage through an introduction and active participation in our museum world. The week of activities culminates in a grand way on Saturday the 22nd of May with a museum's hop which will take place between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. The tour bus will be hopping to all the museums on Tortola. Everyone is asked to meet up at Her Majesty's Prison Museum at 10 a.m. to begin that tour. Along the way, we will be learning interesting facts about our Virgin Islands history. This is also a fundraising activity for our museums. Mr. Speaker, all events are being carried out with adherence to social distancing procedures. In closing on this topic, I wish to say that I am hoping to see an integration of our territory's museums in our community as we seek to develop our museums in dynamic, vibrant ways. We will need you, all of you, to become active and support our museums. Through the lens of our museum world, we come to understand the path and narrative that has brought us along to where we are right now, right here. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. I have one more statement. And that statement is on happenings in sports. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I take this opportunity to update this Honorable House on my ministry's support of sports development and to report on some of our athletes as they continue to promote the territory through their outstanding performances. Mr. Speaker, the government stands firm in its belief that sports is vital to the individual, social, and economic well-being of the people of the territory. The government stands committed to supporting and promoting sports as part of our national development. We believe that sports should be accessible to all and has not only pledged but provided funds to support and develop our elite athletes. Mr. Speaker, on Wednesday the 6th of January 2021, the government made a firm statement of, su of supporting four of our Olympic hopefuls, Kyron McMaster, Ashley Kelly, Eldred Henry, and Chantel Malone were gifted with a donation of $25,000 each towards their training. Mr. Speaker, I must commend the many sports federations, associations, and clubs who continue to work to develop our athletes to compete not only locally, but also regionally and internationally. In order to have athletes performing well on the world stage, Mr. Speaker, young athletes must receive the training and conditioning necessary to help them improve through all the levels of their sport. I must once again recognize the BVI Athletic Association who has maintained a development program for its athletes and has produced some outstanding athletes over the years. We strongly encourage our associations and federations to incorporate development programs. I must also recognize the BVI Olympic Committee for our strong partnership with them. Mr. Speaker, we must recognize and celebrate the many accomplishments of our star athletes. Chantel Malone surpassed the Olympic qualifying standard in the long jump with a 7.08 meter jump to win the Florida International Pro Edition track meet. This jump is a new BVI national record that ranked second in the history of Central American and Caribbean female athletes and a soon to be ratified world leading number two rank for 2021. That is special. I'll read it again, Mr. Speaker. This jump is a new BVI national record that ranks second in the history of Central American and Caribbean female athletes 
and a soon-to-be-ratified world-leading number two ranked jump for 2021. Mr. Speaker, Chantel is joined by Kyron McMaster, who established a new BVI national record by securing a second place finish at the USA Track and Field Golden Games track meet at uh, St. Sac. I'll have to um, clarify the, 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 the place, Mr. Speaker. Running with a time of 47.50 seconds. In his world rank number two performance, Kyron broke his previous national record of 47.54, which he established in 2018. He's peaking at the right time. I must also share the accomplishments of our newest rising star, 15-year-old Adeja Hodge, Mr. Speaker. Ms. Hodge established a new BVI under 17 girls 200-meter record and a new personal best. She is currently ranked, and this is very special, Mr. Speaker, she is currently ranked world number one for under 16 girls and world number seven for under 18 girls. I just want to make sure the public understands. Adeja Hodge from the BVI is currently ranked world number one for under 16 girls and world number seven for under 18 girls. Adeja also holds the current world number one ranking for under 16 girls in the 100 meter and a world number 10 ranking for under 18 girls in the 100 meter. Despite just being 15, right now in the world, she's ranked number 10th for under 18 girls. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, Adeja dominates in the 400 meter, where she holds the current world under 16 girls number one rank and the current world number 13 ranking for under 18 girls. She's doing well in multiple events. She also performs outstandingly in the long jump, where she ranks number three worldwide and 13th when ranking with under 18 girls worldwide. Mr. Speaker, without question, Chantel, Kyron, and Adesia are our BVI star athletes, among others, professional and emerging. We have BVI love and BVI pride for our three Olympic hopefuls. Ms. Chantel Malone, who has qualified for the women's long jump, Kyron McMaster, who has qualified for the men 400 meter hurdles, and Eldred Henry, who has qualified to compete in the men's shot put. Mr. Speaker, we have the opportunity for a fourth Olympic hopeful in Elena Phillips, who is still working towards her qualification. And we hope for others, Mr. Speaker. As our athletes continue to prepare, Mr. Speaker, let us cheer them on once again as they strive to bring home the gold. Mr. Speaker, also this summer, we are hopeful that our athletes will have the opportunity to compete in the NCA under 18 and under 20 championships from the 9th to the 11th of July in San Jose, Costa Rica, and the World Athletics under 20 championships from the 11th to the 22nd of August in Nairobi, Kenya. After the Summer Olympics, Mr. Speaker, our professional athletes will continue to represent us. Ms. Elena Phillips and Mr. Eldred Henry will compete in the first ever junior Pan American Games for athletes under 23. These games will be held in Cali, Colombia from the 25th of November to the 5th of December, 2021. This will be another proud moment for the BVI 
and we will send BVI love and support to Elena and Eldred. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries and Agriculture continues to partner with the BVI Olympic Committee to promote the importance of sports to the long-term athlete development school program, which encourages and promotes sports for life and the development of the National Sports Management Council. I, re I reiterate that the ministry is in collaboration with the BVI Olympic Committee in the delivery of a walking document that should speak to the organization of local sports, a level of accountability for government resources, cooperation among the sporting bodies and associations as it relates to use of facilities, resources and initiatives, looking at the road to sports tourism and the development of new sporting facilities and new areas of interest in sports. Work is well underway in the delivery of this document. Mr. Speaker, this summer promises to be one of anticipation and excitement for our athletes and the territory. As Minister for Sports, I pledge to continue to support our athletes in their endeavors as they develop, and I encourage all our residents to give them our full support as they represent the BVI in the world stage and make us proud. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Deputy Premier for his statement. I recognize the Minister for Transportation, Works and Utilities and member for the 5th District, the Honorable Kai M. Reimer, for his thank statement. You. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll just give a brief statement. And this is pertaining to a water situation that we're dealing with. We have quite a few within our territory, Mr. Speaker, but I have been made aware of an island-wide water interruption on the island of Anigara. Mr. Speaker, this is due to a transformer that is no longer working. I can assure you that the teams of the Water and Sewage Department, they're working alongside with the BVI Electricity Corporation to rectify this matter in the most expeditious manner possible. Mr. Speaker, I would like to take this opportunity to let the residents of Anigata know that we are there with them and the business community as well, and we recognize these unforeseen occurrences and give, and I give my pledge, Mr. Speaker, to this matter to be rectified soonest. Mr. Speaker, please note that the BVIEC is currently making arrangement to transport the new transformer to Anigata via badge by 3.30 this afternoon. We anticipate that this matter should be rectified by tomorrow, the latest. In the interim, we are looking into alternative ways of providing relief to the residents of Anigata. Mr. Speaker, the territory sees seems to be plagued with a multitude of water issues, and we continuously hear the cry from the community. So, Speaker, I must also say that as residents ourselves, we too experience the inconveniences of the loss of this most valuable resources. This is also compounded by this season of drought. I would like to let the people of the Virgin Islands know that this government continues to exhaust all obligation, options, and the resources to remedy these water woes. Mr. Speaker, I must recognize the valiant combined efforts of the staff of the Water and Sewage Department and the BVI Electricity Corporation on pulling out all the stops to provide the people of Anigata, Anigata with water within the next 24 hours. So, Speaker, that's my brief statement, and I thank you. I thank the member for the 5th District for his statement. I now recognize the Minister for Health and Social Development and Territorial Member, the Honorable Corbin Malone, for his statements. Mr. Speaker, I will ask, thank you very much for the opportunity. I would ask, however, that I be allowed to issue the statement a little bit later on the COVID-19 situation um, as it unfolds. We're getting the we're getting the, um, the up-to-date figures, and we'd like to appraise the, uh, the territory of this. If, with your kind permission, sir. So you Thank you much, Mr. Speaker. So you have a statement that you want to do later? Excuse me? You said you want to do a statement, but you're not ready. Yeah, I have a statement. It's not ready now. Okay. 
We'll, we, we sure. update the COVID-19 situation. We will facilitate at a later thank time you in very the much. proceeding. Mm -hmm. Okay. I thank all ministers for their statements and in keeping with what was agreed to by the end of today, all members of the House will have copies of these statements. I call upon the clerk. Item number five, presentation of papers. I call upon the Honorable Premier Minister of Finance to lay his documents on the table. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to lay on the table the following documents, statutory instrument 2021, number 38, a proclamation by, gov by the governor under section 83, subsection one of the Virgin Islands Constitution, order 2007, UKSI 2007, number 1678 appointing the time and place at which the ninth sitting of the third session of the fourth house of the assembly of the Virgin Islands shall be held and Virgin Islands final progress report on the implementation of the recommendations from the 2016 national risk assessment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I call upon the honorable minister for transportation, work and utilities to lay his documents on the table. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. Mr. Speaker, I rise to lay on the table the following documents. Statutory instrument 2021, number 39, road traffic motor vehicle registration and operation and driver and vehicle licensing amendment regulation 2021. And the statutory instrument 2021, number 40, statutory rates, fees, and charges amendment of schedule number two, order 2021. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I call upon the Honorable Minister for Natural Resources, Labor and Immigration to lay his documents on the table. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to lay on the table the following document. Statutory Instrument 2021, Number 41, Immigration and Passport Amendment Regulations 2021. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I call upon the clerk. Item number six, notices of motions given orally. I call on the Honorable Premier and Minister of Finance to give notice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to give notice that at a later stage in the proceedings, I will seek leave to move the motion standing in my name on the items 8, subsection 1, Roman numeral 3 through 5 on the order of the day. I recognize the Deputy Premier. Do you have an intervention? Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, my apologies. There was one athlete who has uh, qualified for the Pan Am Games in Cali. So I want to apologize for that. Uh, Mr. Thad Letsom um, qualified for the Pan Am Games in Cali. So I just wanted to mention that, uh, Mr. Speaker, my apologies to Thad Letsom. And um, uh, certainly um, there's no, no intention to overlook uh, any any athletes, and I encourage all athletes out there who have any types of accomplishments, um, and they want those accomplishments to be recognized, certainly send the information to the Department of Youth Affairs and Sports, because perhaps maybe they did not receive the information. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, thank the Minister of Sports for that update. I call upon the Honorable Minister for Transportation, Works and Utilities to give notice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to give notice that at a later, later stage in the proceedings, I would seek leave to move the motion standing in my name under item 8, 1, Roman numeral 2 and 9, under order of the day. Thank you. Thank you. I call upon the Honorable Minister for Natural Resources, Labor and Immigration to give notice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to give notice that at the later stage in the proceedings, 
I will seek leave to move the motion standing in my name on the items A, Roman numeral 1, on the order of the day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I call upon the Honorable Attorney General to give notice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I give notice that at a later stage in the proceedings, I will seek leave to move the motion standing in my name under item 81 Roman numeral 6 to 8 on the order of the day. Thank you. I call upon the Honorable Leader of the Opposition and Member for the 8th District to give notice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to give notice that at a later stage in the proceedings, I would seek leave to ask a question standing in my name on item 7, Roman numeral 2, proof 4, on the order of the day. Thank you. I thank you. I call upon the clerk. Item number seven, questions and answers to questions. Premier. because I know the leader of opposition had requested that the questions for what was originally posed for this sitting be pushed into the next sitting and the questions from the last sitting being this sitting. But I noticed that on the other paper, the questions, uh, they remain the same. So it's just a matter of making some adjustments. So if we could just ask for a two minute break to make sure that we get that clarified because the answers that I have is for based on the agreement that we had for the last sitting to ask those questions now. So I just wanted to make sure that we get some clarity with that. Sure. Okay, honorable members, this honorable house will take a five minutes recess. House is in recess. <laughs>
Mr. Speaker, I just want to rise to make an amendment to the standing order now that we have straightened out the matter and to know the order paper, sorry, not the standing order, thank you for that correction. For the order paper, and now that we have that rectified, I would like to move a motion, Mr. Speaker, to remove from item 7, to um, remove item 7, 1, um, and 2, to be, well, sorry, item 1, to be replaced on the, the, the next uh, order paper for the next sitting. That is the only amendment I'd like to make to the order paper now, so I so move. I rise to second a motion, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. A motion has been moved to remove. A motion has been moved and second to remove item 171 from the other paper that day and place on the other paper for the next sitting. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. The motion has been passed. So we'll have to renumber the other paper as well if we're removing Number one. So we have to renumber the other paper. Mr. Speaker, uh, now that that motion is passed, I move now that the other paper be renumbered, Mr. Speaker, that would allow now for 7 2 to become 7 1, and uh, everything after that, subsequently after that, um, the numbers. Um, I think that that would be the only one. Seven two will be now become seven one Roman numeral one, Mr. Speaker. And that should be all. I move. I can move that motion. Mr. Speaker, I raise the second motion. The motion has been moved um, to renumber the other paper. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. The motion has been passed. I call on the Honorable Leader of Opposition, Honorable Madam Pinto, to ask his questions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, just quickly, a point of privilege or a point of information before I ask my questions. Mr. Speaker, in the last sitting I asked um, regarding answers to questions, um, that those answers be provided. Have subsequently been provided with some of the answered uh, answers. I'm yet to be provided with the answers from the Deputy Premier and the Minister for Health and Social Development. I haven't seen those. So I, I, I confirm this morning the only ones that are missing now is from the Deputy Premier and the Minister for Health and Social Development. I don't, I don't see them. Okay, Mr. Speaker, can I clarify from the opposition leader? Is this from the, the seventh sitting? Yes. Yes, from the um, seventh sitting. The, um, the attachments weren't provided. Only the, um, the initial answer was provided. Um, the attachment, as you outlined in your answer, was never provided. Okay, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I thought those were attached, so I'll, I'll resend those again. Thank you, Mr. 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 Speaker, and just the ones from Mr. Minister of Health now. Um, Mr. Speaker, question number one. 
Speaker, could the Premier and Minister of Finance please tell this humble house what was the dollar amount for government revenue, excluding financial services, and total expenditure for the 1st of January through the 21st of April 2021, inclusive of all the details of the revenue receipts and expenditure? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, sir, this Honorable House is fully aware of the financial and social challenges this global pandemic, COVID-19, has caused. No country small or big has been spared. Also to date, no country small nor big has recovered partially or in full from the financial and social impact of COVID-19. It is extremely important this backdrop be given prior to furnishing financial or social related information, especially in the public domain, as there are persons who seem to be on a mission to divorce the current financial challenges being experienced as a result of the negative impact of COVID-19. Nonetheless, in spite of the aforementioned, the BVI has fared well compared to most countries in the region and the world overall. Mr. Speaker, the dollar amounts for the audited total revenue excluding financial services for the government of the Virgin Islands over the period 1st January to 21st April 2021 is $32,465,143. Mr. Speaker, the table below that will be presented that presents the detailed revenue broken down by the major contributors, customs and the inland revenue total in $19,249,705. The remaining $13,215,438 was attributed to revenues collected by other agencies such as Post Office, Department of Labor and Immigration, and Water and Sewage. The table further presents the revenue by month based on the period requested. Mr. Speaker, despite the impact of COVID-19 on our economy, we are still earning some revenues outside of financial services revenue to do the people's work. Also, it is important to highlight that the Virgin Islands did not experience the negative effects of COVID-19 during 1st January to 31st March 2020. Hence, any comparison to 2020 for the same time period would need to be factored in in order, uh, in order to derive any credible con conclusion, in order to derive any credible conclusions. Please note that in 2021, we continue to now experience the negative impacts of COVID-19 like all other countries in the world. Mr. Speaker, there's a table that's um, attached, Mr. Speaker, that will be able to clearly outline, and I ask the Sergeant of Arms if he's not there. I ask the clerk to please furnish the leader of the decision. Sergeant Rams. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Premier, for providing this information. And just one follow up and my this I would have, have another follow-up. Uh, in terms of um, the budgeted numbers, Premier, I know I didn't ask that specifically, but do, is this in target uh, in line with what was budgeted for 2021 in terms of the revenues that are being um, accounted for as of April um, 21st, April 1st, 2021? 21st, April 2021, sir. Mr. Speaker. I would say that we are doing fairly well, but so that I do not mislead this house or be deemed to be concluded, to be given inaccurate figures, I will have to bring the figures to the house so that persons can see or if the member asks that in a subsequent um, sitting, I'll provide those numbers 
but I would refrain from giving any guesstimates unless I have the actual figures in front of me. But thus far, we have fared well for the actual numbers I prefer to have in front of me so that the member could have access to those. All right, thank you, Mr. Premier. Um, what I'll do then is that the subsequent information concerning um, the budgeted allocation and FSC, I'll ask in a subsequent question, because the question did ask excluding FSC figures. So I'll get that information in a subsequent question. Question number two. One point of information, Mr. Speaker, the question asks some specific, um, some specific uh, information, Mr. Speaker. And I want the House to note that it all has been provided. So if I miss something, it has not been intentional. The question asks very specifically, Mr. Speaker, could the Premier and Minister of oh. Finance please tell this honorable House what was the dollar amount for government revenue excluding financial services and total expenditure for the first January through 21st April 2021 inclusive of all the details of the revenue receipts and expenditures. Mr. Speaker, I believe that we have uh, provided that in the table, Mr. Speaker, and it shows um, the amount there with it, which I think is um, for 2021 until April at $6,566,145. I think that I have provided it to this Honorable House as asked. Yes, you did, Honor Premier, and that's what I said. I said I didn't ask for them, and I'll ask them in a subsequent question. I did not say that you did not provide the information asked. I said that I would ask for the additional information in a subsequent question. Question number two. Mr. Speaker, could the Premier and Minister of Finance please tell the Sample House what was the dollar amount for government revenue re that government rece revenue received from financial services for the period 1st January through 21st April 2021. And this is the question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the table provided gives a breakdown of the revenue from financial services by category and by month based on the period requested. Mr. Speaker, the revenue of financial services, although not going into declining, not declining rapidly, and this is of great value at this moment in time when our second pillar tourism has been almost non-existent all due to the ongoing global pandemic. Mr. Speaker, from 1st January to 31st March 2020, the total dollar amount for the unaudited government revenue from financial services was $31,144,292. In 2021, for the same time period when the full effects of COVID-19 have been felt worldwide, worldwide it is $31,1,151, which is a modest $143,141 difference. Mr. Speaker, when 1st to 21st April is added to the amount for 2021, the dollar amounts for the unaudited government revenue from financial services over the period 1 1st January to 21st April 2021 is $41,628,819. Mr. Speaker, through God's grace, in spite of the challenges brought on by COVID-19, the BVI continues to fare well compared to most countries in the region and the world overall. And again, Mr. Speaker, I will produce for the Leader of the Opposition a copy of the table and all the detailed information. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I, was asked, I was going to ask the same follow-up, but I see that the Premier has listed in the response to this particular question that has been a $143,000 decrease from over the year 2020. So I think there wouldn't be a need at this point to answer that follow-up question again. So I'll move on to question number three. Mr. Speaker, yeah, question number three. 
Mr. Speaker, could the Premier and Minister of Finance please tell us on the House? A. If his government have waived the tender process for any contracts, projects, or purchases since taking office since February 28, February 28, 2019, to date, and B. If the answer is yes, please list and provide this honorable house with the details of each instance this was done, including each project, purchase, or contract, the dollar amount associated, and the reason for doing so, the day this was, this was done, and whether Cabinet agreed to waive the tender process. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, while your government is an advocate for transparency and accountability, and while these two standards of governance and democracy are important, however, Mr. Speaker, Standing Order 17, Subsection 1 of this Honorable House sets out the parameter by which questions can be asked in this Honorable House. Mr. Speaker, Standing Order 17, 1 G4 states that a question shall not be asked which deals with matters referred to a commission of inquiry or within the jurisdiction of the chairman of a select committee. Mr. Speaker, this question falls into that category as a commission of inquiry has requested this information, which spans the tenure of this current administration, as well as information of similar nature for the immediate past administration. Thank you. Information of similar nature for the immediate past administration. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Premier, I, I, I understand the standing hours and respect that is under a commission inquiry. So I'll, I'll move on to question number five. Mr. Speaker, could the Premier and Minister of Finance please provide this Honorable House with the following inf information regarding the BVI Port Authority? A, how much money the authority received in insurance? Uh, recess. So we take a short recess for five minutes.
Kalan Abu Malam Ken Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I see that. Um, thank the Premier for his response. Mr. Speaker, I see that the Premier mentioned that $2.3 million is remaining from um, the insurance money. So I just want to confirm, because last standing finance, just want some confirmation. Last standing finance, the actual financial accounts of the port had won $5.7 million in five bank accounts. So I'm trying to make sure that this $2.3 million is inclusive of the port's cash on hand and minus the 2.3, then we probably look at if based on imp increased revenues, the Premier will um, update me on those, what um, if that 2.3 is accurate in terms of the monies that remain in from the insurance fund. Mr. Speaker, I don't have the audited financial statements that the leader of opposition is referring to in front of me. And I don't like to re refer to figures that I don't have in front of me, Mr. Speaker. So if, the, if there's an issue with it being from 1.5 to 2.3, I prefer, Mr. Speaker, to go back to the ports and ask them so that I do not be accused of giving this House inaccurate information. What I can say, which I thought the leader of opposition would have do a follow-up on, it's on the $7,530,952. It was spent on a lot of other areas other than where the insurance money had targeted, which was the refurbishment of the warehouse and all the other areas that we're now being blamed for that we have to fix out of the $2,370,574. So I can say that, and I give a, the leader of the opposition a full breakdown of how every dime is spent, and he will see exactly where all that insurance money was spent but it was supposed to be targeted to build a, rebuild a warehouse in certain areas, which is, was delayed now due to COVID-19, but the ports is now on the way to use this money, which will not be enough um, to, to, to do what all they have to do. So they have to raise some money and, and do what they have to do to get those warehouse and the storage places um, fixed. So I would venture to inform the leader of the opposition that I would go and see about these audited statements that he's referring to, I do not have them in front of me, and uh, validate those numbers. And if there's a, a difference between them, I will have the ports who deal with the accounts all the time clarify that. I do not deal with the ports' accounts at all. I just answer as they give me. So if the ports happen to find a couple hundred thousand dollars more that should have been in insurance money other than what was in the audited statement, I will go to them and have them give it clearly stated so I could bring back to this Honorable House. I see the Premier is telling me what questions I should ask. But what I would say, Premier, I, based on the information that you put before me, um, it's saying that $2.3 million of that money is kept back by the port, I assume, in cash. And I have the information that in by the time, we, the time we asked in December 2020, um, in terms of what the port's cash balances were, it was $5.7 million, and that was reported to us by the finance team at the Port Authority. So I just wanted to make sure that that was inclusive of the, uh, the 5.7 was inclusive of the $2.3 million that was, was remaining from the insurance money. That's, that's all I'm asking. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the position does a good job of throwing our wrong numbers, and those who are listening we we'll have to choose whether he is correct or I'm correct. I'm not erring on the side of who's correct. I'm erring on the, I'm making sure that I go to the side on what is correct. I have to bring the information. I do not handle the port's finances at all. They only send in their reports. It is a statutory body. Hence, Mr. Speaker, whatever concerns the leader of opposition is bringing, I will have to get the information to see if his concerns are valid <coughs> or if the concerns, Mr. Speaker, are not valid in the way that they're being put to this honorable house. 
I will be glad to do so, Mr. Speaker, because you cannot be private in the public. So I will ask the, the ports to please clarify the concerns of the leader opposition. However, I must say again that I cannot stand here and say with accuracy that I know those figures what the leader of opposition is saying out of my head because I don't have that document here with me. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for your response, Premier. And I just, if you may, Mr. Speaker, um, just to share, um, the question was asked of the port in 2020. And the answer was, pres Mr. Chairman, the present, at present, a financial snapshot showing the cash and bank, total AR, total AP, and total operating revenue versus total operating expenditure, and total capital revenue versus total capital expenditure. And the answer was, Mr. Chairman, British Virgin Islands Port Authority has the sum of $5,794,200.96 in five commercial banks in the territory. To date, for 2020, the authority has a total operating revenue of $10,023,286.49. And I expended. No, I, as, I mean, I don't want to mislead this house, and, and I've, I'm continuing to hearing that somehow I have a, a way with numbers. And I want to provide. I want to provide a point of information, Mr. Speaker. Accurate number. Point of information to us. This, this house is by the court. Clear, Mr. Speaker, and I intend to be running the house with integrity. The standard is clear. I said point of information, Mr. Speaker. All I'm telling the leader of the opposition, whether then or now, they obviously will have an explanation for it. I do not, repeat, I do not run the ports nor their accounts. It is a statutory body. The answer then is one in which they give us, and it was germane to a specific question. If there's concern that there's a variance, which is clear that the leader of the opposition is leading towards, I do not want this House to feel that I'm misleading them. Let him state the concern which he has done. Allow me to go to the ports and find out from them what, is the, uh, re what are the real numbers in terms of for the answer to the question that's been asked and come back to the House. That's all I am saying, Mr. Speaker. And if they can't explain it, I'll bring back and say they can't explain it, which I hope that would not be the answer. Thank you. We will not go any further on that. Question, we we'll move on to question number six. Please. I have another follow-up, Mr. Speaker. And I think I some, exhorted your follow-ups. I think I think it's important, Mr. Speaker, the Premier, any? based on the okay. Premier's response to I ensure. The facts, so we we'll move on to question six. Mr. Speaker, all due respect, I think it's important that we have consistency Leader and, and parity in this house. Leader of opposition. The Premier responded. I allow you to speak three times. He made but he made some accusations that I have to I have to clarify. To please take your seat. We'll move on to question number six. Thank you. Mr. So speaker, we have to be consistent and we have to be fair in this honorable house. I'm going to continue to say this. It's not about me, it's about this position that I hold in this honorable house. We have to be consistent. Accusation was made about me playing with numbers. What I specifically said was numbers that was given to all 30 members of this honorable house. And, and I want to ensure that that's on the record. The last, thank you. Please question number six. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, could the Premier and Minister of Finance please provide this armor house with the following? Information regarding the Port Authority. A, please advise the Port Authority has purchased a marine vessel. B, if the answer is yes, please provide this armor house with a descri the description. The, please, please provide this armor house with a description of the type of vessel, the cost of the vessel, and who it was purchased from and see the purpose for the purchase. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the BBI Ports Authority is undergoing an international audit where it is imperative that they be in compliance with the conditions under the Triple I Code. The measures necessary include but are not limited to having in place the required full complement of staff in different areas of the organization like security among others. These requirements also include the efficient and timely patrolling and managing of our officially designated harbor areas and signage. The need to have these resources in place for the upcoming international audit has been known for the last five years, 
However, preparations for the audit have only started within the last one and a half year. Mr. Speaker, with the addition of, the, of other harbors that ports will have to manage and to keep in compliance with the IIII code, it is necessary for the authority to be able to carry out these duties, among others, in an efficient and timely manner. The BVI Ports Authority, through a tender process, purchased a new boat. The process realized three companies bidding, as shown in the table below that will be presented to this Honorable House. Mr. Speaker, after a full transparent process of evaluation, the contract in the sum of 230000 was awarded to Midnight Marine Holding Limited. The BVI Ports Authority on 26 April 2021 received a 38-foot Midnight Express Special Ops Interceptor 390 vessel with a reinforced hull and heavy-duty stringers for commercial use, inclusive of the trailer to haul the boat. The boat has a proven hull and is a low-maintenance boat if operated properly and maintained properly. The boat will be used also for monitoring the authorities' marine devices and also to provide assistance with harbor patrols as needed as the BVI Ports Authority is in the process of receiving ownership and management operational responsibilities for the seaports at Anigada, King Garden Bay, Trellis Bay, among others, the standards and requirements. Mr. Speaker, the three vendors that, um, that applied uh, uh, stated in the table, and I produce, Mr. Speaker, this for the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. Speaker, I didn't hear the cost, the cost of the, um, the vessel. Mr. Speaker, part of the, answer, the, the question was the cost of the vessel. Um, I don't, I don't see, it, see it here. I didn't hear it. Mr. Speaker, I didn't hear it, but what I'm seeing here, Mr. Speaker, and I just want to be clear, I don't want to, to play with numbers or misrepresent numbers. I like to read the numbers as given, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the first tender has this was Vendor Joycelyn Maritime Trading Consultants, $320,000. The second vendor was Marlon Chukutu for the same boat. For well, 31 foot, and one was a 2001, 38 same feet, 2001, and the other one is 2002, for 275 thousand dollars. And the third quote for the same length boat, 2003, 2004 Midnight Express from Midnight Marine Holdings Limited for 690 thousand dollars. Is that is that correct? I just want to make sure the, the information is correct. I don't want to That's mislead. Point. Okay, and the and the winning tender, it was one for three twenty thousand, one for two seventy five thousand, and one for six hundred ninety thousand, and the winning tender was a six hundred ninety thousand. That's correct. Midnight Marine Holdings Limited. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition I know is a very good reader, and I can only say that he intentionally read 690,000. Because it says for three of them it will be 690,000 or 230,000 per vessel. If they bought one, then it has to be 230,000. Oh. So, so they have, so the, okay. Well, I, I'm not sure, that's why I, I asked the question in the premier answer. So I need to get clarity. I don't want to misrepresent what was, what was written. So it's 2,000, so, so you're confirming that 2,000, 230,000 was spent for the one vessel. I just want to make sure. I, I, I have, Mr. Speaker, I ask the questions. I need to make sure that the answers that are given to me are accurate. I don't want to misrepresent the figures. Do you have a follow-up? No, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I think um, I asked a question, so I just want to make sure that that this indeed was in case indeed what happened. And I want, I want to make sure that the contractors are not misrepresented. So 2030 was for the, um, the one vessel that we have right now.
Mr. Speaker, sir, in my answer, I clearly stated for this honorable house, and I repeat, and I punish it to the leader of the opposition, and today is one of my best days in my life because I'm alive from yesterday, so I will stay calm and read it for him since his sight is giving him a little problem today. Mr. Speaker, after a full transparent process of evaluation, the contract in the sum of $230,000 was awarded to Midnight Marine Holding Limited, Mr. Speaker. So that is there in the table. I provided all that the posts have provided to me, stating clearly how the process and who all was involved in the process, the amounts, the accessories, the delivery time, the vendor, the model of the boat. I think that I have been more than detailed in the answer of this question that the posts have furnished to me. So I really um, ask the Leader of the Opposition if he has any more follow-up, I can get that and go back to the ports and bring it forward. But I think that we have, that I've answered it as total and as detailed and as in-depth as humanly possible. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank you now for clarity. And I'll make sure that, um, that we clear with the public's business. And I think um, it did say one, one, and three. So you're accurate in terms of the number of vessels was being proposed from the winning contractor. So I want to put that on the record. I'll move on. I have no follow-up at this point. Question number seven, is it? Seven. Mr. Speaker, could the Premier and Minister of Finance please provide this armor house with the following information regarding the BVI Port Authority? A, a detailed account of any property and or buildings purchased by the authority within the last five years, and B, provide a detailed cost of each property and or building and all contracts and, on, and or agreements for said purchases. That's it? Thank you. With all pleasure, Mr. Speaker, I'll answer. Mr. Speaker, sir, for many years, including current times in Virgin Gorda, there has been and continue to have an outcry from the public to have the cargo and ferry services separated. This concern is valid as it poses significant danger to all users, especially our users of the ferry boat services. Mr. Speaker, Having cargo and passengers using the same dock and at times, at the same time, is a recipe for disaster. Many noble attempts to address the matter has been undertaken in the past, but to date those efforts have yielded no results. This is why, Mr. Speaker, the BVI Ports Authority purchased land in the valley, Virgin Gorda, to commence the planning of the separation of the cargo port services and the ferry passenger services. It is envisioned, that envisioned, envisioned sorry, at the, this time that the par passenger ferry services will relocate to the land purchase, albeit that some prepar pre preparatory, preparatory works will have to be undertaken prior to this being done. This is an attempt to reduce the long overdue issue of having cargo and passengers using the same dock at the same time. This will help to avoid any potential harm and danger. Mr. Speaker, the land purchase at Block 4840B, parcels 258 and 585 Virgin Gorda South Registration Section, and Block 4739B, parcel 2 at Virgin Gorda South Registration Section. Mr. Speaker, the lands were appraised by the reputable firm of Smith's Gore, and the purchase price was determined by their assessment of the value of the properties in question. Mr. Speaker, the lands in question were purchased from Dwight and Piola Flax for the sum of $2 million. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, 
the BVI Ports Authority purchased a building from the Castro Enterprises Limited in Rotown, ad adjacent the Sir Oliver George's Plaza. Mr. Speaker, the building is located at Block 2837F, Parcel Number 25, Rotong Registration, Rotong Registration Section. Mr. Speaker, this building was appraised by the reputable firm of Smith's Goa, and the purchase price was determined by the assessment of the value of the properties in question. The building and property was purchased from the Castro Enterprise Limited for the sum of $500,000. Mr. Speaker, the details and the purchase of the land and the building are attached for members' information. And I want to note, Mr. Speaker, that in saying this, that the land, Mr. Speaker, is being purchased on an installment plan, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Mr. Premier, you just said the land is being purchased on an installment plan. Which land are you in? The one in Virgin Gorda, you're in question? Yes. Okay, I just wanted to make sure, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, can the Premier confirm if he was consulted before these two purchases? You were saying something? I was asking if you were consult consulted as the Minister for Ports. I was asking if you were consulted by the ports um, before these two pieces of properties were, were purchased in consideration that the port has announced recently that it's having financial difficulties. Mr. Speaker, I have been consistent about statutory bodies and I will continue to be so. The port <coughs> is a statutory body. It runs its own affairs, Mr. Speaker. And although there's a minister over statutory bodies, there's a limitation on how the minister will become involved. So, Mr. Speaker, that would have been a decision by the board. So, yes or no, Premier, were you consulted or not? Mr. Speaker, the board made the decision. And as minister, I was told when the decision was already made by the board. Mr. Speaker, the Premier, when he followed up his answers to the question, he mentioned that the land was being purchased in installments. In the same sitting, standing finance sitting, the end date for that installment was the 31st of March. Can the Premier confirm if the port has finally paid off the $2 million for the property based on the port's own omission that the 31st of March was the deadline to pay for that property? Not only did I say it in standard finance, I just provided for you in the documents that it is the 31st of March. But Mr. Speaker, I did not find out from them if they finished paying off for it or not. I can find out from them and come back, but the last date to pay off was the 31st of March. Standing here now, I don't have that information, but I can produce it. I myself will find out and produce it for this honorable house if it's such a desire. Thank you for that response, Premier. I'll move on to question number eight. Mr. Speaker, could the Premier Minister of Finance please give this Honorable House a detailed explanation of his government's plan for welcoming cruise passengers to BVI in June 2021? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One minute, Mr. Speaker. That's question number eight, right? Thank you, sir. Good. Mr. Speaker, considering the current coronavirus pandemic and government efforts to protect the community, the BVI Ports Authority is developing a draft COVID-19 management plan detailing the requirements to receive cruise ships. The content of this plan will consider recommendations from cruise lines who are part of the ongoing discussion as well as other Caribbean guidelines that have been developed for the safe resumption of cruise ship operations within the region and abroad cruise vessels. The proposed plan will speak to the minimum condition to receive a passenger ship 
at the BVI Port Authority Cruise Pier, and the plan will seek input and guidance from an interagency group, which will include the Ministry of Health, the BVI Tourist Board, Her Majesty's Customs, Immigration Department, and private sector collaboration and lo from local cruise agents and tour operators. The objectives of the proposed plan will be to set out the protocol for the safe acceptance of crew co cruise calls at the cruise pair on the anchorage during a pandemic. These proposed protocols shall replace all normal operating procedures until such time as the Health Emergency Operating Center, HEOC, advise otherwise and the return to normal operating procedures are re-established by the BVI Post Authority and the wider territory on a whole. The framework on the base of the base basis on the base this is plan on the base of the plan has been agreed, but discussion to ham out all the other details are ongoing. As such the details of the protocols will be shared with this honourable house once completed and approved by Cabinet in short order. Thank you for that response, Premier. Uh, I just want to note that we're now in the middle of May, and essentially we have about two weeks to get um, our operators prepared for the, oper for the um, arrival of cruise ship, as announced by your administration. Um, so I think it's imperative, and this is a question that came from the public, that persons know what is expected of them, and I understand that it has to go through Cabinet, and I, I'm asking on behalf of the people, because they're concerned, and they need to know uh, what is the protocol for them in terms of getting ready for the acceptance of these vessels into the territory. So I believe that is something that is important to the people of this territory and that industry, those who um, are affected by that industry. So I'm here as an advocate on their behalf. But I don't have any follow-up questions at this time. Though. Well, thank you for the statement, the follow-up statement. Mr. Speaker, we are here also for the people, and the people speaking to us too. And Mr. Speaker, we have not let them, left them out of the conversation because the health authorities um, have been speaking to the Taxi Association and others. The Minister of Transport has had um, meetings with them and he has more meetings coming up with them. We, uh, um, the other government agencies are going to have more meetings with some of the other agencies and, and um, stakeholders and those stakeholders who have not met already they're making sure that they meet with them also. So, Mr. Speaker, this is not being done in a vacuum at all. There, there are more and more persons that are involved, and, Mr. Speaker, we continue to keep them informed and keep the people of the Virgin Islands informed. So, this is an ongoing process, Mr. Speaker, and more and more uh, certain adjustments are being made without compromising the health and safety of the people of the Virgin Islands and the visitors. Again, thank you, Premier, and statements have become the norm in question and answer, so I'm just following the trend. Um, in terms of the other stakeholders outside of the taxi and library personnel, I think the people, the persons who the vendors on the beaches and different areas are tremendous concern in terms of what should they expect. They're already getting calls from the operators saying that they're coming in the middle of June, the beginning of June, and they don't know what protocols they need to adhere to, and we're two weeks away from the arrival date. We don't know. If I, I'll ask a question then, Premier. Are these tourists to operate within a bubble system? Uh, is that what the government is contemplating? Or are they able to roam freely through the territory to all the different locations they've been used to roaming, go on excursions, etc.? The technical opposition, I'm always um, amazed though that no one ever called you to tell you anything is going right. But, um, there are persons who, who have been calling us also, not only to make sure that they are clear about what is happening, but to commend us for what is happening also, and also to seek some more clarification in some areas and to give solutions. Yes, they're working on a bubble area, and very shortly all that information will be made clear to the public as is uh, ongoing discussion, not only locally, but with the cruise industry. Because they too, uh, um, adjusting some of their protocols, and we have to make sure that all of them, our protocols are mutually aligned so that the safety of the people and the visitors are not compromised. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Premier. Everyone 
has to toot their own horn. Um, I will have to, I'll accept that answer, and I think the reality is that two weeks away, we have to communicate with the witness as soon as we can. Question number nine. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, could the Premier and Minister of Finance please tell this Honorable House, if guests from returning cruise ships to BVI in June 2021 will be allowed to patronize businesses at Craft of Life, King Garden Bay, Long Bay Beef Island, and Cyril B. Romney, Cyril B. Romney Pear Park in other locations. Mr. Speaker, a bubble concept for onshore and remote excursion the first step to the safe return of crews for the territory is the first step to the safe return of crews for the territory. This is a requirement as set by the cruise lines to ensure that not only their guests are protected, but the, the local community remains safe. While some of the tours may frequent some of these locations, discussions are ongoing with cruise lines to conduct shore excursions for cruise guests to only be done in a controlled manner with a ship approved tour operator. It is important to mention that in the, this first phase of the resumption of the cruise tourism, cruise lines are proposing that cruise passenger guests will not be permitted to independently arrange tours or freely move about the territory. The details of the tours are still being defined by the cruise operators in collaboration with the BVI Tourist Board and the cruise lines and the overall protocols for such are currently being developed via a cruise protocols stakeholders group. The details will be shared with this honorable house once completed and approved by cabinet in short order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Premier, so, you, so the, specific to the question, you, can, you cannot confirm if any of those locations that I outlined will be part of that process? Mr. Speaker, the locations that will be part of the process will be highlighted very shortly. I'm almost certain in my estimation, based on the discussions I've heard, that they would be, but I do not want that to be placed as the definite answer but I do see it as being highly likely. Thank you for that response, Premier, and I, 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 sh I await um, for the people who are been displaced for over a year now to know whether they would be part of this bubble system in this process. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'll move on. I have no follow-up question. Question number 10, another question from the people. Mr. Speaker, could the Premier and Minister of Finance please provide this Honorable House with the following? A, the salaries for all executive positions at the BVI Ports Authority. B, the monthly payroll for the BVI, Airport, the BVI Port Authority. C, a, detail, a detailed breakdown of the BVI Port Authority's debt, debt. And D, the annual revenue collected from the 1% wharfage at the BVI Port Authority from 2016 through 2020. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and may I answer on behalf of the people of the Virgin Islands also? Mr. Speaker, sir, the BVI Ports Authority individual salaries are restricted and confidential information. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, in keeping with standing order 17G2, which states 17.1, the right to ask a question shall be subject to the following general rules as to the interpretation of, of which the speaker shall be the sole judge. And G, a question shall not be asked seeking information about matters which are in their nature secret or confidential. Mr. Speaker, while I believe it is important to share the requested information with honorable members, it is important also that honorable members keep this sensitive financial information in strict confidence. Mr. Speaker, I will provide the members with a yearly total of the BVI Ports Authority executive salaries in keeping with stand on order 17G2. The total per year of all executive positions at the BVI Ports Authority is $995,600. Mr. Speaker, these executive positions include 
Acting Managing Director, Director of Operations, Director of Marketing, Director of Finance, Operation Manager, Business Development Manager, Administration Manager, Security Manager, Marine Mar Manager, Project Manager, Communications and Technology Manager. Mr. Speaker, in terms of the monthly payroll for the BVI Port Authority, Mr. Speaker, the monthly payroll for the BVI Ports Authority is approximately $551,302. Mr. Speaker, the monthly payroll is not static, as some of the employees are hourly and, pay and the payroll is affected based on the number of hours worked. Mr. Speaker, just to give you some insight, the February 2021 payroll total was $548,000. $446.59, and March 2021 payroll was $551,302.32. Due to hourly paid employees, the payroll fluctuates. Mr. Speaker, to add further context to the question posed, the BVI Post Authority payroll average for 2016 was $7,416,609.05, and the monthly average was $618,050.75 per month. The yearly payroll average for 2017 was $6,575,518.06, and the monthly payroll average was $547,959.84 monthly. The yearly payroll average for 2018 was $5,000,000. $615,228.06. Then the monthly payroll average in 2018 was $467,935.67. $467, and that's monthly. The yearly average payroll for 2019 was $7,341,734.20. And the monthly payroll average in 2019 was $611,811.18 monthly, Mr. Speaker. So the highest yearly total in those amounts were 2016 in terms of annual monies paid out. Mr. Speaker, a detailed breakdown of the BVI Ports Authority debt. Mr. Speaker, the authority is faced with existing debt in excess of $40 million owed to First Caribbean International Bank before shareholders and central government for the development of the Cyril B. Romney Tatola Pair Pack and the purchase of equipment for the cargo port, as well as the monies received from central government that was taken from the loan funds to fix the East End Longlook sewage problems. Mr. Speaker, the details are shown in the table below for members' um, information. And Mr. Speaker, with the table which I'll provide, we see the breakdown in terms of each section what the total debt is. Mr. Speaker, the loans from Caribbean the, um, Bank, First Caribbean Bank are currently under a, a moratorium and the authority is actively negotiating terms to be in a position to better manage the debt. Mr. Speaker, in terms of D, the annual revenue collected from the 1% wharfage at the BVI Port Authority from 2016 through 2020. Mr. Speaker, the annual revenue collected from wharfage at 1% for the period of 2016 to 2020 as follows. 2016, $2,886,402.76. 2017, $2,975,142.21. 2018, $4,396,447.65. 2019, $3,879,502.69. 2020, $2,826,157.43. So the total, Mr. Speaker, collected from the wharfage, 1% wharfage from 2016 through to 2020, and note this is less any expenses, is $16,963,652.74. But that would have to be matched up against the expenses. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I furnish all this information, detailed information, to the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's a lot of information, and I, it would be difficult for me to, I would, want, would not want to hold up the House. I'll come back with subsequent questions. But what I will ask, though, Mr. Speaker, the Premier said the cumulative salary for executive was $995,600. I, the last time I asked this question concerning how much the savings would have been if we had had the same pay cut to executives that we had to the hourly paid workers, the cumulative salary at that point was one point something million dollars. Can the Premier confirm if any executives were let go or laid off and why there's a discrepancy um, in terms of the numbers from the, two previous, from the previous question to this one currently? That question sounds good, but it is not detailed. First, Mr. Speaker, we will have to analyze what was the time span that the salaries were cut. It wasn't a year. Second, Mr. Speaker, we'll have to also analyze, Mr. Speaker, what the details are of this question. So, Mr. Speaker, it sounds good to the untrained air what was said. But it cannot be answered blanket like that. There are too much details and too much variables that are moving that that will have to come back in a subsequent question so that that can be answered thoroughly, Mr. Speaker. So I will not venture into those shark-infested waters. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I, shark, sharks don't attack, so I don't know what shark-infested water. The I, I never heard about no shark uh, attacks in the BVI lately. But what I will say is that the, the question was very specific. And as I, as, as I said, the, it was stated a cumulative amount of the executive salaries and a cumulative amount of the salaries then. So if there are any variances, I, I will bring the question back because I wouldn't go into a, a debate on that right now. But what I will. The member is saying this cumulatively loosely, Mr. Speaker. And persons listening will take it up that it is just totally uh, absolute, Mr. Speaker. Cumulative could be within two months. Cumulative could be a half month. Cumulative could be within three months. So that's what I'm asking, Mr. Speaker, so that we do not give the House any wrong information for the member to have his question posed in, 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 a, in this whole detailed form, so that whatever he seeks to find out that I can produce it for this honorable house by going back to the polls and having them produce the figures. Because, Mr. Speaker, the way the language is being used, I am concerned that the wrong connotation will be placed in the public domain the, in terms of how the language is being used. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I will never seek to mislead this House or the people of the Virgin Islands, and I know the Premier is in no way. I would never suggest that somehow I would mislead the people of this territory. But in the Premier's very own answer, it says the total per year, and when I said cumulative, I am speaking specifically to the total annual salaries, because I can't believe that $995,000 is monthly salaries for executives. So I will bring back a subsequent, Mr. Speaker, I respect your House, as, all, as we all should. I'll, I'll bring, my, bring back a subsequent question to get that detail that I require. Mr. So speaker, I'll, I'll move on. I, I won't follow Mr. up on speaker, that. Just for the information, I won't say it too long. I'll just say, place on the record for me that the last statement by the leader of opposition lacks clarity and validity in my book. Thank you. Uh, luckily, that is not your book alone that counts, Mr. Premier. So I'll move on. Mr. Speaker, question number 11. Mr. Speaker, could the Premier and Minister of Finance please tell the Sambo House the following? A, the number of belongers, residents, and work permit holders that return to the BVI through Terence B. Letzam International Airport from December 1st through 2020 through April 21st, 2021, for each month and the cumulative amount. B, the number of visitors that return to the BVI through the Terence B. Letzam International Airport from December 1st, 2020 
through April 21st, 2021, for each month and a cumulative amount also. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is important to note that the Terence B. Letson International Airport was closed due to our borders being closed as a result of the global pandemic COVID-19. Upon reopening of the facility, extra precaution to strict but friendly health measures were put in place to ensure everyone's safety. Mr. Speaker, the number of belongers, residents, and work permit holders returned to BVI through Terence B. Letson International Airport from December 1st, 2020 through April 21st, 2021, as detailed in the table below. Mr. Speaker, in terms of belongers and citizens, in December 2020, 455, 2021, 399, February 21, 280, March 2021, 343, April, April 2021, Mr. Speaker, and that's up to the 21st of April, 20, 227, with a total of 1,704 1, belongers or citizens. In December 2020, residents 59, 21 January 32, February 2021, 39, March 2021, 46, April 2021, 36, a total of 212 residents. In terms of work permit holders, December 2020, 208, January 2021, 290, sorry, 290. February 2021, 121. March 2021, 147. April 2021, 123. And the total work permit holders is 889. Mr. Speaker, when you add all that entered the BVI through the Terrence B. Letsum International Airport on December 2020, you have a total of 722. In January 2021, 721. February 2021, 440. March 2021, 536. Up to 20, 21st April 2021, 386. And the total number of persons, 2,805. Mr. Speaker, the numbers of visitors that returned to the BVI through Terence B. Letsum International Airport from December 1st, 2020, through April 21st, um, December 1st, 2020, through April 21st, 2021, are detailed below, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, we have a full table of them because the total number of persons now, Mr. Speaker, from what we are seeing here, Mr. Speaker, would have been a total of what the, ta the table's details, so I'll give it to the member so that they can have it totally and see what all was needed to be seen with it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think there was a typo in the question, so it was supposed to be in question B. Part B of the question should have been C ports, but I think that was a typo and, and I didn't get that information, but I'll, I'll come back in a subsequent question to get the full detail of the information. I want to have the follow -up, more additional follow-up questions on this one, Mr. Speaker. Number 12, Mr. Speaker, could the Premier and Minister of Finance please provide this humble house with the following. A, the number of belongers, residents, and work permit holders that return to the BVI through the Rotong Ferry Terminal from April 15, 2021 through April 26, 2021 for each day and a cumulative amount, and B, the number of visitors, tourists, that return to the BVI through the Rotong Ferry Terminal from April 15, 2021 through April 26, 2021 for each day and a cumulative amount. Mr. Speaker, I think that there was a section of the question before that I missed. I just saw it, so I apologize. Okay which was that you asked in B in question 11, the number of visitors that returned. I didn't answer that part. I just recognize it in my answers. Okay. So if you allow me to lead our opposition, sure. please. Proceed. Permit. In December, thank you. In December, the number of visitors, December 2020 was 1,785. In January 2021, 
it was 1,008. In February 2021, 1,016. In March 2021, 1,853. And in April, up to the 21st of April, 1st of April to the 21st, 1,892. It shows that the visitors' numbers in the BVI are increasing all the time. And the total up to, from December 2020, when the Terence B. Lesson International Airport uh, resumed services uh, uh, post-COVID-19, the total visitors up to April 21st is 7,554 visitors. So let me give that. I just had a question, Mike, and I didn't tell I was saying you know, myself, I didn't answer, so that's all. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wouldn't have any follow-up question on this right now, so I'll just let the Premier answer the subsequent question, question number 12, which I've already asked. Thank you. Sorry about that. Because I want to make sure that I furnish this house with all information requested according to the standing orders that will be allowed. In question 12, Mr. Speaker, if I be with your kind permission, Mr. Speaker, it is important to note that the Rotong ferry terminal was closed to international travel by sea due to our borders being closed as a result of the global pandemic COVID-19. Upon reopening of the facility, extra precaution through strict but friendly health measures were put in place to ensure everyone's safety. Mr. Speaker, the number of belongers, residents, and work permit holders that returned through the Rotong terminal from April 15 through April 26, 2021, as follows. Mr. Speaker, on April 15, the belongers I would name first in each date, then the residents, then the work permit holders. So I just ask everyone to bear that in mind. The number for each date would be first belongers slash citizens, then residents, then work permit holders, and the total. So on April 15, six, Belongers, zero residents, one work permit holder, seven persons came in on the first day. On April 16, 20 belongers, no residents, one work permit holder, 21 persons came in. On April 17, six belongers, citizens, one resident, two work permit holders, nine persons came in. On April 18, six belongers, citizens, zero residents, one work permit holder, seven persons came in. On April 19, 10 belongers, citizens, Belongers, citizens, zero residents, two work permit holders, 12 total. In April um, 20th, five belongers, citizens, no residents, three work permit holders. On April 21st, um, zero belongers, zero residents, one work permit holder, one person. On April 22nd, five belongers, citizens, one resident, two work permit holders, and eight persons total. On April 23rd, five belongers, two residents, one work permit holder, eight total. April 24th, 13 belongers, citizens, zero residents, two work permit holders, 15 total. April 25th, five belongers, citizens, zero residents, one work permit holder, six total. April 26th, 13 belongers of citizens, zero residents, thir three work permit holders for a total of 16. In terms of belongers and citizens, up to the April 26, 94, total residents, four, total work permits holders, 20, and the total overall of belongers, citizens, residents, work permit holders that have entered the BVI through the seaport since opening on April 15 to April 26 is 118. Mr. Speaker, though, uh, when we talk about the visitors that return to the BVI through Rotong Terminal from April 15 through April 26, 2021, we will see that on April 15, 10 visitors, April 16, 22, April 17, 24, April 18, 5, April 19, 13, April 20, 13, April 21, 12, April 22, 14, April 23, 7, April 24, 32, April 25, 19, April 26, 8, so since uh, between April 15th through April 26th, 179 visitors visit the uh, BVI 
through the seaports, Mr. Speaker. I furnish now all these detailed answers to the Leader of the Opposition. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have no follow-ups at uh, this time for this question. Speaker, question number 13. Mr. Speaker, could the Premier and Minister of Finance please tell this Honorable House who are the current members of the following statutory boards, commissions, and associated stipend paid to each member? A, the BVI Tourist Board. B, the BVI Airports Authority. C, the BVI Port Authority. And B, the Telecom Telecommunications Regulatory Commission. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is important to note that the criteria for the selection of any board member have been long established, and during the early tenure of this government, the criteria have not been amended. There have never been any legally established criteria published to select a board member other than being a fit and proper person and approval by cabinet. In addition, the standing orders clearly state that no member shall ask a question where the answer to which can be found by reference to available official publications, standing order 17.1 G Roman numeral 9. The members of all the government board members, directors of boards were all gazetted. In addition, the cabinet decisions of each were made known to the public. However, Mr. Speaker, I must inform this honorable house Government of the, the Government of the Virgin Islands recently submitted to Cabinet a more structured criterion for the selection of board members, which includes advertising in the public domain. This further strengthening of our, our capacity to increase our ongoing strengthening of good governance as we strive to fulfill the mission and aspiration of our four parents to be a self-governed people. In addition, Mr. Speaker, since this administration took office in February 2019, it came to light that most of the government boards were operating in silos and not in the most prudent and efficient manner to ensure that their mission was in concert with the goals of the client, which is the government of the Virgin Islands. In so doing, the decision was taken in the best interest of the people of the Virgin Islands to approve the chairperson of the BVI Tourist Board the BVI Airports Authority, and the Chairman of the BVI Ports Authority, all to serve on each other's boards, to bring synergy to the efforts of the boards, and to allow for the necessary cross-agency collaboration in the development and implementation of all strategies related towards tourism and other areas of our economy. This course of action continues to yield great dividends. Mr. Speaker, Given the aforementioned backdrop that was needed to bring context to the misleading information in the public domain about persons serving on more than one board, I now inform that further clarity of information to put in context the question posed. Mr. Speaker, one, the BVI Ports Authority remuneration. Mr. Speaker, since March 1st, 2019, the following payments have been dispersed to members. Chairman, in terms of the, the annual would be $22,791.69, Deputy Chair $17,321.69, and Mr. Speaker, this is a total of all the members, um, it would be uh, $110,720.14. But Mr. Speaker, I think it's important to put it in context for all boards. AHS Stowe Community College Board of Governors, since their chair, which has been the same um, even before we took office, $31,500. Deputy chair, $10,000. And when you add up all the members for the yearly, $99,200. BVI Ports uh, Authority remuneration, again, all of this has been before the tenure of this government, but still is. Chairman, $39,000. Deputy chair, $35,450. Members, in terms of all the members, because there are a series of members on the board, $180,640.78. In terms of the BVI Social Security Board, and this again has been before the tenure of this government and into present, Chairman, $28,800. Deputy Chair, 
all the members combined, again, $115,200. In the BVI Health Services Authority remuneration, Chairman, $22,000. Deputy Chairman, $12,832.26. All the members combined um, is $80,171.50. And there are a series of members, again. All of this has been before the tenure of this administration. BVI Financial Services Commission, Chairman, $48,000. Deputy Chairman, $34,200. All the members combined, $142,500. BBI Tourist Board, um, since March 2019, the following payments have been dispersed to members. Chairman, $37,800. Deputy Chair, um, $31,500. Members, $170,100. And I must be clear that we are doing this since March 1st, the total that was dispersed to members. But it is the same among all the time. So that's not the yearly, that's since March 1st, 2019. Let me make it clear to the date. Um, but, but the amounts in terms of what is paid has not changed from the, the, before the tenure of this government. So since March 1st, 2019 is the answer for all of them. May, let me clear that. The following payments have been dispersed to members for the National Bank. Chairman, 57,500 to date from March 1st, 2019. Deputy Chairman, 52,000. All the members combined, 387,500 dollars. Mr. Speaker, the BVI Tourist and Film Commission Board, current members and associated stipend paid monthly to each member is as follows. Let me give the members, Mr. Speaker. The Chairman now um, is Ms. Kanisha Sprouge, which replaced Mr. Russell Harrigan, 1,800 dollars monthly. The, chair, the deputy chair is Mr. Bevis Sylvester, who replaced Mr. Clyde Letsom, and still $1,500. The, the member, Ms. Keisha Barnes, ba Davis Barnes, um, who replaced Mr. Denison Fraser, $900. And uh, we have um, uh, Mr. Kelvin Christopher, who replaced Ms. Tanya Whistler, $900. Ms. Gloria Foy, who replaced Mr. Robert Henry, $900. Ms. Sasha. Um, S. Hodge, who uh, replaced uh, Ms. The Cedric Sinry, $900. Uh, Ms. Uh, Natalia Isaac, who replaced Ms. Julia, $900, because that's a member. Mr. Mike Rowe um, was replaced by Ms. Mr. Sorry, Ms. Julia Dawson uh, replaced Mr. Melvin Vanderpool, $900. Mr. Derek Marshall replaced Ms. Delma Maduro, $900. Ms. Arlene Parsons replaced the, um, the former member, is $900. Mr. Clyde McCoy, ex officio. Um, the PS is ex officio. No stipend is paid to ex officios. And the FS is the ex officio. Mr. Speaker, in terms of BVI Airports Authority, Mr. Speaker, again, the same um, introduction um, will preface this. But again, we are talking about from March 1st, 2019. Uh, the following payments have been dispersed to members of the airport. And Mr. Speaker, I think I went through that with the, with the last um, question. So I will go into the monthly, Mr. Speaker. The chairman now, Mr. Bell Sylvester, who replaced Mr. Glenn Harrigan, chair, 1250 monthly. Ms. Patsy Lake, who replaced Deborah Hodge, Romney Hodge, 950. Ms. Judy Ann Smith, who replaced Mr. Harvey Horbert. $800. Mr. Kelvin Hodge, who replaced Mr. Clarence Michael Thomas, $800. Mr. Marlon Chukutu, who replaced Mr. Ephraim Penn, $800. Mr. Raul Sprob, who replaced Mr. Roy Sebastian, $800. Mr. Hippolito Diego Penn, who replaced Mr. Clyde Letsom, $800. Mr. Theodore Bork, who replaced Mr. Coy Levin, $800. Mr. Kinesha Sprob, again by her post as chair of Tourist Board, who replaced Mr. Denston Fraser, $800. And uh, Mr. Natalian Isaac, um, who would have replaced the chair, so to speak, but not the chair, but that position of Ms. Sharon Flax Brutus, $800. Dr. Carolyn O'Neill now would be the PS, so there'd be no stipend, uh, ex officio. And the FS, who has to be there, whoever the SS is, is ex officio. Now we move on to BBI Ports Authority. Mr. Speaker, I, I give the same. Um, uh, introductory, so I'll go straight into the monthly. And Mr. Speaker, the monthly now, Mr. Kelvin Hodge, who uh, replaced Mr. Wendell Gaskin, is the chair, $800 for BBI Ports. Mr. Ms. Roxanne Sylvester replaced Ms. 
Mr. Kevin S. Foy as deputy $1,500. Mr. Vincent Watley replaced Ms. Patricia Romney, $900. Mr. Keith Plax, who is on now in place of Ibrahim A. Tarabi, $900. Mr. Mara Widi Hajj, who replaced Ms. Lynette Abbott, $900. Mr. Damian Letsom, who replaced Mr. Walford Farrington, $900. And uh, um, in terms of posts, both Ms. Kenesha Sprav, the chairman of the Tourist Board by post, and the Airports Authority Chair, Mr. Sylvester, would be there by post. And both of them would be $900. Ms. Adivine Maynard, the FS, and the PS at ex officio. Um, Maynard being the managing director now. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. In terms of the Telecommunication Regulatory Commission, Mr. Speaker, since I've gone through all the details, let me go straight to the monthly. You now have, in terms of the, the telecommunication, I think that they slipped in the wrong one there, a minute, one minute. Yes. One minute for me, please. Thank you. The chair now is Mr. Vance Lewis, who replaced Mr. Michael Thomas, who was on a few boards also, um, for a monthly payment of $1,800. Mr. Vincent Watley replaced Mr. Delroy Williams, and he is the deputy chair at $1,500. And uh, by Ms. Joyce Moraine, um, who's just the commissioner, is $1,000, and also Sylvester, who replaced it, David Sylvester, who replaced it, Mr. Jerry Samuel, is $1,000. Now, Mr. Speaker, I think that that covered, did I cover the, the um, all of them? Okay, good. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's the detailed list, and as you, you can see, there was one or two errors that we saw out there, but I'll, I'll get that for you. Not in figures, but just, you know, grammatical. But, Mr. Speaker, I presented a detailed list, and also in terms of the policy behind um, why some of the persons are on other boards. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Premier for uh, that comprehensive information. As much as I am trained to work with computers, and I love computers, I don't have the the ability to analyze in milliseconds like com computers. So I won't be able to go through all that, that detail in a, in a reasonable time to, to come back with the follow-ups based on the detail. But what I will ask, Mr. Speaker, is just want clarity. I know he, my Premier might have said it, and I just want to make sure, Premier, because I don't want to misrepresent the information before me. Um, you're saying that you haven't increased any of the four boards that I asked about, um, the salaries for the board members since taking office, I just want confirmation and clarity on no, this. No, one or two of them did increase. Uh, I can't tell you which one or two it is, but I know one or two did do a slight increase. Okay. So, so the, sure, that you asked about. Okay, so the details for those are here with, within the data that you, you gave me. The increases. Uh, it should be, but if it is not, please let me know I'll present it. All right, thank you. I'll, I'll have to go through that in a later date. And if, Need be, I'll come back with a follow-up question. But, um, Mr. Speaker, at this point, I would like to thank the Premier for answering the questions posed to him in kind. I also would like to thank the Honourable Premier for answering his questions. Um, members, it's my intention to finish all the questions and then break for lunch. So at this time, I will call on the Leader of Opposition to ask the Member, the Honourable Minister of Transportation, his questions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I agree with that position. There's only a few more questions. Mr. Um, so speaker, question number one. Speaker, could the Minister of Transportation, Works, and Utilities please tell this humble house? A, if the $200,000 allocated to each member, District 1 through 9, under the civil mitigation vote, in the 2020 budget under, the, under his ministry, and that should have been 2021, is used, what is, which is used to conduct infrastructural work in each, dis each district is available to District 8 or any other district, any of the eight districts, 
And B, if the answer is no, please advise why not. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My uh, response would be quite brief. I thank the Leader of the Opposition for the question. Mr. Speaker, yes, this allocation is available to each District 1 through District 9, including uh, District 8. The 200,000 that is allocated in the 2021 budget. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank you, Minister, for that response, because um, the reality is that prior to asking this question, uh, we were told it wasn't available. So it's, I'm glad to know that it's now available for persons within the, the district representatives could do the necessary works within their district. Um, one other follow-up, Mr. Speaker, um, to the Minister. Minister, I know during the 2021 budget, we also allocated some funds for civil, for um, true, true um, what do you call it, recurrent, to that deals typically with cleaning up both the guts and, and clearing of the areas within communities and cleaning up the communities. Can you confirm whether that those funds that were budgeted in 2021 are now available to at the disposal of the districts one through nine? I thank you for your follow-up, leader of the opposition. Um, I'm wasn't aware that you, you were told that the funds were not available, but I'm happy that I was able to rectify it in my response. Uh, regarding your follow-up, I'm not aware that it's not there. Whatever is in the budget should be available, uh, but I will confirm with my team because I don't have uh, the response to your question here with me. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And I, and I I look forward to your response. We were also subsequently told that those monies weren't yet available um, within the, the, the agreed allotment in the budget. So we look forward to your follow-up response on that um, so that persons within our communities could get the necessary relief um, in those areas as relates to gut cleaning and et cetera. Um, I'll move on to question number two, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister of Transportation, Works, and Utilities please advise this Honorable House if his ministry intends to clean the guts, waterways, and drains in District 8 and around the territory ahead of the official start of the hurricane season? A, if the answer is yes, please advise when this will happen, if the district representatives will be part of the process, and B, if the answer is no, please explain why not. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I I wish to advise that the Public Works Department will commence the cleaning of guts and drains throughout the territory. Mr. Speaker, we began the first week of May uh, because this was a question asked in a previous sitting. And uh, Mr. Speaker, given the financial constraints that we are currently experiencing due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Public Works Department will carry out majority of the cleaning using internal resources, hence the early start. However, Mr. Speaker, where there may be a need for external resources, the respective representative for the area will be consulted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I also want to, for the, for the edification of the public, let them know that this indeed, um, I saw your response in the media, Minister for Transportation, that you've commenced um, subsequent to this question being posed to the Honorable House. And I want to thank you and your team for your diligence, um, specifically to um, the areas in, in my community, um, in the 8th District, Huam, Greenland, Hope Hill, Paramtown, et cetera. Um, there are some areas, I haven't seen any work in those areas as yet, um, and there's some really bad areas. I know some of the Residents have taken it upon themselves with equipment to clear some of the areas. Um, and, and I will consult with you in terms of when we could get those areas cleaned. And there are some specific areas that we've been having a challenge getting clean over the last two years, but more specifically Parham Town and by the Red Bay Dock next to Mr. Letsom's property there in Red Bay um, so that we could get those areas addressed um, and, and create some, some easement um, from the mosquitoes and the different um, um, impediments, and as we see, the rain is, is happening now. So I just want to 
bring those to your attention um, publicly, Mr. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, just like all other reps, um, once there are areas of concern, uh, you would liaise with me, and we will definitely work to have those areas addressed. So I ask that you, you, know, you reach out so I can be aware of those, those critical areas that you speak about, and we will definitely bring a team out and, and have them addressed. At the meantime, we have um, work, been working on the sister islands as well, and we have uh, placed teams at various places that we're uh, working on addressing. So once it's that area, like you mentioned, we will work to address it. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And I, I will, I did mention it to your team, but I will bring those areas to you offline so we could get those specific areas addressed. Um, because they are very critical to persons within my community, particularly Parham Town, which is a, is a huge gut that, that leads from the Penn's residents come all, all the way down to the sea. Um, so again, I want to, at this time, Mr. Speaker, thank the Minister for answering my questions in kind and providing that information to the people of the territory, and my, particularly the people of my community, so they could know what's happening as we relates to the gut cleaning exercise and, and road cleaning exercise within the territory. We now move on to the leader of position asking questions to the Honorable Minister of Natural Resources and Labor and Immigration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Natural Resources and Labor and Immigration please tell the Sample House what is the quantity of unencumbered crown land under the ownership of the Government of the Virgin Islands? And B, Please list the geographic location of said properties and the combined acreage for location. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the question. I told the member earlier I was going to make a statement on land, so once I saw his question, I pulled his statement back. And if he is not, if he's drill me enough, I'll bring an answer back, full information back next time. Mr. Speaker, the quantity of unencumbered crown lands under the ownership of the government of the Virgin Islands is not definable at this time. There are areas of reclamations that have not been mapped and therefore no legal parcels exist. However, such areas would be the property of the government of the Virgin Islands. Mr. Speaker, there is a lot to be done in the area of crown lands and the ministry will be working through to get all this information on the database to be updated regularly as we move forward and thus to make such a request at this time easily available. Mr. Speaker, the areas of Enegara is approximately 7,300 acres, inclusive of all ponds, the Ramsar sites. On the west portion, approximately 24 acres, the Deep Bay area, approximately 420 acres. The Enegada Development Plan 2009 gives a description of the proposed development of these areas. On Tortola, there are approximately 212 acres of land. A Smuggler's Cove, approximately 10 acres. Approval of development and subdivision plan is pending from the planning department. In the Nibs Estate, approximately 55 acres. Spooners Estate, approximately 43 acres. Balsam Guts, approximately 95 acres. The prison and reservoir are on the same parcel, up at Balsam God. Waterfront, approximately 9 acres. Adjacent to the, to the helipad and inclusive of the parking lot across from the Dr. D. Orlando Smith Hospital and QE2 parks. On Virgin Order, approximately 1,596 acres. At the Copper Mine, which is for residential and commercial, approximately 43 acres. Proposed development plan prepared, waiting on planning approval. In the Bond North Sound, approximately 23 acres. Residential, 17 persons approved by cabinet in 2015. Planning approval received in 2021. Cutting of road network is due to begin shortly. Great Hill, North Sound, approximately 241 acres, all residential. 
35 persons approved by cabinet in 2015. Development plan inclusive of road network is pending. Nail Bay to Leverick Bay, approx approximately 635 acres, all commercial. No development plan currently exists. Baker's Bay, approximately 34 acres. Commercial, all commercial. Eight persons approved by cabinet in 2015. Proposed development subdivision plan prepared. Approval to be sought from the planning department. Soldier Bay to North Sound, approximately 620 acres. Includes the current dump site location. No development plan currently exists. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for providing that detailed explanation to this Honorable House because I know many persons have been contacting wanting to know the availability and the possibility of having access to Crown land in a territory and what is the process. Um, so I, I expect that that information will be made public so persons of the territory could know um, where properties are available and the proposed usage of those pieces of property and then themselves could make a determination of the process so they could then apply to the Ministry for Natural Resources and Labor to be considered um, for a piece of Crown land. Um, I, I wouldn't go any deeper in that right now. I'll move on to question number, number, number two. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister for Natural Resources, Labor, and Immigration please tell this Amber House, A, has his ministry identified any of these properties for distribution to the first-time homeowners or housing scheme? If yes, please provide details to this Amber House, and B, if the answer is no, please advise why not. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, for this very important question. Yes, Mr. Speaker, the ministry has identified some areas from the mentioned properties previously listed. As stated, with the areas on Tortola, that is the Balsam Gut land, proposals are, be, are being looked at in terms of opening a portion of the area to be able to provide residential parcels to first-time owners. Obviously, this will be done with the assistance of the planning department to come up with a development that is suitable, sustainable, practical, usable and manageable. The terrain in this area poses quite a bit of challenges, but we will have to see what we can extract to make available. The Spooners Estate and Nibs Estate are already areas already had a development subdivision plan. Almost all the parcels that were created have been distributed. Now it's a matter of being able to have roads cut and access provided to lots that can be created based on the mentioned plans. Again, like Spooners, we may lose some lots because of the terrain and massive boulders, as well as the gut within the development. The same can be said of the areas on Virgin Gorda. Everything ultimately comes down to road cutting and making lands accessible. Mr. Speaker, it makes no sense to distribute lands and no access roads exist. However, making the development sustainable with all the required amenities, that is, electricity, water, internet, etc., is the way forward for all government land development projects. I'll add one thing, Mr. Speaker. The first development, I think the roads are uh, starting to be cut this very weekend here in Virgin, out of copper mine area. So we are making progress, thanks to the Premier making some funding available for making access to lands available. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I thank the um, Minister for his response, and I think that will elucidate for persons in the territory who are looking at, at potential options. I know in particular there are some areas, and I don't know if it's an issue. Leader, leader of opposition, um, I realize that instead of you asking us a new question, you keep giving some statements. Basically, you're making statements instead of asking a follow-up. Mr. Speaker, I got to get to the follow-up, and I have to set the stage. No, I want to make ask, sure. I need to ask a follow-up because you, I realize you're you are giving statements every time you answer and not ask a question. So can you please just give the follow-up? Well, you, you have to give me a chance to get to the follow-up, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate your patience as you allow me to get to the follow-up questions. As I was saying, Mr. Speaker, 
um, in particularly the areas in Greenland, Balsam, got in some of the areas around the territory. I know there's some additional properties that are not, when you look at the, on the land registry map, it is saying it's still owned by the Crown. Um, in terms of the process, particularly for Boston God that you mentioned, um, Mr. Minister for Natural Resources and Labor, um, can you, I, I'm hoping, and I'll ask this question, if you're going to include the district rep in the process, so at least we could have a discussion to ensure that all the persons that have written to you and have written to us in terms of um, district, in the districts who are requiring the um, assistance with property could be at least in co considered in consideration for the, for the properties in, or in the process, be considered in the process for the allocations. Does it a person wish to own a piece of property or encourage the persons to first apply to natural resources and also in, in involve the district rep? I will go to no district and give anybody land without first um, meeting with the district rep. One of the things we want to avoid, Mr. Speaker, is giving persons land who are not really ready at this point in time to receive the land, while other persons who are ready to build have to wait. That knowledge can only come from a district rep who would know these persons intimately and what the potential is. In terms of priority areas, Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to start a new subdivision so easily unless I give persons who already were allotted lands access to existing lands. I met several subdivisions with no access roads. The Premier has made some funding available and working feverishly to get roads in these areas where persons already had lands. There's a point giving new lands, again, leaving the old lands there still tied up with no access roads. We purchased new equipment. It arrived just last week to make sure we can get all the surveying done because we have to, to do a much better job of getting lands to persons in a much shorter period. I've been fighting this battle for two and a half years. I've given up very few pieces of land. So, the, and this thing is very, very dear to me. We've gone to the extreme to make sure there's money to cut roads. We have extra survey equipment so we can get on with getting this place cut up and giving people house lots. I want to see Beaver Islanders owning a piece of their own territory. That is my ambition right now, and I aim moving from it. That's my ambition. Get roads to process land, and then get new subdivisions done, and just keep doing it all the time. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you, Minister. And I have a, another follow-up, Minister. Um, specific to, and, I, and, I, and I, I commend you for that, that approach, and I think that's, that's the right approach. Um, in terms of the, the um, I, I'm getting, see, I had a senior moment, Minister, I forget my follow-up question. The, the application process, um, can we, is that anywhere that the, the persons, so that could be clear in terms of what is the process um, for applying for land, and, 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 and um, the, what is a cover letter, whatever the process, if there's a form, et cetera, and also a part B to that. Um, there are persons who have, who have said, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing this, and I want you to clarify this, if this is true or not, that persons who had fell behind in paying off for their property have been told that the property will be taken from them if they don't pay off their outstanding balance. Um, is, this, is this true or is this accurate? Can you please confirm if this is accurate? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let's go to the first part first. Person who wish to apply for a piece of land, it's a simple letter to the Ministry of Natural Resources, Labor and Immigration. I'm interested in owning property in this particular area if there's an area of choice. It's just that simple. It's a database where all the names and requests are kept electronically. So I can tell you how many, how many I have in there already, which is several hundred in some areas. In some of persons who land have been taken back, I do recall it happened a few years ago. Persons were granted crown lands that uh, were given payment plans. Some ran 10 to 15 years paying off their loans. I sent out a notice, uh, must have been a year, last year, given those persons who are already behind. Because when you, when you purchase the land, you're given a time to pay off, let's say three or four or five years. These persons have went long, way beyond the five or 10 years. We're now into 15, 20 years. But I've seen one case, 29 years, the person who were given land and didn't pay for it. I gave those persons, I think, an extra month so 10 years and one month to find that money. Those that did not find the money, their names were not removed from the list, but they were put back onto the waiting area until they are ready. So the persons who are ready to build now, who had the funding, got the preference over those persons who didn't have the money to pay up for those lands. I think it's only fair that somebody can't even afford to buy the land, how are you going to build a house? 
So persons who show more potential to do that were given the preference. So those, those persons whose name are not put back on the list, whenever they are ready and there's more land available, they are given first preference in that second round. But nobody will be denied a proper chance at owning property in a BVI. I think that would be a disservice to the community if we take that approach. But persons, I've said that before, must get themselves ready. You must prepare yourself financially or otherwise to own the opportunity when it comes. You must be there prepared to receive your blessing when the blessing comes. You can't just pray and do nothing. When the blessing comes, you aren't prepared to receive your blessing. I've been saying this for two years. But persons need to get themselves ready. The land is not free. It's going to cost something depending on the location. So the best thing you can do, if you know you want to own a piece of land, start saving some money. Every month, save a $50 or $25, whatever you can afford, $100. I'm willing to work with persons. If you can't pay out one time, we can give you a payment plan within a reasonable time frame. The same way you could, you could find $30 to buy a car, I'm sure you could find $15 to buy a piece of land. So I'm not sure why you have to wait so long to pay out for land when persons who have, who have been preparing themselves have the funding and are ready to go ahead. Well, your puppy showing that saving your money. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll stop there. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, and I, I just want to thank you for that response, Minister. Very detailed. Um, in terms of uh, those persons that paid anything at all, were they able to get back their monies, or, or were they, or did they forfeit the, um, the funds that they paid towards these properties um, in terms of the pay-down process? I think in most cases, no money was paid at all. I think those who have paid partial payment either got a refund or they haven't been removed. They are given a full extension to pay. I can't think of any person who were removed who owed money. But I think if they did, they would have been, they would have been refunded. If not, if you know something, please let me know. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll, I'll move on. I'll move on. I'll move on to question number three, I think it is. Uh, Mrs. I'm correct, right? It's question number three? Yeah. So, Speaker, could the Minister for Natural Resources, Labor, and Immigration please tell this Honorable House? A. What is the detail and cumulative cost of the Joe's Hill housing development? And B. Provide a detailed description slash breakdown of the type of homes slash condos or units uh, that development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hope you got my written response already. The specifics of each line item as of April 27, 2021 are as follows. The Social Security Board purchased three parcels for the sum of $769,000 in 2016 comprising of Rotong Registration Block 2837D, Parcel 83, Lot B, 2.268 acres. Rotan Registration, Block 2837D, Parcel 84, Lot C, 2.268 acres. Rotan Registration, Block 2837D, Parcel 85, Lot D, 0 0.25 acres. Subsequently, in 2017, the Social Security Board purchased a fourth parcel for a sum of $360,000. See Cosby Registration, Block 2737B, Parcel 207, Lot A, 2.268 acres. In July 2017, the properties were amalgamated and registered as Rotan Registration, Block 2837D, Parcel 90. The total purchase price of the property was $1,129,000. Appraisal. The Social Security Board incurred the sum of $1,700 between 2016 and 2017 for the costs associated with the appraisal of the four parcels. In January 2021, $6,250 was paid to BCQS as partial payment for the upon completion appraisal that they were commissioned to perform. The sum of $7,950 has been spent to date for this land item. The sum of $8,750 is assigned for further appraisal costs, legal and survey fees. Legal fees for the period 2016 to present total $2,722. This amount represents the cost incurred for the land acquisition 
and amalgamation of the Joe's Hill properties, plus survey consultancy work performed by Guardian Surveying Services Limited. The sum of 25,000 and 90,000 are assigned for future legal and survey costs, respectively. Architectural and design costs. The architectural and design fees associated with the pro project total $625,817. The Social Security Board expended the amount for works performed by JL Development, a joint venture established by James Tabin Construction and Larry Adams Construction Companies. Contractor fees. The contractor fees associated with, this, with the project total $10,389,458. At the inception of the Joe's Hill Manor Housing Development Project, JL Development was contracted to construct residential homes and a commercial building. In 2018, the relationship between the owners of JL Development was dissolved, and all efforts on the property was suspended. During the same period, the Social Security Board paid $185,000 to JL Development to terminate a contract to develop the Joe's Hill property. The Social Security Board has expended a sum of $10,204,458.07 from May 2020 to the present. This amount includes payment of the site mobilization deposit and all subsequent drawdowns payable to the contractor to progress the development. Each draw request was executed once. Validate, was executed once validated by certified evaluation reports of completed works by the respective key personnel. The sum of $7,734,646.25 remained unpaid to the contractor for the completion of the construction works. Project management fees. In 2016, the Social Security Board Contract the services of SEO Enterprises Limited, which is owned and managed by Mr. Dean Stout, to provide project management services for the Joe's Hill development. The sum of 200,000 has been expended to Mr. Stout for work undertaken between 2017 and 2021. The sum of 320,000 is assigned for future project management costs. Miscellaneous. There have been no miscellaneous costs to date. However, the sum of 40,000 is assigned for future miscellaneous expenses for the remainder of the development. Mr. Speaker, the following is a synopsis of the structures being erected on the Joe's Hill property. Six one-bedroom condo, 900 square feet. 18 two-bedroom condos, 1,100 square feet. Six two-bedroom split-level condos, 1,200 square feet. 13 two-bedroom house, 1,100 square feet, three three-bedroom houses, 1,600 square feet, two two-bedroom townhouses, 1,600 square feet, four three-bedroom townhouses, 2,500 square feet, 52 in total, one three-story building, which is commercial, 5,968 square feet. The specific details of the 52 residential areas include, I'll just give it to you, six one-bedroom condos. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, you said a lot. Before I ask my follow-up, I just want to confirm, I, think, I don't think I heard the cumulative costs in terms of what we, we have uh, proposed, uh, what is, um, to date, I, I didn't hear that, that aspect of it. What's the, the, um, the cumulative cost of the Joseph's product? I heard bits and pieces in terms of cost in there. Uh, you did, did you have a cumulative cost? But it's 10, 20 million, 18 million. Um, what was the cumulative cost? Sir, Mr. Speaker, I think this that part. Yeah. I didn't miss it. So let's go through the full, the full thing again. Land purchases, funds expended to date, 1 million. $129,000. Total project costs, $1,129,000. Appraisal fees, $7,950.
estimated future, 8,750 for a total of 16,700. Legal and survey fees, $2,722. Future, estimated future, 115,000 for a total of 117,722. Architecture and design fees, $625,817. Total, $625,817. Contractor fees, $10,389,458.07. Estimated future, $7,734,000. $7,734,000. $7,734,000. $646.25. Total project cost $18,124,104.32. Project management fees to date $200,000. Estimated future $320,000. Total $520,000. Miscellaneous cost $40,000. Total $20,000. $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20, $20,
uh, on, the, on the term of affordable housing, who could find 75K. Mrs. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm getting... Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, all due respect, Mr. Speaker, we have to be consistent. We have to be balanced. Mr. Speaker, uh, can I finish, speak, if you mind? Point of information. Mr. Speaker, we have to be consistent. We have to be fair. We have to be balanced. The understanding of also speaks to responses to questions, and questions must, responses and answers must be confined to the specific question posed. I continuously have to deal with statements and run-ons being made by ministers responding to the questions that are not specific to the questions posed. And I don't hear the same level of sanction, the same level of, of, of continued interruption when those members are being allowed to make those statements. So all I'm asking as a member of this House, as a leader opposition who has a responsibility for accountability, transparency, and to ask questions in this house, to be able to ask my questions of the ministers before me. Mr. Speaker, there are certain words that I listened to the leader of the opposition use, but he mistaken the length of the answers, Mr. Speaker, for the in-depth information that is being given to the member. And if his follow-up is dealing with that information, fine. So, Mr. Speaker, I would prefer for the leader of opposition to stick with his side and petition for what he wants and thinks that he understands based on the, his interpretation and standing orders. But to, to give the assumption that there's not fairness in the House, Mr. Speaker, because of the answers being given to his questions being lengthy, is not something, Mr. Speaker, I can sit and allow without lending my voice to state that this side of the aisle as well as his side is operating with the same integrity and operating to make sure that this house operates with integrity. It's not happening on one side alone, it's, it's happening on both sides of the aisle and I just want to make sure that I state this on the, the records of the house, Mr. Speaker, because that was a loaded statement by the leader of the opposition and I cannot leave it go without having something sitting parallel to it on the record of this house. Mr. So Speaker, I was very, very specific in terms of what I referred to. And I don't know, based on the Premier's response, I was very, very specific to what I said. In terms of the specific answers to the question posed and making statements contrary to the, answer, to the, to the questions posed. But I will digress, I digress. Thank you. And I will go on to ask my follow-up question to the minister, and I, and I was very clear in my point of information that I made in this honorable house, and I'm not backing down from that. Mr. Speaker, in terms of my second follow-up to the minister, um, in terms of whatever minister, and I, and I, and I, I like I said, I differ in, in, your, in your, your, what you, your response, but what I would say is that whatever program is available for persons to assist them, um, in that process, please uh, ask the ministry to assist because as, as we later look income, I don't, I don't see, based on my analysis, that persons could find that, that startup capital as needed to, to get into one of these homes. Um, I'll move on to question number four, if you don't have, if you don't have a thing to say, Mr. I'm not sure what the, what the members are getting at. What are you suggesting that we do? Uh, we give them all for free or give them below cost and take on? What are you suggesting here, really? What, 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 do, you, what do you want us to do? Um, I, I am just suggesting so we, that we be mindful of the reality of the situation so that when we're doing our analysis to look at how are we going to distribute and get persons at these homes, to be mindful of that reality in terms of what the initial in the market startup cost is relating to, um, to the situation. So, so we have to be mindful because I understand in your statement um, that you're going through, you have yet to go through that process in terms of allocations and formalize the process. You made a statement in the House to that regards. Um, and I and have yet to see what that process is, but I, all, I want to ensure that we're mindful in the Samuel House based on the realities on the ground, that this is the reality. That's all I'm saying. So, so whenever you experts or whoever gets in the room, 
this has, I want to make sure that we're mindful and the public is mindful that this is the reality um, in, in the, current, um, the current climate and current market. Okay. Thank you, but that applies to any single thing. There's some things some persons simply can't afford. Some persons can drive Suzuki, some can drive BMW. So I'm not, we still don't know what, what you want us to do. But we are mindful that things have a cost to them, you know. Now, whether some persons who you want to target can afford these things or not, we'll have to see what we can do at a point in time to assist these persons. Say right now. Then they're not low. Then they're not low-income homes. Then that's all I'm saying. <laughs> the point is they're not low-income homes. <laughs> I'll move on to question number four. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, could the Minister for Natural Resources, Labour, Immigration, please tell us on the House, give a detailed exp a give a detailed explanation of the application process for the Jewel Housing Program. B, how many persons have applied, and of the applications, how many of the applicants were approved or shortlisted, and C, the estimated, the estimated cost of each home, condo, or unit. I think you already asked some of these questions here, but nonetheless, I'll give my prepared answer. Mr. Speaker, on 20th April 2017, the territory celebrated the Social Security Board on the groundbreaking ceremony for the Joe's Hill housing development. At the same time, an exuberant and overwhelming show of support and expressions of interest were received by the Social Security Board from the public. This included an influx of calls, emails, and letters from many interested persons. Applications were also made available to the public, including eligibility criteria for the Social Security Board First Time Homeowners Program. Sadly, five months later, our territory was ravaged by hurricanes Irma and Maria, which halted all works on the development. On May 28, 2020, a contract was executed between the Social Security Board and the contractor, James Tarbon Construction Limited, for the commencement, or should be recommencement, of construction works. And on July 1, 2020, site mobilization works began. At this time, the Social Security Board had received 643 expressions of interest. This included applications and other forms of interest, such as emails and letters. Where applications were not received or were received but incomplete, the Board launched a campaign to contact those persons using all available information. The Air Force employed by the Social Security staff included telephone calls, emails, and even social media. While an artist exercised, the process was necessary for the Social Security team to advance the selection process. On June 5, 2020, the board issued a notice advising the public of the suspension of new applications for the First Time Homeowners Initiative. The public was informed that while the Joe's Hill development had been re recently reinstated, the application process to declare interest in development ended in 2017. Mr. Speaker, with a number of applications exceeding 600, the board felt it was appropriate to suspend that stage of the application process. To date, Mr. Speaker, the Social Security Board continues to develop a transparent and reliable process for the first-time homeowners application process. Applications were vetted to confirm that each, one, is thoroughly completed, two, satisfied all elig eligibility requirements. Mr. Speaker, again, the eligibility requirements require that applicants must, one, be a first-time homeowner indeed, two, be a beaver lander, belonger, or resident of the territory for the last 20 years. Three, attend a home buyer's education program and earn a certificate of completion. Four, occupy the property as your primary residence. Five, have an annual household income of not more, of not more than $150,000. From the vetting exercise, the list of applicants will result in a natural shortlisting 
of eligible applicants. Mr. Speaker, once the complete terms of the application process are completed, that information will be made available to the public. Mr. Speaker, the Social Security Board intends on pursuing a prudent and transparent approach to the application process for the Joe's Hill development, and I can assure you that their work continues in that vein. Mr. Speaker, the Social Security Board received 643 expressions of interest. Out of 643 applications received, the number was reduced to 409 completed applications. Mr. Speaker, the 409 applicants are on record I'll provide complete and complete information as required by the eligibility criteria. For clarity, the drop in number from 643 to 409 resulted from applicants and co-applicants who could not be reached for information needed to complete the application, despite recurrent attempts. Number two, applicants and co-applicants who confirmed being no longer interested in the program for personal reasons. And three, applicants and or co-applicants who did not satisfy the eligibility requirements. To date, there have not been any approvals granted pending the next phase, which entails shortlisting the 409 by a process to be approved by the Social Security Board, Board of Directors. Mr. Speaker, the estimated cost of each condo or unit. Mr. Speaker, that information is currently not available. The Social Security Board completed an upon completion appraisal of the property in March 2021 and concluded the tender for a surveyor who must now complete his work. These exercises play an instrumental role in assisting the Social Security Board with finalizing the pricing of the homes. Once the surveying exercise is completed, the Social Security Board will share information on the pricing options for the houses with the public. Just give us a little more time, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I think that information was clear. I don't think I have any follow-up questions at this time. I'll assess the information, and then subsequently, if I need to follow up any questions, I will bring them to the Sambal House. But what I would do at this time is thank the minister for answering the questions posed to him in kind. I thank you, Minister of um, Resources, Labor, and Immigration for your answers. And I also thank you, Leader Opposition, for your questions. At this time, we will break for lunch. It is now 4.15, so we'll break and we'll be back here at 5.15. This animal house Jesus.
Please be seated. This Honorable House now resumes its sitting. We will, I call upon the clerk. Item number eight, public business, one, government business, introduction and first reading. Thank you. I call upon the Honorable Minister for Natural Resources and Labor sorry, Natural Resources, Labor, and Immigration to introduce the bill entitled Immigration and Passport Amendment Act 2021. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to move a motion for the introduction and first reading of the bill entitled Immigration and Passport Amendment Act 2021. Mr. Speaker, I move that leave be granted to introduce the following bill standing in my name shortly entitled Immigration and Passport Amendment Act 2021. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second a motion. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded that leave to introduce the bill shortly entitled Immigration and Passport Amendment Act 2021 be granted. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. I call upon the Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I introduce the bill standing in my name shortly entitled Immigration and Passport Amendment Act 2021 and will explain its provisions at a second reading. Mr. Speaker, sir, I move that a bill shortly entitled Immigration and Passport Amendment Act 2021 be now read a first time. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded that the bill shortly entitled Immigration and Passport Amendment Act 2021 be now read for a first time. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. I call upon the clerk to read the bill for a first time. This act may be cited as the Immigration and Passport Amendment Act 2021. Thank you. I call upon the Minister for Transportation, Works and Utilities to have the second and third read of the bill entitled Explosives Amendment Act 2021. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move that the bill shortly entitled Explosive Amendment Act 2021 be read a second time. Mr. Speaker, while I'm on my feet, I would uh, explain the bill's objects and reason. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the Explosive Amendment Act 2021 was introduced and read for the first time in the House of Assembly on Thursday, 4 March 2021 by your truly Minister for Transportation, Works and Utilities. Mr. Speaker, the bill, however, first received, was first received in the House of Assembly on the 28th of January 2021. And the purpose of the bill, Mr. Speaker, is to amend Section 2 of the Principal Act by widening the definition of explosives so that it includes explosives materials which may be used in a firearm as ammunition including articles consisting of a cartridge case, blank cartridges, or training cartridges. Mr. Speaker, given that what has been occurring, occurring in this territory as it relates to gun crime, and Mr. Speaker, this government, we have bemoaned the fact that gun crimes have no place in our community. And Mr. Speaker, we would work to try to get that out of this community because, Mr. Speaker, gun crime is like fungus. It's like fungus that eats away at the very fabric of us as human beings. Mr. Speaker, within our territory, we are embedded in a community deeply rooted in religion, family, um, hardship, hard work. And Mr. Speaker, gun crime have no place in our community, so we will extend every effort 
to strengthen the legislation, to wide, widen the definition of the word explosives so that persons convicted of gun offenses are prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law and they are not released because of technicalities resulting from the definition in the legislation not being wide enough to cover explosive materials used in firearms. So speaker, unfortunately, in 2020, the Court of Appeals in the matter of Selvin Shinnery versus the Commissioner of Police ruled that it was a mistake of law for the magistrate to have accepted a guilty plea on the basis that ammunition was defined by the Firearm Ordinance Cap 126 that was not included in the definition of explosives under the Explosive Ordinance Cap 124. There is no criminal charge under the Firearms Act Chapter 126 as amended for the possession of ammunition and explosives. Mr. Speaker, the effects of this judgment prevented persons from being charged by the police and being subsequently brought before the court by the Director of Pro Public Prosecution to be prosecuted for the possession of ammunition and explosives. This has hindered police and law enforcement operation. So speaker, in many cases, police officers would find explosives and ammunition and were unable to prefer a charge as a result of the Court of Appeals judgment. The judgment also hindered the progress of matters that were before the court. So the proposed amendment, Mr. Speaker, now ensures that the definition of explosives is on par with the definition of ammunition and explosives as stated in the Firearms Act, Chapter 126, as amended. This will give law enforcement the legislative backing to arrest persons found in possession of explosives and to allow the Director of Public Prosecutions to prefer complaints and indictment for the unlawful possession of explosives. Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, in the territory, there has been a significant increase in gun crime and offenses involving firearms, including murder. And Mr. Speaker, just as recently, we had that senseless act. So Mr. Speaker, it is necessary to have this amendment pass with a matter of urgency. I thank you. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion. Thank you. The bill has been moved and seconded. The floor is now open for debate on the Explosives Amendment Act 2021. I recognize the Deputy Premier and Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries, Agriculture, and member for the 7th District, Dr. The Honorable Natalia D. Wheatley. Mr. Speaker, thank you to, for the opportunity to rise in support of this amendment. Mr. Speaker, I'll be brief. I believe the Minister of Transportation did a good job of explaining the objects and reasons. And as the Deputy Premier and member of the National Security Council, I want to show my full support for this amendment considering <coughs> um, what the Minister of Transportation said about these loopholes being used um, to um, avoid uh, being prosecution um, by persons who have had explosives within their possession. So this amendment will expand the definition and allow those persons to be prosecuted. And we all have to be united, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to response to crime. Um, we cannot uh, be separated in this house and we cannot be separated outside of this house. And we cannot afford to allow the issue of crime to become a political football. We have to be united on it as we have been united on things like financial services. Uh, so I'm completely committed to the task, Mr. Speaker, of having a robust response to crime, to taking the Virgin Islands back and helping to restore it to the Virgin Islands that we 
we once knew. And I think amendments such as these are important in that fight. And I congratulate the Minister of Transportation for bringing this amendment uh, so that we can close this loophole. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Deputy Premier for his contributions. I recognize the representative for the third district and senior member of the House, the Honorable Julian Fraser. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this, this is a point at which you know you have to give up. I used to hear them talking about guns and ammunition. And I was wondering, I used to wonder, well, if I'm in possession of some bullets, what are you charging me with? Because I can't do anything. What am I going to do with a bullet without a gun? So I said, well, everything is covered. If I have a gun, you charge me. If I have the bullets, you charge me. Now I'm hearing something different. Ammunition, explosives. I'm hearing something different. But what are these explosives that you're talking about, Minister? Are these the ammunitions? I, I guarantee you, if, if this is 2021, and you still have a law to pass that will make it possible for the police officers to charge someone who is in possession of a gun and some bullets, then maybe not just that one person should be free, a whole lot of people should be free because something was missing. It's, it's, it's the case. What is it that this individual had that need to be charged under explosives? Is there some new bullet that, that isn't, uh, some new ammunition that doesn't fall under the category of a bullet? Something you're not telling us, Minister. You're asking us to pass a bill that we don't understand. In layman terms, Mr. Speaker, if, it's, if you're talking about peas and rice, there's a pea and a rice. That's what makes peas and rice. Is there something new? A gun and a bullet. What explosives are we talking about now? You see, you see, Mr. Speaker, when us lay people come here to pass these technical bills, we need technocrats with us. And I mean experts in the field to explain to us what is it they're talking about. Maybe there's something else missing. When I, talk, when I hear explosives, Mr. Speaker, I'm thinking about the stuff that you blast the stone with up at, up at, up at the quarry. Not something you would find in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a guy's vehicle who is intent on holding up a store or something like that, or, or, or mugging someone. Explosives. What is the definition of explosives? What kind of uh, weaponry are you talking about? Are these terrorists we're talking about? So, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I find something is lacking. And to sit here uh, uh, today and just say, I, and to sit here and just say, the bill is passed, I'm not too sure the bill isn't going to come back after hearing that some appellate court overruled some decision that was made because we didn't have all the, all the laws necessary to convict the individual. So that's where my confusion lies, Mr. Speaker. And to the point made by the minister regarding, regarding crime in the territory, even if you were Rip Van Winkle, Mr. Speaker, you would know that it's unacceptable the levels of crime in the, in the territory, especially gun crime.
and I'm not hearing enough outrage regarding the topic. Someone put it to me like this one day, Mr. Speaker. They just basically dismiss what is happening by saying to me that that is simply the street cleaning itself up. That I cannot subscribe to, not only from a human standpoint, but from the standpoint of a legislator. We have serious responsibilities, and the legal reform that we're going to need to clean this place up, Mr. Speaker, is far more than the, 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 the little amendment that the minister brought before us today. I expected to see a slew of amendments regarding our, our criminal aspects, aspects of the law is concerned to address what's taking place in the territory. So by no stretch of the imagination should anyone believe that this is going to make a difference to what is exactly happening right now. Yes, it will make a difference in the overall crime scene. But as far as someone being in a vehicle at, at Fish Bay and getting smoked, this isn't going to change that, Mr. Speaker. Or any one of those incidents that took place, whether down in, in, in Hannah's or up in Parakeeta Bay, this isn't going to change that. What we need, Mr. Speaker, is comprehensive policing. I don't want to hear a police officer making complaints that the evidence that they need to gather, such as DNA, they can't do it because our legislation is silent on it. You know, those are the kind of conversations that all, all, all national security needs to get down to discussing and transferring it into our legal or our laws. When I look at television, Mr. Speaker, this is my only exposure to crime and criminality when I look at TV. And I see law enforcement trying to get the DNA of an individual by baiting them into drinking from a cup and somehow capturing that cup after the individual leaves and using that, that DNA he left on that cup to use to determine whether that individual is the one who committed a crime. I was of the view that that, that could be done right here in the BVI, Mr. Speaker. But that's not what I'm hearing. I'm hearing that you got to beg an individual who literally refused Yeah, of course, if I, if I ask you to give me a, a sample and you say no, that's your right. You don't have to give it to me. But if I can get the sample by whatever means, without force, I should be able to use that sample. But I'm hearing that they can't do that. So, so our, our, our system, Mr. Speaker, is not being supported as it should by the laws. And, and I am a guy on the street. I am not a guy in national security who can... Who can investigate and get the kind of information that is necessary in order to bolster our legislation. But I do know that our legislation needs work. In order for the police to be effective in gathering evidence. So, yes, I must applaud the minister for bringing forward what he has. But there's a lot more that we need to do as far as our laws are concerned to allow the police to be able to be effective in doing their job. When are we going to get this? People are being paid good money 
in order to, in order to bring these things forward before us, the legislators. They're being paid good money for it. We wouldn't know to ask about these things. As far as I am concerned, Mr. Speaker, this legislature is 70 years old, and as far as I am concerned, Mr. Speaker, we have everything. We've done everything, only to learn day after day that this is lacking. We should be doing that. We should be doing the other. We are to stop burying our heads in the sand and believing that the system is taking care of itself. It's not. It's not taking care of itself. I don't stand in a courthouse and listen to the deliberations and learn of the flaws and all the different inadequacies and what have you. I don't be there. But those who are there need to come back and let us know in one way, shape, or form. If there is a piece of legislation sitting in some minister's office, if there's a piece of legislation sitting in the Attorney General's office that the law enforcement needs in order to be effective, let us know, however you do it. I have an information drop in Seacoast Bay by a speed bump. You could always drop it off there. One thing I promise you is that it will make its way here and in the public domain, and you will remain anonymous. No, 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 this, this, we, we're in this thing together. We can't, one of us cannot get out unless all of us come out. Every time there's a crime in the territory, you see crocodile tears falling down people's face. And then they walk away like, well, it didn't happen to me. So I forgot what happened. Meanwhile, the grieving souls are still there. I am, I am and always has been a number one advocate for the police and policing in this territory. I always say, if the police needs vehicles, they shall have it. If the police need manpower, they shall have it. Sometime I, I heard of a, a grueling statistic about the police department. They asked me if I know how many police officers are on duty in the evening for patrol purposes. And when they tell me it's three, and you start thinking about it, you say, you know, it's true, because you're talking about three shifts, and it, of, course, of course in the daytime you'll, it'll be heavier, but three shifts, three men, three threes are, twi three, three threes are nine, that's one day, that's nine, and what's the size of the police force? It isn't much, considering the fact that people have to go on vacation, people get sick, and there are other things that they have to do besides patrol the streets. If you want to keep crime at a minimum, the only way to do it is through proper policing and staffing the police. So in order to get proper policing, you must staff the police department. And I can't stop saying it because it bothers me. $440 million budget. $414 million budget, and still, Mr. Speaker, still, you find money for the pandemic, but you can't find money to curb crime. You get more people getting killed. You get more people in the Virgin Islands getting killed at the hand of a, of, a, of a handgun than you're getting killed from the pandemic. And how much money we spend on the pandemic? $40 million plus. How much money you spend on, on, the, on the curbing of crime? Not 40000 self. Ah. 
I was going to say something, but it hurts. It hurts. I, I think that what we have done in the Virgin Islands, we have done it effectively. Like, like the, the easiest and best way to sweep crime under the rug is to put it in the hands of people who are least likely to make up waves. Least likely to make waves. Well, we're getting better now. We got a local attorney general, she's gonna make waves. Can't shut her up, she's gonna talk. You got I I would be I would be the number one person to tell you that when when they brought when they brought a police commissioner from the UK, I didn't have a problem with it. You know why? I said, this guy, he don't have any friends, he don't have any family here. So if you commit a crime, he's coming for you. Man, was I wrong. Was I wrong? He is, a, he is as afraid of, of the people as, as, as the, the, the local guy afraid to arrest his, his brother or sister. No, don't come arrest me, you know, because I said that. Don't come for me now because I say that. But it's true. When it comes to criminal and criminal activities and whatever you're talking about, Mr. Speaker, there shall be no friends and family involved. So I am asking those of you who are involved in the, the, the criminal justice and all the rest of it, whatever law it is that we need to pass, tell whoever needs to know about it. The Minister for Communications and Works, uh, Works and, and Utilities is not an expert in, cri in criminality. He wouldn't know about the need for this piece of legislation. Someone had to tell him. And of course, he willingly brought it before us. And we're going to pass it. The same way we pass financial services bill on a bipartisan basis, we're going to pass this on a bipartisan basis because it's good for the country. And if it's good for the country, we're in it together. And whatever other such pieces of legislation that needs to come forward, let us know. And if some minister is holding it up in his office, like I said before, let us know where it is. Same goes for issues at the prison. I can't get into the fight that I see brewing regarding assent to bills. I can't get into that. We do our part when we pass them here. Wait, what happens to it after it leaves this, this hollowed walls? Um, is something else that, that I leave to the powers that be. But Mr. Speaker, I, I think that I couldn't help but voice my opinion on, on, on this particular matter and ask a question again. What has changed? What, what, what new piece of ammunition has been developed over the last few years that this piece of legislation and just, just, just now come into this house? And the bullets were always there, the gun was always there. Whether you, if the gun is an AK-47 or 38 or, or, or 45, they were always there. The bullet was a 22 caliber or, or whatever. They were always there. But now we're talking about explosives. But be that as it may, Mr. Speaker, I would lend my support to the piece of, a piece of legislation and encourage others to bring forward any more legislation that's necessary in order to make our law enforcement more effective than it really is right now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
I thank the member for the third district for his contributions. Floor remains open. I recognize the deputy speaker and territorial member, the Honorable Neville A. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, just give a short contribution. Listening to the member the second, I, I think I understand where he's going at. And third, and I sort of support him of what he's saying. Because, see, Mr. Speaker, these gun crimes are very serious. And there's a saying, it's not a gun that is going to kill you, but the person has to pull that trigger to kill you. But, but Mr. Speaker, we have to be serious when it comes to these gun crimes. Though. And I really feel that we need to make a stiffer, stiffer, real stiff fine when it comes to these guns. We have to be sure that people that we, we're not gonna sit here and accept this kind of behavior. These guns get in here somehow, some way they get in here. But we have to find where they're coming from. But we have to make it so, so stiff that you think twice before you think about bringing a gun in the Virgin Islands. And I think that would help a lot. Because if we don't do something about this, we're not going to feel it when it reach close to home, Mr. Speaker. When we hear another person get shot, we just say, oh, God, sorry to hear that. But it's not home. But the individual who have to deal with that loss, I can't tell you how they feel. I was not there. I'm not one who lost the person. So I support this bill, but I think we need to go deeper into this, this bill and make it, make it a mandatory that when somebody's caught with a gun, you go in prison, not even a fine. You have to make it a, a, a serious deterrent, Mr. Speaker. Because some people may say, hey, look, I'm going to pay a fine. Two years in jail ain't nothing. I got solve two years in jail. We have to make it stiffer, Mr. Speaker. That's the only way we can control the gun crime here in the Virgin Islands. And especially if you catch people smuggling guns in here to sell. Even worse, Mr. Speaker. But I, I also state that like I said, a gun cannot pull a trigger by itself. An individual has to pull that trigger with that gun. So that person has to be held responsible for holding that gun in our ways, in our manner. So Mr. Speaker, I support this bill and I, I, I feel that I say we need to find and put stiffer penalties when it comes to gun crime. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Deputy Speaker for his contribution. Is there any other member wishing to speak before the sponsor of the bill wraps up? I recognize the Minister for Health and Social Development and Territorial Member, the Honorable Corbin Malone. Okay, your, your mic probably not working. Thank you very much for affording me the opportunity to make a few remarks as it relates to this very important bill. The, uh, the whole concept of taking a bite out of crime is not just a um, television fad, but it is real because um, there are always these unmeasurable, seemingly unmeasurable acts, like we will go around and, and talk about a healthy environment, a clean environment, one in which you take proper care of your um, solid waste, your wastewater, and uh, all that have you. But the fact is, is that um, although this bill goes into other aspects of it, because when you look at the, at the objects and reasons for this, it goes into other areas, but you, you, you cannot lend but support the fact that none of us 
could be safe unless all of us could be safe. So the honorable member for the third is correct that the resources required to fight this must be put in hand and it must be administered by fearless people. That is, a, that is yet to be seen where the fearless concept come in because, you know, even in, uh, because we, we often speak of laws on the books but no one to carry them out. And it is only, he calls it crocodile tears, but the fact is, is that, um, you know, the, I often say we have the Willoughby in the, in the um, plain fields and jungle mentality because you'll have a lion or the predators lurking around and they will scope out the weakest. And when they catch them and have them captured, all the others stop from running and graze around the very attack. It used to be a time, probably um, um, transitional enough, so to like the member of the third, to know when a death was big news and a murder was astounding. You hear it now, you see it now, and uh, there, there's some alarm, some alarm, and it's oft based on probably the popularity of the person. If they're well known, there's a, there are a few more hours added to the alarm. Not well known, maybe not even a blip on the scale. But we must do this, and the bill to talk about. Um, to effect necessary amendments also to the financial, you know, it, it goes into different areas. So we, we're taking it in an area that is, that, that um, would affect not only the financial parts of it, but in terms of lives. We speak of lives and livelihoods. The beauty of life sits all around us. When we can go out the house, remember that you didn't lock the door, and fear not, because no one is going to intrude. The beauty of life is surrounded by going to an event, no matter what it is, and not fearing that you would not make it back, or your child, your offspring, your sibling, other people not making it back home. So whatever is required in order to effect this is what is important. So yes, the bill ranges into different areas, contemplates different um, arenas, but it cannot go unnoticed and we might not get another chance to say that none of us could be safe unless all of us are safe. I heard myself repeating that to authorities in uh, Bermuda when we spoke on the radio, to Antigua when we spoke on the radio, as it relates to the virus. We have to deal with it all. And as I'm saying, I don't know if we can compare the two and maybe we should, in terms of resources necessary to combat it all. Both of them will take your economy out. So both of them deserve the attention required in order to keep us safe so that lives and livelihoods could both be protected. Thank you. I thank the Minister of Health and Social Development for his contribution. I recognize the Junior Minister for Trade and Economic Development and Territorial Member, the Honorable Shireen D. Flax Charles. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Speaker. I, too, rise in support of this bill. Gun crimes are something that 
none of us want to talk about, none of us want to experience. To be honest, Mr. Speaker, the sight of a gun does not make me feel very comfortable. I know when I travel, I, you know, you will come across a policeman and just the sight of that gun makes me tremble. Um, years ago when I was, um, I started to build my house, Mr. Speaker, I engaged the services of a young man from here in Tortola that's a contractor and architect. And we argued about the type of windows that I would put on this house. And of course, being a woman, I was all about the look. And he said to me, I would not advise you to get those type of windows because in the next couple of years, we are going to have problems in the BVI with crime. And I said to him, I, I, I want to be positive. So of course I chose windows. We battled back and forth and I finally gave in to him because he was the one with the expertise, Mr. Speaker. I never would dream of a BVI where we would no longer be able to take our trip away and leave our doors unlocked. I can recall one night when I had a gig at Little Dix Bay and there were two persons at the bar when we were on break, Mr. Speaker, and the gentleman was so on edge, and I said to him, what is the problem, you're on vacation? He said, I haven't slept for two nights. I said, well, why are you not sleeping, Mr. S uh, Mr. Speaker? I said to the gentleman. He was a police officer from Philadelphia, and he just could not wrap his mind, Mr. Speaker, around the fact that there were no keys for the hotel rooms. And, and so that, Mr. Speaker, for me now, with the spate of crime that we have had in the BVI over the last year or two, speaks volumes to how things can quickly turn around. I remember, Mr. Speaker, going to high school in St. Croix, and one of the families that we stayed with the gentleman, every night, he would sit at the dining room table. And my sister and I would have to pass that table to go to the bathroom. He would sit there, Mr. Speaker, every night with two guns on the table because crime was rampant. And as young nine and 10-year-old girls, we were terrified. And, and so for us to not do anything, to sit back and not do anything about crime in the BVI, it would be unconscionable. We see every day, I, I am a CNN lover, but Mr. Speaker, I sometimes hate to watch the news because you see, Every other day, I think so far this year in the United States, there have been about 53 uh, mass shootings. And it grieves my heart. And every life is important. But when you have gun crimes where there are mass shootings in schools, Mr. Speaker, it, 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 it just tears your heart apart. And, and so I am a firm believer in in gun control, I am also a firm believer that we have to enforce our laws here in the BVI, and I, I thank the Honorable um, Fraser, who is one of the more experienced uh, members of this Honorable House, for bringing a lot of the points that he did across. We cannot, we will not continue down this path of destruction and Mr. Speaker, 
a, a lot of things need to come into play. Yes, the police need to be more on top of their game. But as parents, we need to be more on top of our game. As, as citizens in this community, we need to be on, more on top of our game. We need to ensure that our children are able to engage in activities that are positive. And we, we need to be able, Mr. Speaker, to, to propel them in the right direction. And I will tell you, Mr. Speaker, I firmly believe that we can turn the lives of so many of these young men around if we but pay them a little bit of attention, Mr. Speaker. And they may not be able to get that attention at home for whatever reason, but we as a community need to make that extra special effort to pull our young men and now our young women. We have ignored our young women for a long time. And they too end up in problems. I was sent a video, Mr. Speaker, yesterday with seven grade girls in a fight at the high school in Virgin Gorda. It was sad to see that happening. Those things lead to other things, Mr. Speaker. So we as a territory, as a community, we have to take a grip of our communities and be each other's keepers. And as a village, we need to all raise our children. And if you see someone falling by the wayside, help them out. Don't say, I wish you luck with that person. You, I have heard that many times with um, young persons that I would mentor or take under my wing. And to hear persons say, I wish you luck. You wouldn't get that one turn around. It's not a very comfortable situation, but we will persevere. We have groups such as male that work with a lot of young men and women, and we must support these groups, Mr. Speaker. And with those few words, Mr. Speaker, I again want to put all of my weight and support behind of this piece of legislation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Honorable Flax Strauss for her contributions to the debate. Is there any other member wishing to speak on the Explosives Amendment Act 2021? I recognize the member for the second district, the Honorable Melvin M. Turnbull. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I promise not to be too long. Um, it is a relatively short bill and short amendment to the substantive bill. Um, and Mr. Speaker, when you sometimes listen and reflect to the elder members of the house, you, you get a, sometimes a better perspective, a different perspective in terms of what is before us and the wider reaching implications of what we are doing or what we haven't done, and even if we are doing something, Mr. Speaker, it helps to broaden the thought process of what else we can do. Mr. Speaker, this legislation is, is straightforward. The minister who introduced the bill um, spoke to the parameters of the bill as it relates to what is being included in explosive to help uh, curve some of the loopholes that currently exist 
with ammunition and cartridges, and I won't um, reiterate all that he said, Mr. Speaker. And listening to the member for the third who sits on my right, um, something that was said that jumped out to me because I was reflecting, Mr. Speaker, in May 11th of 2011. Um, it started out from the end of 2010. Um, there was an increase. There began to be an increase in crime in this territory specific to young people. Um, specific to young persons that some of which should have been in school. They were school-aged children, males and females. And I remember becoming restless week after week, day after day, because every other day, I think at that time, only one of the news sites at that time used to post an arrest blotter. And you would see a minor, because you couldn't publish their names. And you would see charges of burglary, and you would see different charges for gun crimes. And Mr. Speaker, it, it got me to a point where besides the youth mentorship program that I was doing with Project Lionheart that partnered with the Virgin Islands Youth Court System and the Ministry of Health through Social Development and the Ministry of Education, it got me to thinking that besides getting the opportunity to speak with them while I was the youth assessor at the youth court, something else needed to be done, Mr. Speaker, because while I would train and try to teach and mentor six to eight of them at a time, I believe if I'm recalling the numbers correctly, on average of a youth court sitting, there will be between 16 and 25 cases per youth court sitting. And it continued to pull on me, Mr. Speaker, to awakening, awaken something inside of me that, Mitch, you have to do something. And I reflected, Mr. Speaker, in 2011 when I pushed and partnered with the government for funding to put on the Youth Rally of 2011. And we brought in two more divisional speakers from the United States who had criminal backgrounds who had gun-related, drug-related backgrounds. And we brought in two artists, one a local one and one from the Bahamas, to speak to the young people on a larger scale. I believe, as a speaker, it was around 15 hundred young people that we were able to put in the cultural center, the Sir Rupert Briarcliff Hall. And as the, the photo came up last week, Mr. Speaker, 
I remember realizing the magnitude of what I was trying to accomplish. Uh, myself, another young man by the name of Ralston Williams, uh, my brother, who is now Dr. Michael Turnbull, um, and some partners who, who joined with us, Mr. Speaker. And I remember from that program, Lion Hart and some others kicked off even more to try to rehabilitate and train and get involved. Mail was then started. Point one was started. Um, Follow the movement was, was, was then launched and started. And Mr. Speaker, in the last recent months, from last year coming forward to this year, the same feeling of something has to be done keeps me awake at night. And as a speaker, perspective is important because I understand that hurting people hurt people. And I understand that there is cause and effect to everything that happens in life. I am a, a movie fanatic, Mr. Speaker, but I watch movies that I can get a message from the same as music. And I remember a movie called Money Talks, starring Chris Tucker. And the saying said, guns don't kill people. Stupid people with guns kill people, in my words. Mr. Speaker, the criminal element of our society is seemingly becoming more attractive. It is one that is a road that seems easy because I am thinking about getting money, getting money, and getting more money with no thought on what the consequences of my actions would be. This is because I will never wish death on anyone. Because as Biggie Small says, there's no coming back from death. And while I stand here and we stand here as legislators in this honorable house, Mr. Speaker, crime and gun crime and violence has been something that has been existent in this territory for a long time. But in the recent months, Mr. Speaker, we have seen a surge that blows the different spurts of crime that we would have completely out the water. And it is not accepted, nor will it be accepted as the norm in this BVI that I call home. Mr. Speaker, I believe in addition to this piece of legislation, the ministers, those of us that sit and represent the people, Mr. Speaker, we should be coming together and finding ways, consulting with the Attorney General, with the police, with the DPP, with the whomever, Mr. Speaker, to understand what else can be done. Not just in legislature, Mr. Speaker, but the public outreach. Because even though 
these gun crimes have been happening, even though these murders, Mr. Speaker, have been happening. And we mourn the loss and pay and give condolences to the families of those who have lost loved ones. The sad reality is, Mr. Speaker, these persons that committed the crime still continue to live. And the families of the victims, Mr. Speaker, are expected to move on with their life. So, Mr. Speaker, what is the balance? What is, how do we bring it together to ensure that we are using every preventative measure possible, outreach to young persons, even to adults, the mental health, Mr. Speaker, of our society is something that we must take into consideration. Mr. Speaker, there's real stress in this territory. People don't just do things for the sake of doing them. Things just don't happen. They are caused. And we have to take a broader approach. Because yes, we can write the laws, but the writing of the laws have to go in partnership and in tandem with the outreach programs, with understanding what the social ills are and the social issues are, with understanding what the deficiencies within the police force are. And Mr. Speaker, while we look at the law and those elements, and the police and the judicial system and not even us here in the legislation, in the legislature, Mr. Speaker, we have some criminal aspects within these entities that needs to be addressed. Because if, if, if I'm a young person, I'm supposed to be looking up to you and I see you doing stupidness, what gonna stop me from doing stupidness, Mr. Speaker? Nonsense, Mr. Speaker, stupidness is probably not acceptable. If I see you doing things that are contrary to the law and you seemingly are getting away with them, what is going to prohibit me? What is going to stop me from doing the same thing? in my own way. So Mr. Speaker, there must be something that we do. I used to visit the, the, the public schools, especially the high schools, very regularly and try to talk to the young men and young women just about life. A very uncensored approach because the young people in this territory, Mr. Speaker, are living life. Some of them are living through hell every day. So when you see them act out sometimes, it's just the circumstances, as Bujabandan said, that make them what they are and what they react and how they react. Mr. Speaker, we have to address these ills. We also have to be careful, Mr. Speaker, of some of the things that we allow and even some of the laws that we approve. Because while we might see benefits, as we might say, economic benefits to the overall bottom line of the government, Mr. Speaker, some of these very laws that we pass would help to aid in the continued social ills that exist. Mr. Speaker, I want in addition to supporting this piece of legislation for the Minister of Transportation, Works and Utilities. 
because I know he, he deals with exposes. I've learned that um, when our church tried to do some fireworks um, for a old year's new year celebration. But Mr. Speaker, every facet that deals with gun crime and curbing and addressing head on this criminal aspect of violence, the illegal activities that we have continued to push aside because it may not have reached our very doorstep, Mr. Speaker. I believe if each of us are honest, we would know that there's been enough murder, there's been enough crime, there's been enough activity, Mr. Speaker, in this territory within the last six to eight months that it has reached and knocked on each and every one of our doors that we must pay attention to it. And we must do something to not try, Mr. Speaker, but we must do something to address it. So, Mr. Speaker, I again stand to give my support to this legislation, but I furthermore stand, Mr. Speaker, to move towards action points and action steps that would curb the activities of the underworld that seems to want to make crime and criminality the norm in this territory. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for the second district for his contributions to the debate. With no other member, I recognize the leader of the opposition and member for the eighth district, the Honorable Marlon A. Penn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I promise to be brief, but it would have been remiss of me to not lend my voice and support to this very brief but important amendment that is before us this evening, the Explosive Amendment Act 2021. Mr. Speaker, while the bill has a specific intent to add certain provisions or make certain explosive cartridges, pellets, part of the substantial bill. I think this bill or this small amendment sparks a bigger conversation, a conversation that we've been asking to have, a conversation that we need to have, a conversation that we cannot no longer ignore is that issue of crime, not just crime on the level of robberies and so forth, but serious crime, the issue of serious gun crime that seems to be a plague in our territory over the, the past many months. Mr. Speaker, this is not a new issue, as the member for the second so rightfully alluded to. Mr. Speaker, I remember back in the last administration, we came to this Honorable House to deal with the issue of gun crimes and really put what we thought at the time stiff penalties to deter the issue of gun crimes and the, and the handling of guns in this community in our territory. So I don't believe, Mr. Speaker, that the issue is one of inadequate laws or not stiff enough penalty. I believe the challenge that we had back then is that we, we tried to do what we call minimum mandatory sentences, and we had pushed back at the time from the drafters um, in terms of the, our ability to do so in enforcing minimum man, man, mandatory sentences. I think it's a conversation we need to look at this time. And I don't think it's an issue of the DPP's office or the magistrate's office and those persons who are willing to do what it, it, it takes to really ensure that persons who are caught with illegal weapons 
person who commit crimes with illegal, illegal weapons are given the full extent that the law can bear um, within reason. And I, and I believe that we have to seriously sit down. And I didn't get to hear all the contributions by members, but seriously sit down and have that conversation about crime in our territory. We cannot get to solutions, Mr. Speaker, unless we have the conversation. They're the arms of the NSC who have their responsibility, commissioner of police who have their responsibility, who are part of that, that, that particular um, construct of NSC, premier, deputy premier. But Mr. Speaker, all of us, and I said this when we were in the House and we made our, our, our comments on the most recent murder that we had in the territory, all of us, Mr. Speaker, every last member in this honorable house have a responsibility, not just the, the institutions who are elected, but to have that conversation and come forward with solutions to address the crime that affects the people that we represent. Mr. Speaker, oftentimes we get up when something happens and we're outraged. For the moment we're outraged and we, 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 we're angry and we we hear the sentiments and we send the sentiments out. But when a few months pass and the person is buried, we've gone back to business as usual. Or days, like how he so rightfully said. And the issue still exists. If you get a cut and you don't treat it, and you, and you walk in, in infested areas, you're going to get infection. And if you don't treat that infection, you might have to cut off the toe. If you refuse to cut off the toe, you might reach your ankle. If you refuse to cut off your ankle, you might reach your knees. And if you don't deal with it at that point, it gets to your internal organs. And at, and, and, at, and at that point, there's no help or nothing anyone could do for you. Mr. So Speaker, I don't know at which point the infection is at this time for us as a territory. Let's hope it's only by the toe. Depends on which toe we could, we could survive and live and walk and do all the things we need to do. But we need to act with a sense of urgency. We asked in this house, I asked in this house, that we have that conversation on crime, our 13 members. I'm asking again the Premier and his government, let us as members of this honorable house, let us as the leaders of this territory, the leaders of the people of this territory to have that conversation. Let us hold whomever is responsible accountable. Let us have a plan to get back to where we were as it relates to community policing. Let us get back to building the confidence of the populace in our police force. Too often you're hearing persons saying, I am not going to speak up because I'm fearful for my life. There's no integrity in the process. There's no integrity in the force. We have to dispel those notions. And if, if there are indeed persons who are creating that perception about the police force and the integrity of our law enforcement in this country, not just the police, customs, immigration, all aspects of law enforcement, we need to root that out. We need to deal with it and address it. Address that issue head on. Because if we do not address this issue, the infection is going to reach to our knees. And from there on in, God see for us. We have an opportunity to really sit down and deal with this issue, Mr. Speaker. I urge all of my honorable colleagues, let us insist on that conversation. Let us set, chart the way, hold the persons responsible, accountable, it's not an issue of laws. We have laws. Um, and, and we were here, we spent days on that particular Explosive Act and the Gun Crime Act to try to get the right medium. And we debated, we argued with the Attorney General at the time to make sure that we want to get the most stiffest penalty possible to ensure that persons who are caught with illegal weapons and gun crime, uh, they're detoured. But if we need to look at it again, we need to do that. If, if, if the persons believe that the, the penalties are not stiff enough, and we have the opportunity with the bill here before us. 
Let's have that conversation. We could go back and amend anything that we need to amend, but we need to have that conversation. Again, Mr. Speaker, I support this bill. I support its intent, but I think we need to go deeper on this issue of crime. And as a, as a house, as the leaders of this territory, we have a responsibility also, as well as the principals who are charged directly with the responsibility of crime, to do our part. Speaker, I thank you. I thank the leader of the opposition for his contribution. With no other member indicated their wish to speak, I invite the move of the motion, the Minister for Transportation, to wrap up the debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I thank all members for their contribution. Uh, we definitely seem to be unanimous with this short amendment pertaining to explosive, uh, the Explosive Act. Mr. Speaker, I have and this government, we have spoken about crime in this house, publicly and radio, wherever we bemoan the fact that we are in this state where crime is now rampant within our, within our society. And Mr. Speaker, the, this bill gives now a bit more room for the DPP to be able to carry out her task. Mr. Speaker, one member asks what, what new has developed from explosives or ammunition? Mr. Speaker, the bill tells you that it is simply just to expand the definition to include articles consisting of a cartridge case, blank cartridges, or training cartridges. Mr. Speaker, this is the direction we are going uh, with this amendment today. And, and the reason is because, Mr. Speaker, we have found where the police did, in fact, did do their work. And, and I mentioned earlier where they spoke about the, where the High Court, the Court of Appeal ruled that in Selvin Shinnery versus the Commissioner of Police, it would rule that it was a mistake of law for the magistrate to have accepted a guilty plea on the basis that ammunition as defined by the Firearms Ordinance, Chapter 126. Mr. Speaker, there is no criminal charge under the Firearms Act for the possession of ammunition or explosives. So Mr. Speaker, this is the, the premise of this bill. And we understand that crime is not new to our territory, as members have spoken of. We've spoken about uh, more parenting and, and more policing. Members spoke about a comprehensive policing strategy, community policing, and various needs of enforcement, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have given previous government, this government we have given to the police force. I remember, it, I think it was a past administration where I think it was about a half a million dollars was given to the police. The, uh, the, the governor utilized his powers under Section 81 of the Constitution because he felt that they needed further assistance and that was, that was given to the police. Mr. Speaker, I know this government we have given as they have asked. Well, Mr. Speaker, we are missing one point as well with, with this amendment. The police, they go, they arrest, but nothing goes forward without the DPP. Mr. Speaker, and that's, that's the reason we are here. This is a bill. It gives the DPP the, the ability to charge based on the, the expanding of, of explosives. The DPP, I know um, the, the leader of the opposition mentioned his, his administration passing the laws and making it a bit more uh, stiff. I know for a summary conviction for a gun, I think it's, up to, it's seven years. 
and summary conviction. I mean, ind an indictable offense is up to 20 years. So the books, there are, there are the laws on the books. And Mr. Speaker, we are here to, to add to that. The Constitution also gives the, the DPP a whole lot of power in terms of her ability. And Mr. Speaker, I, me I heard the, the member for the third mention that yes, we have a local DPP, but I mean, a Attorney General, but our DPP is also a local person. And I, I think as we speak about crime and, and so forth, we also need to, to offer some sort of protection as well for our, our local, whether DPP AG, because especially the DPP, go, she go out and prosecute. And Mr. Speaker, these are persons that live within the community and we must offer them as much protection as possible. And Mr. Speaker, we understand that they work hand in hand with the police and the reason for this, this bill, like I mentioned, is just to give the DPP and the prosecutor more teeth in terms of when these crimes have taken place and, and it's time for prosecuting the offenders. So Mr. Speaker, we had a robust debate. We're now going to committee, com committee stage where we'll go through the short amendment and amend this explosive amendment. Mr. Speaker, I, I thank you for the opportunity and I thank all members for their contribution this afternoon. Thank you. I thank the minister for wrapping up the debate. It has been moved and seconded that the bill shortly entitled Explosives Amendment Act 2021 be now read a second time. Those in favor, those against, the ayes have it. I therefore call upon the clerk to read the bill for a second time. <clears throat> this act may be cited as the Explosives Amendment Act 2021. Pursuant to Standing Order 55-1 of the House of Assembly of the Virgin Islands, the bill now stands committed to a committee of the whole House to consider clause by clause. This Honorable House is now in committee.
resume its sitting. Honorable members have deliberated for quite some time on the Explosive Amendment Act 2021. We have also had witnesses who explain and answer members' question. I therefore call on the mover of the motion, the Minister for Transportation, to report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, sir, I beg to report that the bill entitled Explosive Act Amendment, Explosive Amendment Act 2021 has passed through committee without amendments. Mr. Speaker, sir, I move that the bill entitled Explosive Amendment Act 2021 be read a third time and passed as amended and passed. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second a motion. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded that the bill entitled Explosives Amendment Act 2021 be now read a third time and pass. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. The motion is passed. Therefore, I call upon the clerk to read the bill for a third time. This act may be cited as the Explosives Amendment Act 2021. The bill has been read a third time and passed without amendments. Before I call on the other minister to introduce the Contractor General Act 2021, I'm going to invite the Honorable Minister for Health and Social Development and Territorial Member, the Honorable Carvin Malone, to give us a statement. Mr. Speaker, for giving me an opportunity to make a statement. I extend greetings to all in the BVI, the region, the Caribbean region, and the world. Mr. Speaker, the last update on the COVID-19 situation was issued on 5th May 2021. As of today, 13th May 2021, 32,057 tests were conducted on individuals swabbed throughout the territory and evaluated at the Dr. D. Orlando Smith Hospital. Mr. Speaker, an additional 29 persons were deemed positive since the last report period and brings to the total confirmed positive to 248. While 209 persons have recovered, there currently exist 38 active cases, a net increase of 13 since the last report period, and one untimely death. Of the 38 cases, Mr. Speaker, 22 were detected on entry screening, eight were detected on day four screening, four were detected at screening for travel requirements, one was at the screening of a crew member, and three were classified as local cases within the, ter within the community. Mr. Speaker, while all 38 cases were deemed asymptomatic, we can report that 10 of the cases are being quarantined on vessels, one on Anagada, 25 on Tortola, and two on Virgin Gorda. Mr. Speaker, robust and coordinated track and trace exercises are being conducted as a result of the three local and four travel cases in an attempt to limit the spread of the virus throughout the community. Clearly, Mr. Speaker, as stated over and over again, we are not out of the woods. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to accelerate, and we are deeply saddened by its rising debt toll as health systems and economies far and near buckle under the strain of second and third waves of infection. 
while we continue a phased reopening of the BVI to international travelers, we must be mindful and cognizant of the realities in the region and around the world. Reports are coming in from all through the region and all through the world. Mr. Speaker, we cannot be paralyzed by fear, but at the same time, we must take note of what the realities and real possibilities are when COVID-19 is able to get past the step gaps, especially where the risk of these gaps can be minimized by preventative actions and cautions. As previously reported, the 34,000 doses of vaccine donated by the, to the British Virgin Islands by the United Kingdom and Dominica will allow for a total of 17,000 persons to receive two doses of vaccines each. To date, 11,036 persons have received their first dose, while 3,765 have received their second doses. On Tortola, 9,255 first doses and 3,082 second doses were administered. On Virgin Gorda, 1,583 first doses and 609 second were administered, while on Jocelyn Dyke, 98 first doses and 50 second doses were administered. And finally, on Anagara, 100 first doses and 24 second were administered. Mr. Speaker, I was deliberate in my presentation to provide details of each reporting island within the territory. Mr. Speaker, all residents and stakeholders must be serious about the unrestricted reopening of the territory while protecting lives and livelihoods. A select few of our citizens are becoming grossly uncivil and repugnant in their attempt to convince others not to voluntarily take any vaccines offered in the territory. Mr. Speaker, without apology, it is the government's intention to, uh, to intensify the educational or the education process aimed at encouraging the remaining 5,964 persons to voluntarily be vaccinated at any of the public and private centers throughout the territory by 31st May 2021. Following this date, an assessment will be made in relation to the remaining doses, of which I hope there will be none. For the next 18 days, all hands and voices would be required to assist in our ambitious goal. Our approach will continue to anger some anti-vaxxers and overnight radio show medical experts, but it is our duty to be steadfast in purpose in this regard. We are not out of the woods. Again, to be absolutely clear, the Virgin Islands government will not be requiring mandatory vaccination to its residents. The choice is yours to freely make. Public and private enterprises must, however, be reasonably expected to introduce and implement protocol measures to protect owners, to protect staff, and to protect patrons of their businesses. Nation by nation, island by island, home by home, the reality of the effects of the COVID-19 virus is a matter of record. For those with ears to hear, let them hear, and for those with eyes, let them see. Mr. Speaker, it is worth repeating that the emergency operating the Emergency Operations Center, ATOC, the public health teams, continue to monitor the situation as it unfolds and propose strategies to help mitigate the impact of the pandemic on our territory. At a meeting held on Wednesday, the 5th of May, Cabinet considered a report from the ATOC, mainly addressing recent changes to the entry requirement for vaccinated and unvaccinated travelers. I'm pleased to again provide an update on decisions taken by the cabinet regarding the non-domestic travel re um, requirements in view of the ongoing COVID-19 response. As previously announced, 
effective May 15, 2021, travelers who have been fully vaccinated with the final dose administered at least 14 days before travel will be immediately released from quarantine once their arrival test is negative. Revisions of the entry portal is a work in progress and as such, interim measures must be taken to avoid delaying this much anticipated initiative. It is highly likely that travelers will encounter some processing issues, but must be prepared to be patient and understanding. Safety, Mr. Speaker, is a priority. Mr. Speaker, the public health teams and HEOC has advised that the May 15th initiative would not apply to person traveling from or through Brazil or India. Cabinet, as a result, has decided to amend the list of restricted countries under the Immigration and Passport Prohibition of Entry Order 2021 to apply only to Brazil and India. Person traveling from these two countries must be granted permission to enter the Virgin Islands, but will be required to quarantine for a period of 14 days on arrival. Fully vaccinated travelers from all other countries will require the BVI Gateway Traveler Authorization Certificate at a cost of $105, which is, which is reduced to $175. Proof of a negative RT-PCR COVID-19 test taken three to five days before arrival, proof of vaccination status, and RT-PCR COVID-19 testing will, upon arrival, and quarantine until the return of a negative test result. Where fully vaccinated persons are traveling with one or more unvaccinated child, this is children ages five to 17, will be tested on arrival. Children will be released from quarantine together with their parents once the test results for the entire group are negative, but must remain within their family bubble, say at restaurants or other venues within the territory. And finally, unvaccinated children will be required to return to a testing center and be subjected to a further test on day four. Further to that, Mr. Speaker, Cabinet decided that a fully vaccinated traveler may be approved for home quarantine in a residence where all the adult occupants are fully vaccinated once the traveler or the traveling party is provided with a separate bedroom. We now turn, our, we now turn, we would, we turn now to the concessions that have been made for fully vaccinated persons who have been present in the Virgin Islands for more than 14 consecutive days and wish to travel to the United States Virgin Islands, St. Martin, or Puerto Rico for a period now longer than 24 hours. As previously mentioned, with effect on the 15th of May 2021, outgoing day trippers to these neighboring jurisdictions will be exempt from quarantine and the COVID-19 test upon re-entering the BVI, but would be required to take a PCR test seven days after returning to the territory. This measure is also applicable to children ages five to 17 who are traveling with their parents. At a meeting held on the 5th of May, 2021, cabinet further decided that a, a person seeking to be certified as a day tripper should apply for re-entry through the gateway prior to departure from the Virgin Islands. B, that the gateway fee will be reduced to $70 to cover the cost of the test on day number seven. C, that day trippers will be allowed to travel with children under five years old and children five to 17 as otherwise provided. And D, refusal by a returning day tripper to undergo day seven testing would attract a fixed penalty of $5,000 or a court penalty of $10,000 on summary conviction. Mr. Speaker, after carefully considering 
both the wish to reopen the territory to tourism and the need to mitigate the risk arising from increased travel, particularly arising from new COVID-19 variants, Cabinet, on advice of our public health teams and of HEOC, decided that the quarantine period for unvaccinated travelers will be extended from four to seven days. Safety is our main priority in this regard. Mr. Ms. Where people are traveling in mixed groups with some individuals unvaccinated, the entire party will be treated as unvaccinated and will also be required to quarantine for seven days upon arrival. This measure is subject to review to allow exemption to fully vaccinated individuals. In the case of persons who are only partially vaccinated, meaning that they have received one dose of a two-dose vaccine or whose final vaccine dose was administered less than the two weeks before arriving to the territory, a four-day quarantine period will be required with PCR testing administered on arrival and at day four. Finally, Cabinet has requested that the HEOC present recommendations for rapid or PCR testing for frontline workers and public officers. These measures will be communicated shortly. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to sound the alarm that vaccination is our best defense against the relentless COVID-19 pandemic. New, more aggressive strains continue to emerge as the virus mutates and spread rapidly from one region of the world to another increasing the risk of severe sickness and death. Vigilance now, more than ever, is required. Wash your hands, wear your mask, cover your cough, and sanitize all surfaces. The CDC has indicated that some of these measures, even those, will be relaxed. But Mr. Speaker, vigilance is our keyword. The grace and mercy of God have brought us thus far. Each of us must now do our part. Mr. Speaker, Nurses Week 2021 was celebrated under the theme, a voice to lead, a vision for greater health care. We join in celebrating the 65th anniversary of Red Cross and the BVI. We join in honoring and celebrating our golden gems as we celebrate Senior Citizens Month. And we join in recognizing and participating in activities during Mental Health Awareness Month. There are so many reasons to celebrate, so many reasons to vaccinate. God bless this territory and the people of the British Virgin Islands. I thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Honorable Minister for his statement, and I'm sure that copies will be provided to this Honorable House if it has not been done before. Okay, I now invite the Honorable Premier and Minister of Finance to move a motion for the, sorry, I re recognize the Leader of the Opposition for a point of information. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thank the um, Minister for Health uh, for his comprehensive statement. Um, the Minister, thank you for allowing me, first of all, Mr. Speaker, to raise this point of information. Um, the minister, I, I think I heard in your statement uh, about local, some local cases, whether it's three or four, I couldn't remember the exact number. Um, is this in any way considered community spread or this is associated with contact with any of the persons who traveled in? Can you confirm that for this armor house and the people of the Virgin Islands, please? you once again for the particular question. The, uh, we've been working for the past few days with the team and not a community spread, but in terms of um, clusters, they have identified already those um, where they originated, the close contacts have been monitored. In the next one or two days, we'll see if there are any uh, cases that resulted as a result. 
Community spread is normally when you can't identify where, where it came from, number one, or um, clearly identify the, the particular, the actual close contacts. So, um, so we, again, were able to avert some of what could be community spread, but we can't stress enough the importance of preparing your body for what is, because we, we um, just to make one final point, we, re we read in the reports coming out of Trinidad, for instance, today, 21 additional deaths coming out, 300 and somewhat additional cases. This is real. We have to be vigilant and we have to prepare ourselves and our, and our territory for what there is. There is no more preparation that we can have at this point in terms of equipment and uh, facilities and so forth. So the, vac the vaccine is our best hope. All right, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for answering that question. I just wanted to make sure um, that, that persons, when they heard that they wanted to leave, uh, laid affairs of persons of, uh, that you, you've, I have contacted those, trapped, contact trace those individuals, and, and so persons could be aware of what the process is and where you are in the process. So I thank you for your response, Minister, and I, I thank you, um, Speaker, for allowing me to ask that, um, make that intervention. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, one more thing I want to add. Sure, Minister. I have uh, opined the fact that each of us in here, the Christian Council, business owners, we met with business, um, with the Chamber of Commerce here the other day, um, all those persons who are hammering for wider opening of the territory, it is critical that each of us do our part in making sure that the other person becomes vaccinated. Because um, while the vaccine does not fully guarantee that you would not uh, come into contact and maybe contract the virus, it is proven to lessen the severity of whatever may have been. So it is important that each of us take it upon ourselves, uh, because this is not a this is not a Ministry of Health or a HSA item. It is all of us doing our part and making sure that we're doing it. So I was, I was thinking that if the 11,000 persons that have now been vaccinated um, bring one person, then we're good to go. I have one or two members in the house I can bring, so um, we would be able to get this all done. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his advocacy. I invite the Honorable Premier for moving a motion for the second and third readings of the bill entitled Contractor General Act 2021. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's very simple. Educate. Then don't procrastinate vaccinate and we respect those who do not want to vaccinate that's your democratic right and you should make sure you exercise the democratic right but at the same time too we must respect those who are using their democrat, um, democratic right to push for vaccination and let's not fall out over this uh, uh, too many relationships have been damaged over this vaccine whether to take it or not if you don't want to take it, don't take it. And if you're taking it, take it. If you don't want persons to take it, defend yourself in a respectful way. And those of us who are pushing to have it taken, we will push and encourage persons to do so in a respectful way. But let's not break up our homes and our family in the country over whether to vaccinate or not. I just, as a government and as premier, think it's the most credible option that we do have to save lives and to strengthen and save our economy. And that's my honest feeling, but I respect any other feelings, but as a head of this territory, with the government of the Virgin Islands, we have to push ahead in that direction. Mr. Speaker, sir, 
I rise to move the bill shortly entitled Contractor General Act 2021 be read a second time. And Mr. Speaker, while I'm on my feet, I will do, Mr. Speaker, just brief about the objects and reasons of this bill, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's, a implement, it's being implemented, of course, as a monitoring and implementation of government contracts and to provide for what you call oversight, Mr. Speaker. We, in this, Mr. Speaker, we uh, bring in another layer of good governance to the territory, an independent body, the one that, Mr. Speaker, will complement and not compete with the Auditor General, with the Complaints Commissioner, with the police, but rather it's another layer of good governance that will further strengthen this country's resolve in the area of good governance. Mr. Speaker, in Lehman's term about this legisl proposed legislation, Mr. Speaker, it is to make sure that in this territory when we hear a lot of he say, she say, and them say, as we say in our culture, that you have an independent body named the Contractor General in which uh, the a commission of it will be set up. And Mr. Speaker, it must be established where we, we it's going to be established where we will strengthen the arms of the, all the institutions, including the House. In the bill right now is not that there are, um, that it reports, it sends a report to the, to the Public Accounts Committee. But in our public sessions, we have had persons who have recommended that the report go to the Public Accounts Committee, and it's something that has caught my attention, and strengthen the Public Accounts Committee that, so that we will have the Public Accounts Committee with teeth and not be able to be a rogue committee with the report because there will be clear guidelines of how to proceed so if it needs to go to the DPP, it goes there. If it needs to go to the police, it goes there. If it needs further um, auditing or, 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 or analysis of audit, it goes to the Auditor General. If it needs um, extra um, look at the Complaints Commissioner, the PAC can choose how they want to proceed with it, but they cannot sit down on it and don't do anything. This is important, Mr. Speaker, because a lot of times you have a lot of chatter in this little country. Everyone gets it from the horse's mouth. And Mr. Speaker, we all know that lie goes around the wall twice before truth can put its boots on. And by the time the truth puts its boots on and get up and try to get ready to go out, lie done gone so far that that truth can never adjust about unless God steps in, catch up, and take over. But this gives a chance, Mr. Speaker, to allow you, if you hear something is wrong with the awarding of a contract for government, by government, to step and make your complaints known. And this will be an independent body. An independent body, Mr. Speaker. One in which our intention is that it cannot, the contractor general cannot be directed by neither the leader of the opposition, the premier, nor should be the governor. It must be a full independent body that has, with this legislation, set parameters of how it will operate to increase our ability of further strengthening good governance in this territory. I, Mr. Speaker, want to thank my members of the government for working with us to bring forward this contractor general. And right after that, we have the whistleblowing coming soon. And that's not just for how the theater have it. Coming soon, integrity in public life and others, Mr. Speaker. And just a few days ago, a gentleman told me, oh, the only reason that you're passing the, the um, contractor general legislation is because of the COI. I had to let, and the whistleblower and the rest of them, I had to take up the manifesto of our government and highlight it for him where they are in there. And I even had the ads we had, and I played them for him. He said he didn't remember them. I, know, I said, no, I know. Whenever 
It's dealing with certain things with far you won't remember, but certain things you will remember far back. So I have to refresh people's memory that these are not things that we just brought here. We, I remember with the ad with the whistle blowing legislation, we had a little whistle there and it was blowing and people were laughing saying that's just an election gimmick when we get there, we're not gonna do anything about it, but the legislation is there. The contractor general is one in which we will be able to bring more transparency and add more um, uh, accountability and, and, and strengthen, further strengthen good governance with the way this territory operates, not just for this government, but for all successive governments. And Mr. Speaker, to show that we are developing as a territory in conjunction with the leader of the opposition, the premier and the leader of the opposition in conjunction with the leader of the opposition will select the, the contractor general so that they won't feel the premier select someone to go carry out their wishes as a sitting government. Please ignore who, is, who are in the post now. I'm not speaking in terms of post, Mr. Speaker. And the, the leader of the opposition, whoever is in the post, must sit down with the premier and agree for that person to be that person. So if persons feel that they, they um, even was to get a contract and they were slighted, they can make a report and have a formal investigation Mr. Speaker, that is not directly the arm of our Auditor General, Mr. Speaker. But this will have more teeth than even a complaints commissioner. And this, Mr. Speaker, will have more tenants and, and more tentacles to operate from than even a complaints commissioner and in certain respects to the Auditor General. That is why, it, Mr. Speaker, we have to make sure it's, 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 it, that it has been crafted to make sure it doesn't compete with any other constitutional post that is already assigned to do good governance, but rather complement. So, Mr. Speaker, we didn't run to do this. This has been in the making for quite some time, but we know we had COVID-19 for the last, what, 13 months, and still dealing with COVID-19. As a matter of fact, I'm amazed sometimes, Mr. Speaker, because this seems to be the only place in the world where people want to deal with you as if COVID-19 didn't happen. The, why didn't you do this? Why, we don't, why this legislation wasn't here before? Why this legislation wasn't brought before? That time, Mr. Speaker, when you look at it, in Cabinet alone, there were 92 meetings last year. In Cabinet, I think it was 92. More, more, more um, just over 90. I don't want to give the number, but it's as exact as 92. But no, it was just over 90 meetings. Where nearly all of them, Mr. Speaker, was based on dealing with COVID-19 and keeping this territory safe. We had some House of Assembly sittings, but most of the sittings were called as emergency meetings to pass measures to help us through with the COVID-19. Yes, coming on, after a while we come on to the, to the, closer to the end of the year, we were able to get one or two other bills passed, but there were a lot of bills in the queue to come out to cabinet and to come to the House, and now they're coming. And Mr. Speaker, we've seen where we have passed um, many, many bills to strengthen good governance. Many of them, the proliferation of, 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 um, of, of, of financing, terrorist financing, this one, we have criminal justice um, coming up in terms of the International Cooperation Amendment Act, the counterterrorism coming up, the financial investigation agency, um, one coming up. Uh, we just passed the explosive. Many areas of good governance we continue to pass. Some of them, yes, they're geared towards financial services and some are geared towards the, 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 the regular citizenry in the BVI, but all are geared towards making sure that we keep the standard of the BVI in terms of integrity and good governance at a certain high level. Mr. Speaker, the Contractor General, um, in terms of the appointment, is based, the basis of integrity and demonstrate, is demonstrate ability in accounting, auditing, financial analysis, law management analysis, public administration or project management, Mr. Speaker. And we have criteria to make sure the person, Mr. Speaker, is not a fly-by-night person who may be immature and come to the job um, looking to, to just have an ax to grind. We're looking for persons that are qualified, but also mature. One of the issues we have in this country, Mr. Speaker, is a lot of people's rights are being 
trample on because they can't afford a lawyer. And in this territory, Mr. Speaker, depending on who gang up on you um, and have the loudest mouth, you can be deemed guilty without even going to the courthouse and in the public you will walk around guilty, although you're innocent. Mr. Speaker, there's a lot of kangaroo courts, we call them, that happen in this country. And if you're not strong, Mr. Speaker, there's an old man in my village, Dung French Monsky, a uh, Delvin gentleman, he said, he said to me once, you enter politics, he said, my cousin, make sure your constitution is strong because you're going to meet a lot of obstacles and if your constitution ain't strong, you're going to get in trouble. Now that's what people were saying, my son, make sure you be brave and courageous, be wise, but fear not. So Mr. Speaker, we would see that, the, that these things can cause persons to be removed from office if the investigation reveals certain um, areas. But you also have a tribunal, so you could also appeal. Too many times we have nothing to appeal to or no one to appeal to. So we're trying to make sure that when we set up legislation from here on in, that we don't just look at the legislation to suit or to adjust to the sitting government, but to make sure that it, 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 it raises the standard of all our institutions, whether it be public accounts committee, the House of Assembly, um, select committees of the House, uh, independent bodies to, um, to strengthen without the general or the others. We have to make sure all the legislation that we bring continue to raise the standard, but still bring balance. It's so important because a lot of the legislation that we pass, yes, it strengthens the law, but we also make, must make sure that we bring balance, that persons who take the seat to strengthen the law do not abuse the law and therefore put persons reputation in danger because of the abuse of the law. So with every law, there's balance. There must be balance. That's why the legal um, symbol has, has a scale and it's, it's dealing with balance because it's talking about being balanced. And the contractor general legislation brings balance. It allows you to report, it allows you to investigate, it allows you to get all the documents, but if you are found to be uh, a parent that is apparent that there's something that looks um, questionable, it allows for you to go to the tribunal so that you can fight and bring, come forward and present your case, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we also want to make sure that the record keeping of the contractor general is one of above any concerns of, an, of, of lack of integrity that it doesn't fall in that category, Mr. Speaker. So uh, with that, we also want to make sure that the way that they keep their records and the confidentiality of the records is extremely important. Mr. Speaker, when I read the Contractor General, and I must thank the Attorney General her office and the Premier's office, those in my office who have been working on this diligently, because when people see this kind of legislation come forward, they, 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 there's a lot of work involved. We have had public meetings, consultation. Some person, m most persons have applauded the bill. And some of them named some areas they'd like to see strengthened. But there, was, there were one person I heard saying that they didn't like need of the bills and they thought that they were stifling the media. And I couldn't understand that, Mr. Speaker. I read this bill over and over, must be five times, looking to see whether this or the upcoming one for whistleblower, where in it is, is where, um, exists that you're trying to stay for the media. As a matter of fact, the media have more say with this government than have had it with any other government in the history of this territory, till some of them even abuse it. We don't go trying to stop us all, but also with freedom of speech, there also comes responsibility. Because, Mr. Speaker, you, you have to be careful when you have freedom of speech and, and, and people are reaching to the point where they want to get physical because of one-sided stories that go out. We are human beings too who are here elected. And yes, you are not going to answer some of those things because it will just be a back and forth. So you, with time, the information will get out. 
and the other side will see. The old people said there are two sides to every story. Your side, my side, and the truth. I mean, three sides. Sorry, your side, my side, and the truth. But the contractor general allows for you to have the, them to have their side, for you to have your side, and then to bring out the truth. It is one of the most balanced legislation that we have seen. Yes, there's room in it. There's room in it for some uh, improvement. But Mr. Speaker, when the history of this government is written despite the chatter, it will be written that this government has done more public consultation than any other government. It will be written that this government has passed more good governance legislation than any other government. Although being ridiculed to be by, 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 by some, Mr. Speaker, as being a government um, of, 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 of red flags. Well, this is your time. Now is the time. And this is the place to know now that this government is saying, since there's so much chatter, we will implement more layers of good governance so that you can report whatever it is that you are hearing about a contract, blow the whistle from here to thy kingdom come on anything you hear that may be deemed as corrupt, and we'll get to that bill. I won't preempt it, but get paid for it if it is correct. If not, you'll pay for your mouth because you'll be fine. And, Mr. Speaker, you'll be protected. I cannot see, and someone will have to help me to see, how this contractor general on the whistleblower is limiting media or limiting anyone. As a matter of fact, it's liberating the media and the people of the Virgin Islands to come forward. And it's, very, it's a very delicate bill, and I use the word delicate, because, Mr. Speaker, this little territory named the BBI is the home of HSA. So, so putting a layer in where they can go and say what they hear, it isn't just saying what you hear, you have to bring something substantial also. Because, Mr. Speaker, everywhere you go in this territory, somebody got a little shoo, -shoo to tell you what they hear, and they get it from the horse's mouth. That time the horse had never spoken yet. Okay, he can't speak. And Mr. Speaker, it is time for us to stop damaging people's name in this territory that most likely will be innocent, but have no way of being able to levy the, the, their response to show their innocence, innocence because there are not laws in place that allow that. Mr. Speaker, we have to modernize our laws. Even the PSC laws we have to modernize because we have to have a tribunal put in when the, when, when the public service is, um, code is rewritten that allows for a tribunal from the PSC. We cannot have entities no more. I don't care whether it's PC, PSC, COI, I don't care who it is, Mr. Speaker. They, in terms of the entity, when I say I don't care who it is, we must be independent of whatever entity it is that they cannot have the power to condemn or to bring you in guilty without due process. It doesn't happen in the courts and any system that a government um, implements should ensure due process. It should ensure transparency. It should ensure good governance. And the existing laws that do not have it in, we have to amend all of them. Because, Mr. Speaker, it's very easy in this place, depending on who you become friends and what cocktail you go to or, or certain things, let's call it like it is, for all of them to gang up and brand you in such a way that before you know it, Mr. Speaker, something happens and then you are branded and they try to bring you in guilty before the case is even heard. And then do you have any kind of fallback, any kind of, of, of uh, retribution? No. You don't have it. So, Mr. Speaker, the contractor general legislation allows it. That's why I say as Premier, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I don't, I, I, I go, you know, you go different places, you go to church, I go through the villages, and I keep, you know, going and move around, and you go through the people. But, Mr. Speaker, I am very mindful of this place I love called home. 
Because, Mr. Speaker, I have lived a life that only God helped me become the premier that I don't have a lot of people around me all the time chattering negative things. When they come with that, let's change the topic. Because I, I have seen, Mr. Speaker, too many people in the British Virgin Islands been destroyed and they were innocent. They were innocent. But because the status quo of the day was packed, packed up against them, they gone down either as guilty or they gone down as persons with a negative character. And only God could help you in this BBI. And that's why when I became premier, despite all the chatter, I said we're going to work on these kind of legislations. If you have something, bring it. And let the system look into it, an independent system. And let there be in, built into the system measures that allow you to ask for a tribunal, to seek an audience with a tribunal, like an appeal case, so that you can go and present your case and see if you're innocent. Mr. Speaker, that is what this contractor general will do about contracts that government is issuing, whether consultancy contract, whether services or whatever. And only private businesses who are involved in the contract, they can call in. If we hear hanky-panky happening with those businesses, call them in. If you hear that it's got some kind of cutback or kickback or, or footback, call them in. I'm tired of the chatter going up and down destroying people's lives. Now go into a system we'll set up and complain it and let's get somewhere. And even the systems that are set up already to deal with some of these aspects, those legislation must be reviewed in the interest of strengthening institutions, in the best interest of the people of the Virgin Islands, in the best interest of bringing balance. We have an ancient mentality that once persons are being sought by by certain entities in the Constitution that they are guilty. And we are still saying that you are innocent until proven guilty. But Mr. Speaker, in our regular court system, if you go to court and you are found guilty, you are allowed to appeal. And if your appeal isn't, doesn't work, you are allowed to go to the Privy Council. But in all our government systems, once the report brings you in guilty, there are no built-in structures to allow for due process. So you have to champion your own cause. But under this government, we'll be amending those. We will be amending those that already exist and bringing in new ones. Because when we leave, we want to make sure that these laws reflect that we are truly maturing towards self-reliance. So Mr. Speaker, in a nutshell, this is what the Contractor General le Legislation will be doing, forming a new layer of good governance. And Mr. Speaker, it will be formed. It will be formed this year with God's help. And it will start to function this year even in, 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 in a small way and then mushroom if it has to. But begin it shall. And I want to say, Mr. Speaker, that I thank all who have gotten us this level. Again, I say thanks. And I look forward to us having some fruitful conversations. And I look forward to this bill being assented to in the best interest of the people of the Virgin Islands. Mr. Speaker, with those brief words, I now move the debate for this to be open. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion. While I'm on my feet, I will give my contribution to this very important piece of legislation. Mr. Speaker, I got into politics to help the people and to make the changes that I felt necessary, 
needed to happen. And I can rest well at night. I can have peace, Mr. Speaker, because I know I'm in here for the right reasons. To help people. To transform the society from where it was to where it needs to be. I stay encouraged, Mr. Speaker, and I have faith in God, I trust God, because I've seen God do things for me and in my life that I know could only be God. So I trust God, despite all my flaws and despite all my shortcomings, I know there's a God, and I know that God has a plan for me, and he has a plan for the Virgin Islands. And he placed the Virgin Islands party in this position for a particular reason and a purpose. Now, there are many out there, Mr. Speaker, who, I don't know why, but we've gotten into a habit of demonizing each other. And we, we believe the worst about each other. And we, in some instances, unfairly criticize each other. Now, I'm the last person who will, I'm the last person who will shy away from criticism. Because I believe every democratic society needs persons who will critically examine the society. But I also know, Mr. Speaker, that we have to be principled and we have to be fair. We campaigned on good governance legislation. In fact, the now Premier, as a member of the opposition and later leader of the opposition, really championed the cause for good governance uh, for eight straight years. And we campaigned on it, and some persons said, well, this is just a gimmick to get into the House of Assembly. Some persons say, well, the legislation will never come. Now the legislation has got, gotten here. I'm already seeing some persons trying to find a way to criticize the legislation. And we, as an administration, we consulted on the bill. You got to meetings, and you know some persons tuned in online. But there could have been more persons coming to the meetings. I'm not here to criticize anybody. I'm just saying. We brought the good governance legislation, and, and the meetings were not just a handful of people. And sometimes we seem to just flock to negativity. And we get very excited for negative things which are taking place. And when it comes to things like these type of legislations that we never thought would come and they come, as opposed to being constructive and saying, well, let me attend the meeting and let me give my suggestions about how we can improve the legislation. We stand on the sidelines and we start to criticize. And Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure. You know, of course, some persons will take it the wrong way. Uh, 
I'll give you an example, Mr. Speaker. For some reason, I, I don't know, we, we, ha we, we, we have fallen in love with negativity. We had a farmer's week the other day. One media company never even reported that the farmer's week happened. Just looking for nonsense and foolishness and sensational headlines to print all the time. As opposed to reporting what's happening in the society. Okay, you only want to support things that you consider to be negative happening and nothing is positive is happening in the place. People who, they say they're trying to, they're, they're the media, they're democratic institutions, but some of them are just here to tear down the society. It's clear to me. And then they use the media as a platform to attack persons they don't like. Some of them, you never see them reporting. You have a Deja Hatch, number one in the world for under 16. You'll never see them promote it. You'll never see them say a word about it. But they latch on to anything that they think is negative, And they seek to promote it. I'm not sure how we got there, Mr. Speaker. And I'll save some of the other things for any other business in terms of how we've started to relate to each other and regard each other and completely have a lack of respect for each other. I'll save that. But some persons have taken it upon themselves now to try to cast a negative light and a negative shadow on the contractor general legislation or whistleblower legislation because something must be wrong, Mr. Speaker. Because we, we, we deem a nice person, so when we see them doing things like bringing this type of legislation, something has to be wrong with it. I can rest peacefully at night because I know that this legislation was brought to strengthen good governance in the territory. Because here in where they call Tartola. We love a nice story. We love a nice, I mean, I, <laughs> I love my people, but Lord, we love some gossip. Lord, we love some rumors. Lord, we love an innuendo. Lord, we, when we don't know certain, certain facts, we fill in the gaps. We get very creative and imaginative. We have a long list of authors in the BVI, Mr. Speaker, but we have so much potential for many more authors here in the BVI. These people could tell a good story. All they got to do is write it down. And they could have some best-selling works. We love our gossip. Love a story. And you have social media now, make it ten times worse. Something happened this morning. Not even by 12 o'clock noon, it done reached New York, London, probably even Russia. <coughs> so let's do something progressive. Instead of saying, you know, he, you know, he was taking kickbacks with that contract, half the time they don't have a clue what happened or what went on. Let's do something progressive and let's put in place a contractor general who can properly investigate these contracts. That is something that's good for the BVI. Because these concerns have existed, you hear about them, You know, they become gospel because they're repeated so much. Let's have something in place to, to make sure 
Let's have something in place to investigate. Let's have something in place to monitor to make sure that when persons get contracts, they're qualified for those contracts. Let's transform the BVI into a meritocracy. That is not to say, Mr. Speaker, that we must create a society where we don't seek even development and extend opportunities for all and help prepare persons to seize opportunities and develop them through our education system and other systems and seek means to ensure that when persons train themselves, they qualify themselves, that they get opportunities. Because we like to speak about value for money, Mr. Speaker. We like to speak about transparency and accountability, which I am completely committed to, but we do not speak enough about empowerment of people, putting programs in place to empower people. So I support the contractor general legislation to ensure that we have transparency that we have accountability, that we have good governance, that we have measures in place to make sure we don't have any malfeasance, any foul play, any nepotism. We put measures in place to monitor that because it was the, it was the dream of my ancestors that we should advance and gain more autonomy. They've written it in black and white. We've done the research. We can show you where the late great chief ministers and leaders of oppositions and members of the legislative council where they've told you in black and white we want our people to advance, to become more independent and more autonomous, to have more of our destiny in our own hands. They said that. But the greatest challenge that we have in getting there is confidence within ourselves and putting systems in place to ensure that we can be confident in ourselves and we will uphold the principles and the values for any modern, just society. We cannot simply rely on the personalities which have been elected to ensure that we have good governance. We have to put systems in place, develop institutions, develop our legislative framework. And we have to have more discussions as a society as well. Not that nonsense that you see happening on the blogs. That's not any discussion. That's not any um, fruitful conversation that will get you anywhere. In fact, it saddens me to see uh, some of what's written on those, uh, beneath those stories. It's not a good reflection of who we are as a people. And I think we were better off before that when we just used to listen to the radio and go out to our public meetings and have a discussion. 
when you have an anonymous person speaking, you just feel you could say any nonsense. We have to have more discussions as a society about our society. And I'm grateful every time you, you have a, a lecture that takes place at H. Laverty South Community College or something like that. And, you know, I would like to see it more. I would like to see us have more lectures and discussions. And, I would, and when they happen, I would like to see them better attended. And we have um, the Zoom and the WebEx and things like that. You know, let's use the technology for something good and proper. Let's have more discussions as a society. Um, discussions where, where we have educated conversations and, and we're not calling each other names. Where we can have good nature debates. I mean, Mr. Speaker, we, we teach our children to have debates. You, you see them in the debate competitions and they do such an excellent job and then I wonder what these young persons think when they see the adults calling each other names calling each other morons and mutts and all kind of foolishness that people laugh at and think is funny when you see the deterioration of the society before your very eyes you feel like it, it benefits you in some way. So you laugh along with it. But then the, the society is rotting from the inside. People so disrespectful to each other. When I was young, you said something disrespectful as a child, somebody would have knocked your head off your shoulders. Yeah? But you see a society here, and people have it as a big joke. You have a house of assembly where persons supposed to be uh, some of the most respected persons in the society. We have to respect everybody. But these type of offices, if you can't respect somebody in the house of assembly, who can you respect? That's why we have the title of honorable. People go around and say all kind of nonsense about you and it's a big joke. And it has nothing to do with me as a personality or any other personality. But what about the deterioration of the institution? We watch the society go straight down the toilet. And it's a big joke. It's not a joke for me, Mr. Speaker. I don't find it funny. Those young persons at the youth parliament, what a wonderful job they did in their discussion and debate. I often ask myself, I wonder what they think about the public dialogue that we have in the society and how we behave as Virgin Islanders. I think that, um, Mr. Speaker, we can get back on track. We can have good nature debate on the issues. And that will allow us to demonstrate the maturity necessary to take our society to the next level. So, Mr. Speaker, with those few words, I just want to, to reiterate that this contractor general legislation, I believe, is responding to something that many persons have recognized in the society as an as a area of deficiency. Something that persons have been concerned about. And we as an administration have responded to it. 
We've taken it around the Virgin Islands for persons to be able to make comments on. And we know how reliant persons in our community are on government contracts. And I hope that those persons would have read the legislation and would have communicated with their district or at-large representatives, express their views that they want to see reflected in the debate and in the committee stage of the bill. But in my view, it is certainly a huge step in the right direction. And I give it my full support, Mr. Speaker. And if we make any changes at all, which I anticipate there, maybe some changes. I think we certainly should think about how we ensure, either in this legislation or some other piece of legislation, that we provide opportunities to empower our people and give them opportunities so we don't create a society where only those who are strongest deserve to be able to feed their families. That we have something in place for persons who may not be as strong as others. And we help them to develop and to grow. That is something we need to pay attention to. So Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to speak on this very important piece of legislation and it has my full support. Thank you. I thank the Deputy Premier for his contribution. The floor is now open for debate on the Contractor General Act 2021. I recognize the Leader of the Opposition and member for the 8th District, the Honorable Malin A. Penn. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the opportunity to make my contribution, albeit brief contribution, on the Contractor General Act 2021 that's before this Honorable House this evening. Speaker, the night is fast spent, and I promise that I won't be long on this particular piece of legislation, Mr. Speaker, but I thought it would be important for me to say a few words on this legislation. Speaker, for a moment I had to read through the legislation and I thought when I heard the Deputy Premier speaking, I thought it was something else we were debated. You, you threw me off course for a little bit there, Deputy Premier. But nonetheless, um, you spoke your truth and, and, and that's all you could ask of a member in this humble house. Well, Mr. Speaker, I want to speak specifically to the legislation. Speaker, while I support any piece of legislation that speaks to good governance, that speaks to transparency and accountability, because I believe those are the hallmark. Any democracy is important for us to have the necessary checks and balances in place, checks and balance in place, to ensure that as a society, we police ourselves um, to avoid others being our own police. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I, as I read through the bill, there are some specific areas, and I won't go too detail in those areas, but I think um, especially part three of the bill that speaks to the powers function of the Contractor General Commission. I think we need to have a little more in-depth conversation on this, Mr. Speaker in the committee stage. There are some areas um, that I'm afraid and I, and I don't want us to create a, another layer that sort of infringes on any aspects of the existing institutions like the, uh, the general and the other institutions within government that has certain responsibilities. So we have to ensure that once we go through the deliberations, I believe that all of us are on the same page in ensuring that 
there's a level of checks and balances, but we don't want to create layers upon layers and, and in, increases the bureaucracy in the accountability process. So I want to make sure that we look at those areas, specifically in part three, that speaks to the way the, um, contact, the contract, the general should function. Speaker, there's a section, section 20, 22, where it speaks to disciplinary, disciplinary action. I'll just take that one up in particular. Uh, go section 22. Two, it says, in every case where the contractor general finds that there is a, there's evidence of the commission of a criminal offense, he or she shall, in addition to talking to the prescribed prescribing section one of this section, refer the matter to the director of public prosecutions. Speaker, I, I don't even know, and, I, and I'm trying to, to remember going through the Arthur General Act, where the Arthur General actually is the one that sends um, concerns or cases to the DPP. Um, this is some serious powers that we're, that we're enforcing on this particular entity. Uh, we have to ensure that we're not creating an animal unto itself that could potentially create some issues for persons um, caught up in, in the system, in the DPP. Uh, we have to make sure that we have um, the right checks and balances because we're now seeing where some of our entities that we've established, if you have rogue leadership, it could create a level of hardships, hardship for individuals. So I think, Mr. Premier, just in terms of the committee stage, for us to really dissect and ensure that, that the powers that we confer in on the contact, contractor general are indeed powers that should be here. Because if I'm not mistaken, uh, the general has to go through the police force, and there's a process for in a way where um, things are, are, are sent to the DPP. Uh, and I don't want us to have a, a body there that has that, those type of powers that could create um, some uncomfortable situation for, for our citizens. I mean, as, as was rightfully said in many cases, um, and the former premier member for the ninth district used to always say, I'm happy that I had the pleasure to serve with him. May his rest his soul in peace. I'm a Ralph Tio Neely say, this country is long on rumors and short on facts. And, and you don't want persons in these roles that could get a little overzealous and, and, and really get persons caught up in the system. Once you're there, you have to spend an inordinate amount of money to get yourselves out. And we have to be very careful in terms of the institutions that we're building and they don't circumvent already established institutions and ensure that they are fit for purpose in terms of what they intended and the purpose they're intending to serve and don't creep over into the responsibilities of other institutions. So that is for me, as I read through the entire path, free of the bill, I see several areas where I think we need to pay keen attention to those areas where we might eventually overlap into the authority of other um, juris in, um, institutions and, and other areas where the responsibility might be best held in some other place versus here in the con con contractor generation, general legislation. So Mr. Speaker, with, that, with those brief words, I. I'll take my seat and I look forward to us having a, a engaged, um, robust conversation um, in the committee stage to ensure that we do what is intended and ensure that we don't create something um, that, that continues to add to the bureaucracy but something that serves a meaningful purpose in terms of the issue of transparency and accountability in the way that we conduct the business of government and ensure that the public and the people and the, and the taxpayers of this territory continue to get value for money for the things that we do and to avoid the, uh, um, the appearance or e the, 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 even the mere appearance of criminality as it relates with the dealing with the government finances and government contracts. So again, I'll wait for the discussion in committee stage and I 
look forward to those discussions. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, for those brief words on this piece of legislation. Wish to debate? Recognize member of the second. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise after listening to both contributions from the mover of the bill, the Honorable Premier, and seconder of the bill, the Deputy Premier, and then hearing from my colleague, the Leader of the Opposition. Mrs. Speaker, I rise to give my contributions to the bill before us. And I listened with intent after going through the electronic version of the bill that we received and now having a hard copy in my hand, Mr. Speaker. I just have some brief comments that I would like to make. Mr. Speaker, This piece of legislation before us is one that is a little bit more complex and intense than I think we are giving it off to be. The importance of it, Mr. Speaker, is one that as we continue to evolve in this territory, as we continue to build our territory, Mr. Speaker, it is one that puts in place an entity, a body, a unit, whatever we would call it, Mr. Speaker, that will attempt to address issues and concerns and hopefully attempt to promote accountability and follow the proper procedures and executional strategies of contracts, of governance, and in the way we conduct ourselves as persons doing business with the government of the Virgin Islands, but also gives the ability for persons to, if they have an inclination or a case, so to speak, Mr. Speaker, that they could bring it before a body if they feel that it is dealing with corruption, if it is dealing with malfeasance, if it's dealing with mismanagement and mishandling of funds, that this body, entity, and or unit will be set up to deal with those types of situations and issues, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, we have, and we are all aware of this society that we call our home. It is one that we recognize, it is one that we accept, it is one that is our own. But it's also one that we have created, Mr. Speaker. It is a society we have created, it is a society that in some areas we have enabled, it is a society in which some of us have been able to contribute to its growth. And when you don't 
address a thing, Mr. Speaker, it is that much harder to change a thing. The definition of that is simply courage. You can't change what you're not able or willing to confront. And Mr. Speaker, if you would allow me to refer to a document that I have before me, just to read a quote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It states that it is not the newness of time or the movement of time or the clock that produces the newness of life. It is the movement in our mind. The truth is everybody and everyone is going through the same change or some change. And we don't have to be ashamed of ours. We have to move towards developing the process of transforming to a higher and better expression of ourselves that we must not let the habits of our past stop us from progressing or transforming. What separates us is transformation, the possibility of change, the desire to evolve, the passion to find the newness of life. And then it says, Mr. Speaker, I'm tired of doing what I used to do. If, I've always, if I always do what I used to do, then I'll always do what I've always done. Mr. Speaker, in this 21st century, in this Virgin Islands that we continue to build, We have to ensure that we are creating a balance. We have to ensure that we are creating a balance that promotes the development of our people. Whether through education, professional development, and all the facets therein, Mr. Speaker, because in order to get to a higher and better expression of ourselves, we must ensure that we are building our people, Mr. Speaker, and how we build our people is through systems. We build our people, Mr. Speaker, by putting systems in place to allow for the promotion of self-development. For allowing me to, and individuals, our young people, Mr. Speaker, our professionals, and those that need to spread their wings, Mr. Speaker, we allow a platform, we create a platform for which they are able to operate in. But Mr. Speaker, it cannot be done doing the same things that we've always been doing. Mr. Speaker, it cannot be done by us putting measures in place on one hand to protect ourselves from criticism while on the other hand carrying out behavior and displaying attitudes, Mr. Speaker, that calls for criticism. Mr. Speaker, this book I, I picked up back in 2014, and it asked and it dealt with how to deal with criticism. 
Mr. Speaker, we cannot ever get to a place where we feel we are untouchable or that we believe that because you are criticized, because someone does not agree with you and quote-unquote pulls your card, Mr. Speaker, that that person or persons become your enemy. Mr. Speaker, especially in this political realm, though, if you want, I say to people all the time, if you want to know about yourself, put your name on the ballot to run for elected office. You will learn things about yourself that you never knew. You will question the things that you hear about yourself and even wonder if it were really you. Mr. Speaker, when we are glorified, however, and when we are praised, we, we, we are sometimes like cats. C-A-T-S. We like to be stroked. We like to be cuddled and... and, 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 and and finesse and feel like, you know, everything good. We want everybody to keep praising and recognizing us, Mr. Speaker. But I learned in this little game over the last six years that this is called a contact sport. And if you want an example, there's none better than the example of that of the life of Jesus de Christ. In Spanish, they say Jesus de Cristo. A man who was praised and celebrated. And then in the very next week, he was crucified. Mr. Speaker, we cannot and we are not movie stars. We are elected leaders. And though this legislation speaks to facets specific to contracts and operation and doing business with government and the criticisms and accusations that come therein, Mr. Speaker, it falls right back to us. Because if a contract is issued under the Ministry of Health, under the Ministry of Transportation, under the Ministry of Natural Resources, under the Ministry of Education, under the Ministry of Finance, Mr. Speaker, even through the specific department head or the permanent secretary or whomever would sign up, at the end of the day, who people will see and criticize would be those who they have elected. So Mr. Speaker, the balance that I'm speaking of, and is no different than what I have been saying in this honorable house in the last House of Assembly, and no different to what I am saying and have been saying in this fourth house of assembly, Mr. Speaker, that we have to be the ones that set the example. Yes, we can make laws, and that's what we're here to do. But our lives, Mr. Speaker, the execution of our duties, Mr. Speaker, should be the one that sets the example. Because we are labeled crooks and thieves as politicians because... That is what the name that we have allowed people to call us. The actions, Mr. Speaker, that have been displayed, Mr. Speaker. The unchecked and unjust actions. That we have leader, as leaders, Mr. Speaker, has sometime exemplified and put out in the public begs the question. The Honorable Deputy Premier stated 
that we are given the title of honorable. And I learned very early in 2015 not to ever refer to myself as honorable. If the people choose to give you that title, that is their choice, Mr. Speaker. But I am Melvin Mitchell Tonbull. That's me. And we have to ensure, Mr. Speaker, while we put policies and procedures like this in place to govern that we are doing and exemplifying the actions of behaviors that we want to put on the people of this territory. Mr. Speaker, I have continued to say that we are and we will continue to be until something happens our worst enemy. Because nobody is doing the things that we know have been ex existing. We've been doing it to ourselves. And in order to change it, Mr. Speaker, we must confront it. And we must address it. And we must not get bent out of shape, Mr. Speaker, when we are confronted on it. Mr. Speaker, respect is a two-way street. And I try my honest best to respect every and anybody, no matter who it is. Whether you vote for me or vote for me not. Whether you like me or like me not. Our responsibility, Mr. Speaker, is to serve the people who have given us this opportunity. The question I have, Mr. Speaker, with this, the act and the contractor general, Mr. Speaker, and I know we're speaking to the powers that exist with the Contractor General. Is we are now creating another entity to do some specific things, which I understand, Mr. Speaker. But one of the questions I have, Mr. Speaker, is how big will this entity be? What will be the composite of this body? What will it cost us, Mr. Speaker? Because we know the existing exuberant costs that already exist within government as it relates to the service and what it costs to operate. The question is, what will be the composite? And not just composite, Mr. Speaker, in terms of the numbers because you're talking about a body now that will have to be active in researching and active in investigating and active in having hearings and active in coming to decisions, Mr. Speaker. It will take time. It will take money. What will be the full composite of putting this act in place? Because while I agree with it, Mr. Speaker, in principle, The question always comes back to me is what is the cost? What is the cost as compared to the benefits that would arrive therefrom? Knowing that we have continued and we are continuing to try to create different revenue streams. But knowing some of the nuances that continue to exist and plague us, we're not being able to collect revenue. How will this play into the overall picture, Mr. Speaker? What 
are the limits. We just had uh, a very interesting, I would call it, discussion on the little, the little pieces of legislation, Mr. Speaker, are the ones that are the most meaty and weighty. And we heard some things that I would say shocked the bejesus out of me. Because at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, we also have to be mindful and careful that you're not putting things in place to not only crush your people, but keep them away from helping to contribute and helping to build this country that we're trying to build. So, Mr. Speaker, the, 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 the constraints the powers that the leader of opposition just spoke about, the composite of this body, where it's going to operate from, and who it is going to be responsible to, Mr. Speaker, is something that we must pay attention to. But as I said, Mr. Speaker, in principle, I support what I understand the bill to be trying to do because on the other side of everything that I've said, Mr. Speaker, we are in a territory that does not gossip. We do not spread rumors, Mr. Speaker. We fellowship our own information. This is the BVI that I love. Mr. Speaker, I heard my good friend say the other day, and it's something he's going to have to charge me for. When you come to me with a whole corrupt thing, you miss my name with that. And I heard my friend say, Mr. Speaker, if you have to be in any place, arguing with a momo, and you to the top of your voice, and he to the top of your voice, Miss Jane or Miss Joe Pass, how are they going to know who's the momo? So, Mr. Speaker, if we set ourselves apart, if we put ourselves in a position that we are living to the trust and confidence of persons put in us to have this position of leadership, Mr. Speaker. I believe the shoulders of the giants for which we stand on, if we had continued and we continue, because it's never too late to change, if we continue, Mr. Speaker, on the foundation that was casted before us and omit and delete some of the ways that have caused the aspersions of the names that persons label when it comes to politicians, Mr. Speaker. Pieces of legislation like these would be obsolete because if we are empowering and developing our people, Mr. Speaker, the people that we train and we develop will be in a position to take us to another level. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. I thank the member for the second district for his contribution. I recognize the Minister for Transportation, Works, and Utilities, and member for the fifth district, the Honorable Kai M. Reimer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thank you for this, <clears throat> this opportunity to speak briefly on this contractor general legislation. Mr. Speaker, I have heard this word, this term for a while as, I, as we campaigned in 2018, 2019. And Mr. Speaker, I, I must applaud the, the Premier for not just saying it then, but bringing it forth now. And uh, Mr. Speaker, as we 
We did the public consultations. We heard from some pundits who thought that was, this was a very good and needed legislation. And Mr. Speaker, I, I will, like I said, speak briefly, because the purpose of this, this legislation is to create an office for a contractor general. Mr. Speaker, the, some aspect of the bill that speaks to the contractor general is that the contractor general shall not be subject to the direction or control of any other person or authority in respect of his or her duties as the contractor general. Mr. Speaker, I remember keenly when we did the public debate, uh, one contractor who was there wondered if this would affect any of his private contract with any private contractors. And Mr. Speaker, I assured him that this is all in relation to public contracts from public offices and a, a matter of uh, transparency with the contracts and making sure that everything is above board when it comes to, uh, to the contract. And Mr. Speaker, the Contractor General would make his decision based on the laws, and I know when we go through the committee stage, we'll go through it line by line. But Mr. Speaker, when the Contractor General makes a, makes a decision, uh, the, the aggrieved body, public body, would then have the ability to appeal that decision and to an to an appeal tribunal. Mr. Speaker, there's a time frame in which that appeal should, should be taking place. And this, all, this is all in a, a manner for um, transparency, so that if you feel that you, justice wasn't done, you have the, the opportunity to, to address your concerns. Mr. Speaker, there are some qualifications or reasons why you cannot be a contractor general. And it shows the characteristic or the character of the contractor general. Mr. Speaker, one says that you cannot be someone who has been bankrupt. You cannot be someone who has been convicted of a, an offense involving dishonesty or moral turpitude. You can't be a member of the House of Assembly either. You also cannot be a party to or a partner in a firm or a director or a manager of a company which to his, his knowledge is a party to any contract with a public body. And Mr. Speaker, the contractor general must be of sound mind to carry out his functions. I know I heard the member from the second mention some issues that he has with the bill in terms of um, cost and, and running of this office. Mr. Speaker, this is a very important legislation, and, and I welcome it. And some of the functions that I'll, I'll just highlight of the Contractor General, Mr. Speaker, is to monitor the award and the impl implementation of government contracts with a view of ensuring that such contracts are awarded impartially and on merit. I think that is quite important as we always speak about uh, good governance. So, Speaker, I also speaks to the fact that there is no fraud or corruption, mismanagement, waste or abuse in the awarding of contracts by that public body. So Mr. Speaker, those are some of the, the, the powers or the function of the contractor, contractor general. And Mr. Speaker, I, I listened keenly, like I mentioned, as we went through 
the, the public consultation, and I, I applaud the, the Premier for taking this step because I know there have been a, quite a few bills and we have done quite a few uh, public consultation. I'm not sure what the record is on that, but that shows that we are engaging the public as we go through these legislation. And I know, I'm sure that some of the, the issues that came up during those times were addressed um, and will be addressed in this act. So Mr. Speaker, with, with those few words regarding this Contractor General legislation, Mr. Speaker, I just want to, to lend my voice in support. And I think this is something that has been long awaited and it is here now. And I look forward to us going to, to this, the committee stage for this bill. But Mr. Speaker, before I take my seat, I'm not sure if it's fitting, but I just want to, because I know we'll be going into committee stage at this moment, I just want to update this honorable house on the water situation that I mentioned earlier. And I spoke about it being uh, 24 hours that it should be rectified. But Mr. Speaker, I, I bring this information with alacrity and state that water is now running in the pipes again on Anigara. And I applaud the Water and Sewage Department, the BVI Electricity Corporation, um, all teams for working in unison because teamwork make the dream works. And uh, I know that the residents and businesses on Anigata um, will be happy with this, this news and, and having water back in their pipes. And Mr. Speaker, again, I say thanks to all those who are involved and I, I, I understand the inconvenience and I acknowledge the inconvenience of, of what took place today. But Mr. Speaker, we do have these situation that occur from time to time and uh, we thank them for their patience and Mr. Speaker, I thank you for the opportunity to, to update this house on the Contractor General legislation and also on the water situation and for the residents of Anigara. I say thank you. I thank the minister for his uh, contribution to the bill along with the update from his statement this morning. Is there any other member wishing to speak before I ask the Premier to wrap up? I call on the sponsor of the bill to wrap up the debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank everyone for their input in this legislation. I thought that it would have been met with open arms in all quarters. But I am in politics long enough to know that you cannot be surprised. But as I will say, Mr. Speaker, there's nothing in the Virgin Islands we have done to give the name of a politician known as a thief, crook or a criminal. That's worldwide. It's not a good thing, but that's the connotation that persons have. And no matter what you do to try to change that, is always going to be one that's difficult to be able to eliminate. But Mr. Speaker, somebody has to do the job. And we who are elected will just have to carry on. As the Deputy Premier rightfully said in the Minister for Transport, this has not been a bill being brought just for Brennan's sake. There is a need for extra layer and extra layers of accountability. And Mr. Speaker, this is no more harsh than all the other bills we passed. If you read them, this one, Mr. Speaker, is mild. But, Mr. Speaker, it is necessary because this Contractor General legislation, along with the whistleblower that we, this government has brought, is long overdue, and we're just 
outside of our second year, Mr. Speaker. But let's face it, the criticism that you get in politics is going to come. And no one who entered politics should ever think in their minds that they will not be criticized. It comes with the territory. It is person's democratic right to say whether they agree or disagree. But Mr. Speaker, contrary to the branding that some of them want to put on this government, even some of them in this house, one thing I've never done in my political career is attack someone personally because I disagree or attack their family because I disagree or call them outrageous names in the public because you disagree. Yes, I'll talk about corruption. You give your reasons. But Mr. Speaker, I never attack anyone personally. It's always dealing with an issue. But it seems to me, as the Deputy Premier rightfully said, that we have entered a season where if you listen to some, there's nothing good that is happening from the, by this government. And people thrive on the Indian doors now more than ever. As a matter of fact, the kind of posting that I'm seeing, Mr. Speaker, on, on elected officials being that they disagree, that's not posting and being that you disagree. No persons are downright being disrespectful. And if you ask me, they also seem to reach into the point where they threaten you with what you're seeing them posting. And if you don't agree with my political stance, I respect you for saying that you don't agree. I respect you for giving your reasons why you don't disagree. But when you cross the line, calling my family or myself and anyone on the government names and saying that um, basically we should die and going on down that road, that's not politics anymore. That's not disagreement. That's now becoming personal. And when person said that this government um, operates in a uh, uh, in fair, I can't understand it because to me this is the most that I've ever seen anyone criticize Zina government in my life. These two years felt like 20. Every, if you move the can left and they tell you move it left, by the time you move it left, they tell you that you move it too far left. If you move it right, they tell you you shouldn't move it at all. But you see, I have learned that seven people saying the same thing seven times a day is not 49. That's what the late H.L. Stout used to say when I was younger, and now I understand what he meant. Because, Mr. Speaker, when you analyze it, let's put these things in place. The cost to put this in is minuscule to the cost of the reputation of this territory by the gossip and the innuendos. It costs us more when people go and take your reputation away. It costs you a lot. And we all know that, although we come in here singing Kumbaya, my Lord, we all know what's going on on the street. We all here. We have the list, a list that's out, we check in the authenticity of it and how, how the list got out and we're doing calls for investigation, the whole matter. Because you're seeing some information there that doesn't gel with information that they told you exists in the, in the actual records. But Mr. Speaker, if you listen, it would sound like we just throw away the money and give it away for political reasons and political gain. It sounds as if you, you um, haven't helped the people. Well, let's get a contract of general legislation and the whistleblower in place and deal with these matters once and for all. Let's get them in place. And everything now is a COI. Let's run, go and tell the COI. Now well, let's get it in place. So by the time we look, in which I, if we ever had to get a COI level, it's really out of control. Not these set of hair saying them, say he said, she said. And, and, no, 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 we have to stop it. So I don't mind being criticized at all. And 
And I want anyone to know that I tell my government members all the time, from the time they get elected and even before, don't get too high with the highs and don't get too low with the lows because in this political um, uh, field, mind field that you're in, you can go from a mountain top to the valley in just minutes. And likewise, you could go from the valley to the mountain top in just minutes. So just be humble and just fulfill God's purpose that he placed you here to fulfill. That's what I tell my members all the time. So if persons get up and they praise me for what I'm doing and my government members or all else, I answer the same way my members, not that my answer to God be the glory. Let's keep moving on. We're in this together. And if they criticize me, I say the same thing. Because the same mouth that, that, that praised Christ a couple days later of Baal crucified him. But Mr. Speaker, the truth of the matter is we have a society that you have some persons who are trying to determine who is good and who, is, who, who are good and who are bad. And that's not their role. Whether you like the political party or not, you could disagree with the methodology, you could disagree with the political philosophy, you, um, you could disagree with their policies and do so respectfully, you could so, do so assertively. But I have seen in the last couple of weeks some crossing of lines, Mr. Speaker, that if we were different leaders, we would promote a division in this country. If we were different leaders, we'd have promoted a division in this country. But instead, Mr. Speaker, we're trying to take the high road. You have persons in this house trying to brand the premier as a dictator. I didn't brand anybody, you know, but they're trying to brand me as a dictator. Well, let the contractor general and the whistleblower go to work and see who is the dictator or who is who. Let, let it go to work. Put in these layers. And if there are any overlap, we will unfold them and put them away. But these good governance legislations are going through for the betterment of this territory. And if there are areas to be improved, we'll improve them in the committee stage. No one forced us to bring these legislation here. We are not forced. No one told us to bring them here. This is not a show. I am in this government is as serious as could be about putting these layers in for good governance. If COVID didn't stop us, they'd have done being in. If COVID didn't delay, delay, us, delay us. And they're going in. Because no matter how much you prepare your people, you have to also bring balance so that if anyone decides to go rogue, there are systems in place to prevent you from going rogue. And if you go rogue, to deal with you, if you go rogue, no matter who is the government of the day. This is another layer that keeps a sitting government in check. And all the talk you're hearing, Mr. Speaker, for all the years others been in power, whoever brought this legislation or these good governance legislation to the House and said, let us pass them. Who? I've sat for years and hearing a speech from the throne, all manner of things with good governance coming forward. Where are the legislation from those different speech from the thrones? But we said we're doing whistleblowing is here. We said that we're doing contracted general legislation, it is here. We said we're doing integrity in public life. The first reading is already here and it's coming. And other pieces of legislation along with other legislation to help strengthen the economy. I would like to hear what the verdict is on this one when we are true. I would surely like to hear. So Mr. Speaker, we were not forced by anyone to bring this. But this is part of a sacred covenant with the people of the Virgin Islands. And we promise to bring these legislation if you elected us to office and you have elected us to office and we are bringing them.
COVID-19 has delayed us, but it has not denied us. We have long taken the initiative to place these legislation on the legislative agenda as reflected in previous speeches from the throne, as I've stated. And these speeches from the throne are written by the government and read by the governor in the House of Assembly. It's the government's speech from the throne. So the government should be bringing these legislation that they have stated to bring over the years. And these legislation are just some of the good governance legislation that your government is bringing forward. And there are many others that will come. Your government has been speaking of our intention and our commitment to these legislation and budget address also. Since we assumed our office and in other conversations prior to and after that. So we have been working on these legislation for some time. This legislation as well as other good governance legislation have been brought forward out of the initiative taken by your government in recognition of our promise to the people of the Virgin Islands and our commitment to strengthen the good governance framework in the, in the territory, Mr. Speaker. And we know for sure that this Contractor General Legislation will go far. Some of the functions, Mr. Speaker, of the Contractor General, General Legislation is to monitor the award and implementation of government contracts to ensure that award is based on impartiality and merit, that there's no impropriety or irregularity in the award and that there's no fraud, corruption, mismanagement, waste or abuse in the awarding of the contracts by a public body. Who wouldn't want that in place? To investigate any such fraud, mismanagement, waste or abuse. To develop policy guidelines, evaluate program performance and monitor actions taken by a public body with respect to the award, execution and termination of, of contracts. Which government was the salt? that want to show that and, and, and demonstrate that therefore good governance won't want these in place. And for the purpose of the discharge of his or her functions under this act, the Contractor General shall be entitled to be advised of the award and or the variation of any public contract by the public body responsible for such contract on the authority of a warrant issued by a magistrate to, access to uh, have access to all books, records, documents, stores, or other property belonging to a public body, whether in the position of any officer of a public body or a contractor or any other person, any premises or location where work on a public contract has been, is being or is to be carried out, and all books, records, documents, and other property used in connection with the grant issue, suspension, or revocation of any prescribed license. Mr. Speaker. Which government would not want these in place? The Contractor General may initiate an investigation on his or her own initiative or based on a complaint or information from an employee of a body, public body concerning a possible violation of laws, rules, or regulations, mismanagement, gross waste of funds, fraud, corruption, or other impropriety relating to the award or termination of any contract or the grant issue, suspension, or revocation of any prescribed license. The scope of investigation by the Contractor General include, but not limited to, the selection of contractors, tender procedures. And let me say something about selection of contractors, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Transport and all of us have put in a new system where we're, we're promoting more and more acts and contractors to register. Register at the Ministry of Finance from District 1 to 9. No matter what business you are in, once you want to get a contract with government, register. And we have a program set up with the Ministry of Finance for, for the contractors in terms of construction contractors now, that as they do projects, they move to different levels with different training. We realize, Mr. Speaker, that to get our territory to the next level, we now have to strengthen our institutions, not just of good governance, Mr. Speaker, but in terms of policies and legislation that will build our people, but balance our people when it comes to integrity and good governance. So the tender procedures relating to contracts awarded by public bodies is also an area with the scope of investigation of Contractor General. The award of any public contract, any allegation of fraud, mismanagement, waste or abuse involving public contracts. Too much chatter in this place. We shouldn't be running from this at all. We shouldn't be saying who get us here and who ain't get us here. Let's see who we get from here now. Let's deal with it. 
We all know what's going on. Persons, even some in this hollowed walls, going bad as spit out things, and know that it's not true about elected officials. It spread like wildfire. You whom they are saying your prayers, think you're in good grace, and when you hear the news, your name is in the middle of something, and you can't get it out. And then when you look, you, you end up all from here to Timbuktu, and if the God above, above our Father, who are in heaven, don't come to rescue us in this place, you, you'll be like an um, a, a orange or apple that's, that's out on the counter for a month. Let's face it, we know what's going on. Even right now as we speak, people are um, condemning this government over our list. You don't even get a chance in this place to see if you could get your name cleared. And when the gossip gets in high power and high gear and it go all about from here to, to Europe, to UK and back, it, be, it becomes almost gospel. I will not sit as a leader of this territory and allow people to brand people and get away with it anymore. I've seen it all my life and I had enough of it. So who don't want to pass these good governance legislation? They will just say no. But they're going forward. And we will sit together and collaborate, communicate, and make sure that we implement, amend any area that needs amending. But going through it, going through. It's time that we have legislation that allows persons, when they have information, to report it. And when it's finished being investigated, to have a due process and the due process to be clearly stated in legislation of how you can go to a tribunal to make sure that you present your case to try to try to, to free and to make sure that you clear your name. This is good governance, but more so, this is true democracy. And this is what this government is about. A lot of governments all through the Caribbean and the world would be afraid to touch this legislation. Show me where they are. They'll be timid to put this kind of good governance in legislation in place. And even some of those who will tell you um, that they, they, they are afraid about this or about that, they had the chance to put it in. Now they have the chance to assist in voting to get it in. If things were wrong for the last five, six, seven, eight years, the question is, what have we done? I'm not leaving this political arena on what ifs. What if we are do this? What if we are do that? We're going to try our best to move forward. The reason that the children of Israelites stayed in the wilderness is because when Moses and all the 12 men to check the city out, 12, 10 come back and say, couldn't take it. And because two were in a minority, the 10 with the greatest melee, kept them in the wilderness for 40 more years. And it's amazing, no matter how many times you say that story, people still gravitate towards it, even to the day. And Mr. Speaker, we'll not be defined by one or two chatter without being allowed to due process, and I'll not allow anybody to do so. Mr. Speaker, we want to make sure that no matter what your last name is in this territory, once you take public office or anything that you're doing in the public service, or in this territory that you have due process because depending on who you are for I wasn't a popular last name until I was elected so I don't know why people think that it's this great name um, that was so all the time the stout wasn't popular until HL stout got in the Lord made our names great not we but the point is that no matter what your last name is we want to make sure that the BBI is such a place that it creates opportunity for you and you take advantage of those opportunities and when you rise to make sure that systems are in place to bring balance that you operate from integrity. And if you or me or anyone do not operate from integrity, then the systems supposed to be so strong with good governance that it addresses those concerns and make sure that they're dealt with. And if we are being dealt with unjustly, the systems in place make sure that we can appeal. If the court system allows for appeal, Every government system should allow for appeal. If the court systems allow for tribunal and arbitration, every public system that is in place should allow so. Whether it be Commission of Inquiry Act, whether it be, be, be the Auditor General's Act, whether it be the Complaints Commissioner Act, 
whether it be the Contractor General Legislation Act, whether it be the Whistleblower Legislation Act, whether it be integrity in public life, there must be a section that allows you to appeal and have a chance to bring your case forward and clear your name or attempt to clear your name or at least bring balance to what has been reported against you. No one should allow any government or country to exist with laws where there's not reciprocity or where there's not balance. So the Contractor General legislation, the scope of the investigation also goes into to the, as I say, any allegation of fraud, mismanagement, waste, or abuse involving public contracts, the implementation of the terms of any public contract, the circumstances of and the practices and procedures relating to the grant, issue use, uh, suspension or revocation of any prescribed license. A public body agreed that by a decision of the contractor general in respect of this act may file a notice of appeal against the decision to the appeal tribunal within 14 days of the decision. The appeal tribunal shall consist of at least five members appointed by the cabinet and it shall be presided over a chairperson who shall be a retired judge or a senior lawyer of at least 20 years practice as a legal practitioner. You know why they get 20 years? Because we want to make sure that you get a seasoned person there that's mature, that will not be swayed by influence of anyone or be swayed by the noise in the media or in the public or on the Facebook, but we'll be able to look things straight down the middle and say, I hear all of this, but the evidence must drive my conclusion and my report, not the chatter. Mature persons does that with experience and fairness. And that's why that person is selected in the Contractor General legislation, Mr. Speaker. And the staff of the Contractor General Office will subscribe to an oath of office to perform their functions faithfully and uphold the confidentiality of information or documents in their possession. The confidentiality is reinforced um, by a Section 16 of the Act where disclosure is permitted in limited circumstances such as in court proceedings because you also have to protect the information that you receive and make sure persons walking there don't leak it out and persons there don't use it for the wrong intentions. And any person who willfully makes a false statement to mislead the contractor general or any officer acting on his or her behalf or without lawful justification obstructs hinders or resists the contractor general or any other person in the execution of his or her functions, fails to comply with any lawful requirement, tampers with documents and information, or seeks to willfully influence directly or indirectly the decision of the contractor general with regard to any complaint or investigation, commits an offense, and is liable to a fine not exceeding $10,000 or to be imprisoned for a term not exceeding 12 months or both such fine and imprisonment. Mr. Speaker, the Contractor General shall submit to the Cabinet an annual report relating generally to the execution of his or her functions and may at any time submit a report relating to any particular matter or matters investigated or being investigated by him or her. Mr. Speaker, these are just some of many of the tenants inside of this good governance legislation that I took the painstaking time to outline that we have been using in the public meetings to help persons understand what it is that we're achieving as a territory. So Mr. Speaker, I am passionate about seeing this happen, Mr. Speaker. So forgive me if I sound uh, overzealous, but it's not overzealousness. It is the passion to have due process finally coming in a piece of legislation that can one, investigate allegations, and two, before it goes any further, allow for due process. Mr. Speaker, we all have children. And whether you like fire as a premier or not, whether you support this government or not, I ask the people of the Virgin Islands who went to school and who have common sense to let us be careful how we attacking each other lately, not criticizing, attacking, 
Mr. Speaker. There's a different. You can criticize without trying to destroy people by sticking to the facts. If the facts lead them to be destroyed, that's fine. But the kind of things that I'm hearing, Mr. Speaker, a different government would have dealt with it differently. But I choose to come here to speak to some of our people and say, go ahead and disagree with our policies if you have to. It's your democratic right. Go ahead and criticize us constructively if you have to. It's your democratic right. But do not try to bully us through the media and disrespect us and our families through the media and try to threaten us. It's amazing some of the language that's there that you haven't had persons look into what has been written. Mr. Speaker, I am sure if some of these language were written towards any sitting governor, they would have already been looked into in terms of crossing the line. You don't want to get anyone in trouble. But well, Mr. Speaker, how can you have a territory, as the Deputy Premier rightfully say, allowing all the, the, the rules and principles of integrity and respect to be eaten out from the core, and because it is said about people who you hate be laughing and smiling and say, good, 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 good for him. Yes, keep at him. No problem. Keep at us if you don't agree with our policies in a respectful manner. I can sit and disagree with anybody all day and then leave from there and have tea with them or a, a drink with them and, and have, have lunch or dinner because we're doing so in a respectful manner. But there are some of them who basically saying they want us to wipe off the face of the earth, wipe off the face of politics, and saying it outright. Now, Mr. Speaker, I'm a man for peace. But nobody doesn't intimidate me that easy, that easily. But I want you to know that at some time as a people, we have to draw the line. You have to draw the line because none of us as government members going to sit here and let them continue to abuse us verbally with those threats and some of those things. And then when, when our children go out, they, they have to be careful because they, they, some of them even reach the point of throwing words at them for, for no, it's not going to get to that point. We're going to respect you and you respect us. Disagree and let's do it in a respectful ma manner. And Mr. Speaker, if they have so much information like they are always saying that they have. Because in these two years, it seems like, like everybody have information on the government. Well, then come now. The government saying, come now. And when the contractor general and the whistleblower is passed, bring it and let's see if it has any credibility to it. Mr. Speaker, you see, I'll end by saying, Mr. Speaker, a story that they told me, you know. They told me that um, truth and lie went to the beach one day. And when they went to the beach, they, both of them took off their clothes and they went into the sea. And while they were in the sea, lie came out of the sea when truth wasn't watching. And went and put on the clothes, lie put on his clothes and went and hide truth clothes. And when truth come out, he couldn't find his clothes. And from then to now, the truth naked. Can't hide. The naked truth going to come out, no matter how we try to see if we get in front with all the gossip. It can't hide. The cream always rises to the top, whether it be cream or wheat. No matter what you are, the cream always rises to the top. You just notice it. Even while it's hot and it's storing and it looks like that, that cream ain't coming to the top. You like cool a little bit. The cream comes to the top. I'm not saying that this government is always right. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that in everything, let's exercise some respect. Let's exercise the integrity and the true BVI love that we all know that we have. And exercise it in such a way that we can let people know that BVI is a place that can disagree with each other but still respect each other. And this contractor general will do just so. 
Because, Mr. Speaker, nobody ain't going to brand this country negatively and get away with it as long as I'm Premier. Nobody going to paint no broad brush on this country and, and we just sit down and take it while I'm Premier. And they ain't going to do it to any one of us here in the government or to our lives or to mine. Because I know whose we are. And our four parents fought hard for this place to, so we can be where we are. Although there are some who think now that we can't run it. And whatever we can do to strengthen the institutions of good governance from strengthening the public accounts committee, strengthening the laws, strengthening everything in good governance, we have to do it to carry on the legacy of our four parents. We must do it. And wherever we have to do to, to implement legislation and policies to help our people economically, that too we must do. And we will do it and bring the balance between both. So, Mr. Speaker, with that, I thank you and I move into the committee stage so we can go through this cause by cause. Thank you. I thank the Honorable Premier for his wrap up of the bill. It has been moved and seconded that the bill, shortly entitled Contractor General Act 2021, be now read a second time. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. I call upon the clerk to read the bill for a second time. <coughs> this act may be cited as the Contractor General Act 2021. Thank you. Pursuant to Standing Order 55-1 of the House of Assembly of the Virgin Islands, the bill now stands committed to a committee of the whole House to consider it clause by clause. This House is now in committee. <laughs> 